services for the LGBTQ plus community and welcomes donations to help support its work. Our lifestyle partner at Times Prime, influencer partner, Influencer Inc. and gifting partner, Queer Bazaar. So basically, when we all started with the idea of Pride Life Fest, the first question we asked ourselves and also to the universe at large was, what is Pride? The history of Pride can be traced back to the Stonewall Riots from the 1960s. Started by trans folks and gender non-conforming folks of color, it was a protest in itself that evolved into Pride as we know it today. The word Pride is often equated with power but the global struggle for recognition of all identities across the spectrum continues till date. Pride Month, even when sparked and radicalized in the US, is still celebrated across the world with similar enthusiasm. But one needs to look at exactly what does Pride Month mean closely in terms of the politics of the nation that they exist in. In times where rainbow capitalism is uh, you know what rainbow capitalism is, right? Basically, brands jumping on the bandwagon to sound woke while doing nothing but lip service or anything that is actually effective and inclusive for the community. While rainbow capitalism is at the rise, how does one understand the complexity of what we know as Pride today? So basically, when we looked at Pride Month and celebrating Pride Month, it also came along with an opportunity to start conversations to understand the importance of it from some brilliant individuals from the community and its allies, looking at its history, acknowledging its shortcomings and working towards a better future. I would now like, I would now like to invite founder of Social Getup and managing partner of Social Samosa Network, Mrenil Mathur Rajwani to share what exactly sparked the Pride Life Fest. Hi, uh, am I audible? Okay, uh, pardon me if my internet is bad because you know when good things happen, there are a few uh, things <laughs> come in between, but I consider them as a stepping stone and we'll move ahead. Uh, so I don't know if you guys can see me. If you can, please uh, comment. I'll just quickly need like a confirmation okay uh, thank you so much uh, i'll just start with what i'm i'm sorry i'm a little overwhelmed with with all this coming together uh, so it's a very special event for me for my team um so finger crossed that everything uh, like we hope that you will like so when on september 6 2018 uh, when the historic judgment came the day it like it's a day for everyone to celebrate. Um, from that day till the COVID world, we have, the pride celebrations were on full swing, but all is now on hold. Uh, we're not celebrating the pride month the way we used to. But in any case, can we afford not to talk about pride? Can we afford not to talk, uh, celebrate pride? Can we afford uh, to let go of pride month without its due uh, recognition, due celebrations? So, well, as they say, we are moving towards a new normal and the new normal for celebrations is about making things happen virtually. So here we are with the first edition of Virtual Pride Party, Pride Life Fest. Um, when my super energetic teams the, at Social Ketchup and Local Samosa brainstorm and we sat for hosting this event, we were clear from the start that we won't restrict ourselves to certain formats. We wanted to ensure that we take a step forward uh, towards normalizing the conversations and educating everyone. So we are talking about mental health, we're talking about drag culture, we're talking about the impact art has on the community. Uh, we have some inspiring stories, some in, uh, amazing tales of couples, uh, thoughts on what love is love, a lot of performances, gigs. So, uh, so the next 4.5 hours, is going to be a, like a power packed session. I'm sure you can't miss, you can't miss stepping uh, uh, away from your system. And so uh, that's it, that's there. Um, before I step out and let um, people come in and let them take the party ahead, I would like to thank my speakers and performance, performers to come on board and join the party. I know uh, there's some, they have done like some amazing work in their 
respective domain and they've been doing something great for the community so i i like i respect you personally uh, and i also want to thank my partners the community partners the um, you guys on a day to day basis are doing some amazing awesome work for the community and i can't thank you enough for helping me structure this so thank you so much before going uh, i would like to say something which stuck with me from what, what my one of my colleague mentioned is uh, let's hope that one day lgbt will soon become let's get better together thank you so much and lakshmi please <laughs> thank you manel that was super super insightful and when i first heard about pride life fest in itself it was unique to me because you didn't restrict it just to the idea of a packed conversation or just performances but a beautiful place where everything just comes together and becomes something so beautiful so i really appreciate that uh, for everyone who has joined in thank you for joining us and the hashtag for the festival is hashtag pride life fest so if you're talking about it if you're sharing about it please do use the hashtag so we can also see you and also amplify that heading right to our brilliant programming for the day so when the pride life fest was visualized the team definitely wanted to start from the basic building blocks and ethics and this this one specific session is aimed at all the allies in the room we really appreciate your relentless support to everyone in the community and this is another opportunity to listen and work towards being a better ally not just to the cis queer individuals in the community but also to the trans people intersex people gender non binary and everyone across the spectrum and honestly everyone by starting from the very small act of understanding one's preferred pronouns when shakespeare asks what's in a name we answer well it's in the pronoun please join me as we welcome div viru aka divine scarlet for a very very insightful session that's what's in a pronoun a guide for non lgbtq plus folks they were who are a gender non conforming person and prefer a m air pronouns they are a makeup artist drag queen digital painter youtuber and a motivational speaker who have recently started a chat show called gender chat on their channel divine scarlet they believe that coming out is always one's choice and today they will be taking us through a guide for non lgbtq plus individuals divine scarlet over to you Hi everyone! Can you guys see me? Can you guys hear me? Hi. So, uh, hello, Earthlings. This is Divine Scarlet, as the Earthlings named me. So, I come from the planet Uranus, and uh, you know, I have been watching the human beings around for over a decade and centuries. I don't know how many years have passed now, but I realized that there's one problem on Earth, which I didn't find it on my planet. So here, people keep on deciding what the person's gender is. We never knew what gender was before that, you know. So. when i noticed that people have been dividing everything into binaries i realized that oh my god where am i going to fit in because i am not i am not a man or a woman or a transgender for that matter so where do i fit in so um i'm going to tell you how you should decide or talk about someone's gender whenever you meet uh, meet them in future because this might you know be a shocker but if you do uh, ask a person what their gender is and what their preferred pronouns are you are taking a step in giving them the right to choose for themselves so it's important that you always ask a person what is their gender identity and what are their pronouns i have recently started in the month of may i started a channel called divine scarlet well duh and i have been making episodes called gender chat where i talk to our gender non conforming and non binary people uh surprisingly they can be lgbt and they can be straight as well but the gender still remains non binary 
and it's um, why uh, if you ask me is important to ask someone about their gender identity, let me give you a background. For the longest period of time, for let's say 15, 18, 20 years of someone's life, a person has been struggling to decide whether they actually fit in from uh, with the gender that they were born with. For example, um, I was told by the earthlings that I am a man. And uh, for the longest period of my life on earth, I kept on wondering, do I fit in as a man? But then I, you know, started exploring makeup and then people started asking me if I'm a woman. And I realized that I was not comfortable with either of them, nor man, nor woman. So what am I? Am I transgender? No, because I do not feel that I want to change my body. And if I'm comfortable with my body, but it's just the gender that I'm not comfortable with, then what do I identify as? So I came to know about various gender identities and terminologies. So I started and decided uh, that I am gender non-conforming, androgynous, and that's how I came in terms with my gender identity. However, when someone would call me as she or address me as girl, sometimes I feel offended, sometimes I feel okay with it. And sometimes when someone calls me he, I feel again, sometimes offended, sometimes uh, fine with it. So I felt that there is a little bit of conflict here and I'm not sure if I'm okay with someone using he or someone using she for me. So what gender pronouns do I, uh, you know, I, I'm okay with. So I did my research and found out that uh, they can be used as a gender neutral pronoun. And fair enough, uh, I thought that I would give it a try and I felt really comfortable with it. Trust me, uh, the moment someone asks me, what is your gender identity and what are, my, uh, what are your preferred pronouns? I feel that the person is giving the importance to my identity. And I feel like talking to that person and give them the importance. So just in case, even if you feel that the person is this gender, try not to be judgmental and ask them what is their gender identity and what pronouns should you use. That will give them a little confidence that you value their you know, identity and you want to make sure that you do not offend them. So that's what I usually keep on uh, advocating for as well in my videos that I have been posting. Um, so that's, uh, you know, what I would like to tell you about the pronouns. Uh, and if you have questions, uh, please do ask. I can, I'm happy to answer your questions related to uh, my look, gender pronouns, gender identities, any confusion about gender identities, please drop in your question. I am ready to answer them. If I'm not ready, I'll let you know. <laughs> Let's see, do we have some questions today? Hmm. Wow. There are quite a lot of um, messages I can see. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for the compliments. I absolutely love you all. And um, Tell us about your look and what does it mean to be gender fluid? All right. Let's start with what does it mean to be gender fluid? Um, so the thing is, um, fluidity, as you know, that it changes its shape, um, its uh, identity altogether. Uh, for example, water, you put it in a jar, it becomes the shape of jar. You put it in a bucket, it becomes the shape of a bucket, which means that it is fluid, it can change, and it does not really... Uh, Clifford, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not audible. People, am I audible? Please tell me I'm audible. Yes, yes, you're audible. Okay, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So uh, gender fluidity basically means that um, a person feels like woman at times and at times they feel like a man. 
um and uh, it does not have anything to do with what your genitals are it's basically what is you know constructed in our heads what masculinity is what femininity is for example i am talking like that with my hands and waving that would that would be considered as feminine whereas when i sit like this and i talk like you know like hi what's up so that is considered as masculine so i feel sometimes that i'm uh, masculine sometimes i'm feminine sometimes i'm not either of them sometimes i'm both of them so that i believe is what gender fluidity is at least that's what i heard from the gender fluid people um uh, there were more questions uh, could you please read me the questions i'm a little too far from my phone yes so uh, we have a question that says uh, how to say that my how to say to my parents which is the best country who support lgbtq plus rights i'm sorry how to tell my parents yeah so basically i'm assuming that the question means that how do how does someone talk to their parents about lgbtq plus community and create awareness as the first part of the question the second part is which country is the best when it comes to supporting all these rights okay so here's a fun thing okay um if your parents are really cool and you are comfortable with your parents you can try what one of my really close friends did uh she i'm using she because i've confirmed with her so she uh, went up to their parents and uh, she told them that uh, mom dad i'm lesbian and she's not so <laughs> their uh, her parents were um you want to talk about it how all of us said did you come to the conclusion that you're lesbian so that uh, you know went quite well she spoke to them and she told them about me she told about the friends that she has in the community and they were really you know okay with that because they understand that uh, the people are not hurting anyone however if your parents are not very open minded and you are very skeptic about how to talk to them you can always uh, you know poke a little thing in between like you know oh dad do you know alan turing uh, was the first man to discover or you know invent computer and you know what he was castrated but just because he was gay how sad is that i mean small conversations where you can a little bit sensitize sensitize ah what the hell am i saying you can sensitize your parents along with you know telling them about the fabulous people of the community ellen the generous who has been you know doing amazing work with the be kind project and there are so many amazing personalities that you can talk about to your parents and see what their opinions are and try and educate them more so that they understand it better and second part was about the country is it Okay so about the country I personally haven't visited any country apart from India so I'm sorry I'm not very good with it uh, but I think India is uh, a mix of both I have lived freely I have lived dangerously I have lived like uh, an advertisement of mountain dew dar ke aage jeet hai so <laughs> Yes uh, I think uh, I love India for now but I would love to explore other countries uh, so I'm sorry I can't answer that much about that <laughs> any other questions that we have Yes we have some really interesting questions coming in uh one question is addressed to you that asks is gender something spiritual or physical or psychological or just it's just the way you express yourself in the form of clothes and get up Okay so uh let me put uh, let me put this across to everyone who's watching um gender is everything including spiritual physical emotional psychological um educational it comes in every form um because the thing is um if you are a spiritualist you would believe that uh, there are two opposing forces um in chinese it is considered yin and yang in hindu mythology it is considered purush and prakriti so um there are uh, you know opposing uh, spirits and uh, in yin and yang if you have uh, noticed there is always a yin in a yang and there um i'm assuming the bandwidth is low on your front
Do not do this to me. Okay, yeah. I am back. Hi. Am I audible? Yes, 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 you are. You were frozen okay. for just a bit. Okay, that, where that did you lose was... me? We lost you where you were talking about how gender is everything. You were answering that question. Is okay, it so did I talk about yin and yang? Yeah, you were talking okay. about the yin and the yang. Perfect. So, um, as I said, in yin and yang, there's always yin and yang and yang and yin. So basically, it uh, tells you that masculinity and femininity are always, you know, uh, together and they have to coexist. Some people uh, identify that masculinity and femininity within themselves. Some people look for the masculinity or femininity according to their own uh, spirit. So that's Oh no, we've lost you again. Until Diviru is back, please keep sending us your questions. We have so many amazing questions coming in. We would like to take as much as possible up with him, but we are up with them. But we are just going to wait for them to come back. Like Nenil had mentioned before, there's always something going on with something else. So since we are kind of in a frozen situation here, um, you can always, always talk about us on social media. It's hashtag Pride Life Fest. And I'm believing they are back. Yes. Hi, I'm so sorry. I think Zoom is <laughs> acting stupid on my phone. Oh, dear Lord. This human technology is out of my reach. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so where were we? Psychological, I was talking about psychological, I yes. guess. So psychological, definitely there is psychological impact because, uh, you know, uh, we have been gr uh, growing up in a certain condition since our childhood. Most of us are, I'm pretty sure none of us were so privileged to be free of the notions uh, beforehand. So we have been told, told about, you know, every man has a woman, every woman has a man, a woman has to dress up this way and act this way, a man has to be this way, act this way. So we have all come up with that kind of mentality since our childhood and eventually with the, the people like me, we realize that, okay, I have been told that a woman is supposed to do that, but why do I like to do that? Mm. And I've been told that a man is supposed to do that, but I don't feel comfortable doing that. So what is, this does create a psychological impact uh, inside our neurons. The nervous system gets failed. There is some spark, and then we just go crackhead and uh, you know uh, just get messed up with the gender identity and become this. So <laughs> there, there's always you know certain part uh, that you can always relate to um, in terms of psychological, social, economical, everything. So that's about it, I think. Uh, any other questions that we yes. have? Yes, we have a question that's very close to this one. I have been battling with this for a long time now, but I never understood what it was because I never had a problem with pronouns. I always ended up using both assigned male and female words as it is in Hindi until I came across my transgender friend. And so I have been thinking maybe I am by gender, but I don't know if I am. Just thinking like this because of her being in my life, or am I actually by gender? Um, so here's the thing. I feel whatever you feel your gender is, that is your gender identity, first. Secondly, there is nothing to be stressed out about. If you feel that you are by gender, if you feel that you are non-gender conforming, if you feel that you are transgender, um, that's, everything is okay. I mean, I know that some of you might have to go through documents and, you know, get them corrected and things like that. Um, mostly the trans people have to get that done because now that go, uh, government brought in transgender regulation or rule, but they never consulted with the transgender community. So that is a waste. Yet uh, some people would like to, you know, um, get their identities uh, checked and changed. But as long as it is not affecting your daily performances, your day-to-day -day life, don't stress about it. 
the things will uncover and unfold in front of you that will help you realize and come in terms with it. I have a friend. Um, you guys are going to see them. Uh, their name is Zish. Um, and they do not go with any gender identity that has been defined by the humanity till now. So that's about it. They don't really go with it any, any of it. So that's okay too. So yeah, I think uh, you do not need to stress about it. Let it now go with the flow and explore with the time. Another interesting question for you. Can sapiosexuals be attracted to emotional intelligence in a person and not just mental intelligence? In short, IQ and EQ, because the person asking this question identifies with this. Um, okay. Um, first of all, people who believe sapiosexuality is a sexuality, it's not sexuality. Secondly, sapiosexuality sexualism that people consider uh it's actually just uh you know your preference for example i like twins or i like hunks or i like uh nerds or i like geeks the kind of person that i like okay so sapiosexuality so as to say it's only an attraction to a certain kind and yes People have emotional intelligence and some have, uh, you know, brain intelligence while they do not have any uh, emotional intelligence at all. Um, so I do not really, uh, uh, you know, um, completely understand what sapiosexuality is because I find human beings attractive in general uh, unless they open their mouth and speak some shit and that just pisses me off. So... <laughs> So, yeah, as long as people are humble, polite, and generous, and kind, that's all the quality that I, uh, you know, find attractive. Um, so I'm not very really sure how sapiosexual so people really uh, classify things. Yeah. Someone had a very interesting comment in the chat box that said, sapiosexual is ableist. And I really, really appreciate that you started having these conversations. Another question you have... Um, says I'm gender fluid, I'm feminine and masculine both. I'm very, I'm mostly very feminine, but cannot be confined to one gender. I'm assigned female at birth and sometimes feel dysphoric about my body. How do I deal with it? Okay, so if you have, a, if you feel that you have gender dysphoria, uh, even slightest, I would recommend you to uh, see a therapist. Reason, again, people, if you see, if you hear someone saying, see a therapist, do not take it as someone is telling you that you're mentally sick. No. I mean, I sought therapy when I was feeling really depressed. And it's okay to go seek a therapist because at times you do not have answers. Your family does not have answers. Your friends do not have answers. So who do you go to? You have to go to a professional. For example, if I have eye problems, if I have some problems in my eyes, I will not go to my father and tell him that, okay, my, I think my eyesight is weak. And he will say that, okay, I just go and buy some spectacles. No, I have to go to uh, you know, the specialist who would tell me what is the con problem, what is the condition and what would be required. So go seek a therapist. They would help you to figure out your uh, gender dysphoria. They are, there are professional uh, therapists who can help you out with it. And uh, it is not something that you just jump into it because it's your whole lot of life decision that goes uh, along with it. Because once you decide that you have gender dysphoria, you have to you know, do things to uh, make it better. Okay, where you can feel comfortable, where you do not feel uncomfortable with your body. So things that has to go along with it, it's going to take a lot. Seek a therapist, talk to them, figure it out and be okay with yourself. Don't just let it, you know, go along for, for a long time. That's what I would say. There are so many questions coming up and we are running out of time. So we're going to take one last question. Sure, uh, some of the questions will be answered in the due course of our whole event. And if you have more specific questions, then we'd be happy to connect them with you. 
and you know maybe we can all find out answers uh, so the one last question is as a parent how do i monitor my how my kids interact with you as an example without causing hurt or offense Okay, um, so as a parent, how you monitor your kid interacting with me without hurting uh, me or offending me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so here's the thing. Uh, every individual is different and every individual may react differently to different, uh, you know, my people, be it kids, elderly or um, teenage or uh, anyone. So everyone has different way to uh, things, uh, reacting to things. My personal belief is that kids are usually curious and um, I personally do not take any offense in whatever the kids call me or tell me until and unless it is completely out of line. And I'm pretty sure any good parent would have taught their kids not to be abusive, not to, uh, you know, physically assault someone or abuse someone. Because I have seen some really nasty kids who would uh, I mean, instead of being curious, they would come and literally, literally tell me that, uh, I mean, ma bhen ki gali. That is what people have. The kids, like they're five or six, seven years old or eight years old, those kind of kids were, uh, were abusing. And to be very honest, I can either, you know, hold, uh, hold them uh, with their arms and, uh, you know, shake them off, like, try and talk to me right now. Or else... If your kid does not abuse, and if you have told your kids that, you know, abusing is really bad, pretty sure the kid is going to come up and be like, My didi aap aise kyun ho, bhai aap aise kyun ho? And I'm happy to answer that. Because the curiosity of a kid is what we all actually need. If we do not know how to be curious and be limited to our knowledge, that is what the major problem is to everyone uh, who has grown up. So um, people need to be curious. And if the kids are being curious, I would be happy to answer them. I would tell them myself that, you know, uh, sweetheart, you should not say that. That is not a nice thing. You are being mean. You know what? I'm going to complain it to your parents. So I would love to have a kid openly talking to me and be okay with it. As a parent, what you could do is, the best thing you could do is teach them not to be abusive, teach them not to physically assault anyone, teach them it's okay to cry and uh, feel vulnerable and feel okay the way they feel. So that's what I would say. That's, that's beautiful and that's like a very interesting note to close this conversation on. Because what follows up to this conversation is exactly about this. Thank you for having this very, very honest, literally out of this world conversation. We at least have 50% of the audience crushing to know how did you come up with the look and what are your secrets. So we hope that you will tell us how to do this better. Thank you so much for being a part of this. We really, really appreciate your honesty. It was amazing. Thank you, all the team, um, the local uh, samosa, the social ketchup, the social samosa. Everyone, I am really grateful to give Mara for you guys to give us an opportunity to be here and, you know, express and talk about the community and uh, have a dialogue about it. So thanks a lot. And I'm not going to take much of time. Thank you, everyone, to join us. Join me. Be the alien with me. Thank you all. Lots of love. Happy Pride Month to people. Thank you. Happy Pride to you too. It's so interesting, right? Because how Divine Scarlet spoke about different walks of life and why is it important to ask for someone's preferred pronouns, not just in forums like these, but literally in all walks of life. So a huge honor thanks to us, thanks to them again. But talking right about walks of life, my mind just diverts towards one of these most recent conversations that has been taking center place in living rooms and boardrooms across the world, and that is of mental health. In the light of a global pandemic where the entire human kind was left to do nothing but to look inward for sustenance, this conversation started not just as a dialogue, but at times as a very chaotic monologue. Seeking help, therefore, becomes really, really essential. 
but how do you go about this process knowing that every single institution is often built for the binaries built for people who are, who are perceived as normal this is exactly where queer affirmative therapy and queer affirmative therapists play a vital role our first panel for the day therefore looks at mental health from coming out to conquering the world please welcome our panelists saida lamia parveen counseling psychologist and a core member of the queer muslim project pooja nair independent therapist and a team member at the mariwala health initiatives queer affirmative counseling also the member of the feminist collective labia arti selvan founder post perspective mental health practitioner and queer affirmative therapist this panel is also what brought to you in association with our community partners pause for perspective over to you hi, hi. hey guys you can hear me folks yeah. you can yeah hey pooja hi lamia hi Islam. hey right there hi um thank you so much for joining me today um and uh, you know i want to start with um wanting to uh, we'll just get right to it um i wanted to know you know if i can ask you from your particular identity location what do you see are life stressors that queer folk experience which do you want to go first okay i was just going to ask you lamia <laughs> all right uh well i, I don't mind uh, uh, going first uh, unless you want to no no please go ahead all right okay okay uh, uh so uh, thank you for uh, uh, having me here today arti uh, it's a pleasure to be talking to the two of you uh, since we have connected in other spaces as well um so uh uh asking uh, uh in in asking me where how i understand stressors because of my particular location i think it, it's important to unpack this location for myself and for those uh, who are listening so in terms of uh, my location if we are only talking about the axes of marginalization based on gender uh, and sexuality i am uh, a cis gendered person uh i am a cis woman and uh, um sexuality wise uh, uh, how i define myself how i identify is lesbian and so i will be speaking from that particular location in addition to also speaking from uh, uh, a, a savarna space uh, 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 and uh, also i think privileged in terms of class uh and uh, educational opportunities etc so um what are the unique uh, stressors for someone like me uh and here also to uh, then say that uh, the personal or my personal is a huge part of my work is a huge part of my vocation is a huge part of how i engage with the world so all these uh, lines are going to get a little bit blurred when i uh, uh, when i talk about uh, uh, unique stressors because i'd like it to also be useful to those who are not from the same location maybe there is something there that we can uh, uh, connect on or draw from um okay so uh, if i have to start talking about what it is to be lesbian i will very specifically want to talk about what it is to be a fem lesbian uh and uh, by fem uh, i think it's a it has to do with uh, a certain gender expression it has to do with uh, how you relate uh to a, a masculine woman or the butch lesbian and all of these things are embedded in the in the identity of a fem lesbian and i would uh, and this is something i've been trying to raise at various points at various spaces and opportunities to say that the erasure that fem lesbians experience is of a very particular kind their gender uh, which seem so gender expression which seems to fit the mainstream i mean i i look like uh, 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 any other woman uh, i look like a woman who's uh, who looks like how a woman should and therefore how could i be anything but heterosexual mm-hmm. and and that's that's a question that i have had to in my journey and in also seeing the journeys made by 
femi- um, uh, cis uh, women, feminine uh, women, uh, and uh, with their queerness, I see these parallels in their journeys as well. Uh, if you look like, if you look so perfect for male consumption, how do you continue to hold on to your lesbian identity? And that's been a, a question for me. So when we say unique stressors, one thing that has really impacted my life, and I also see this in my work uh, as well, is the question of invisibility, is the question of erasure, is the question of the identity never being seen as fully formed. There's always a bit of a sketchiness there. There's always a bit of, you know, feeling shaken, not quite there yet. These are all struggles that a lot of gender conforming queer people experience. So that, that's where I want to then take this uh, discussion too, when you're gender conforming. So you fit the rules of gender, you don't fit the rules of sexuality, and then the world doesn't know what to do with you. Uh, anymore and I think they could also be said uh, of certain other uh, locations as well so uh, yeah I'll just say that much uh, in terms of highlighting the invisibility yes over and out thank you Pooja yeah. all right uh, okay, should I speak? yes please yeah. um, I think like I want to start by saying that queer experiences are uh, I don't I don't oh, sorry are the, um, diverse and definitely, uh, like, even though there is some sort of universal experience, but I also feel like based on your individual location and your, uh, you know, the intersectional nature of your privileges and where you lie, uh, your experiences definitely will differ. For me, I always speak from the location of a queer Muslim woman. And I think it's because uh, this is something that I, I have been uh, struggling to bring to queer spaces is that my struggle is not just one fold. It's not just about being queer. It's also about being a Muslim woman in a country like India. So I really always um, try and understand my location and whatever things that I have to face or the day-to-day uh, microaggression, so to say, that I have to face are because of both of these locations and both of these marginalizations, uh, like being Muslim and queer and of course like a woman. So yeah, but being a uh, queer Muslim woman, I think um, first, like uh, Pooja was saying, the feminism is something that is extremely important to me. So na- navigating this patriarchal uh, family structures and institutions, of course, is a part of it. And at the same time, or as a queer person, I think uh, this sense of uh, invisibility, but also uh, visibility this line between that because like i'm in a relationship i have a partner so it is not difficult for people to know i'm queer but at the same time uh, uh i also sometimes prefer this invisibility because it also keeps me safe and gives me protection like for example where i'm living like i don't want my neighbors to know i'm queer because i don't want to be thrown out you know so i think it's a very fine balance to maintain that visibility and invisibility like at the same time whereas erasure is something i definitely feel I, like I struggle with. Sometimes I also crave that invisibility so that I don't have to face the consequences so head on. And I think that is uh, uh, both uh, uh, like a bad thing and a good thing. Like it's it's very uh, difficult to navigate, but that's the, the fine line that I have to walk. And I think those are some of the, the unique life stressors that I face, like just the daily day-to-day experiences of uh, just this hyper vigilance and you know um, just oh, being aware all the time where you are whether you're safe physically whether it's a it's it's okay for you to be as pure as you actually are and how much of yourself to hide I think these are things that you'd like a lot of people wouldn't take into account like just how stressful it is you know like just talking to my family uh, it becomes stressful because there's so many things around me that don't know even though like I'm sort of out to them so I have to censor what I'm sharing with them. I have to censor what I'm saying. It's just this sense of policing my words all the time. I think that is just so stressful to me day to, in my day-to-day life. And as a queer Muslim woman, again, like I have to deal with Islamophobia from all sides all the time. So that on top, like, especially in queer spaces, it has become so prevalent now. So I think this is like just, just very stressful for me uh, in my unique location, I would say. I think, yeah, I think that would be my 
Thank you, Lamia. I think both of you sort of mentioned so beautifully and bring out to the surface the, the idea and the experience of invisibility and erasure that is intersectional, that we actually hold several identities uh, within us and, um, you know, that uh, being uh, femme, lesbian, being queer, Muslim, um, you know, all of these sort of come together in a certain way to create uh, stress that you're talking about. Uh, I think for me personally, it is I, I identify um, sec sexually as a bisexual woman. Um, and I'm in a marriage, a cis uh, het marriage with a uh, cis het man. Um, and I have two children, I don't know if you saw them sort of running uh, right behind me. And, and having to um, actually, uh, I think for me, it has also, I think my particular uh, location uh, in this sort of um, space of being married to um, a cis het man and having children um, is about sort of this nuance of what, what it means to be within a relationship um that that you know i may you know am i representing myself accurately do i even need to do this work of um coming out you know and 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 just also from hearing the both of you talk this there is something about there is something violent about this act of coming out something uh, so emotionally laborious about coming out you know and that actually was going to be my next question that the emotional labor of those in the margins until having to do the important and excruciating work of coming out. And so I was wondering what is your sense of what a queer person should be mindful of in their journey of coming out to others around them. I think Lamia, you already spoke about how sometimes there is comfort in the invisibility. And, um, and then uh, I find myself to actually challenge myself to, to be present in a certain location within my sexuality, not just for myself, for my children as well, because I have sort of had to endure um, that struggle in not accepting myself for years together, and then having to put out the labor of uh, coming out. And then I want to be able to do it, not just for me anymore, but for my children as well. You know, uh, to the point that my children and we're having these conversations where we're saying, you know, my my um, um, uh, Neil says he uh, so so he's still about six, so we still don't know. I don't know how to explain to him pronouns, but he says, you know, I'm sometimes I'm the wind. Sometimes he says uh, I'm not boy girl, and then we are able to talk about non-conforming. And my daughter, um, who, who she also says. Um, you know, um, I'm, I'm boyish girl. So, you know, to hold these conversations and, and to know that with language and how do, how do I explain pronouns at this point, you know, that seems to be a bit of a space that I am in, but I'm wondering about what your sense is of a queer person and what they need to be mindful of in this journey of coming out to others around them. So, uh, um... I think uh, what I'd like to say first is uh, I wish coming out wasn't such a huge uh, milestone even. I mean, um, I mean, it's one thing to say that coming out is necessary, but it's quite another to say that coming out is a condition for being authentic. But that's how, you know, that, that's how, that, that's what it becomes. Because otherwise, um, as I said earlier, and Lamia also said, the, the, you, it just uh, it just adds to the erasure. It it adds to the world seeing you a particular way and not really taking any uh, evidence to the contrary into account. I mean, very often, I think there's also this part of when you come out, and and there are people who will tell you that they always had a sense. And at that time, I remember thinking, why didn't you tell me then? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that would have really, I think, speeded up a few things for me in, in life. Uh, so uh, so when, when that's the case, I mean, so much riding on coming out that that also takes its own, that, that, that's all, that also becomes a stressor then. Mm -hmm. Because there is so much uh, riding on it. There are so many conversations that depend on the coming out. And even that is not fair because so many of our life plans, life conversations, for example, say the marriage question. 
that might be depending on this perhaps moving cities that might be depending on uh, coming out so many life plans almost seem stalled because coming out hasn't happened so just to say that there is so much riding on it and that's really really unfair first of all and the other reason why this becomes unfair is that uh, is when it becomes your need and not mine you know when it's about the world asking for authenticity asking for proof of authenticity and then therefore what you've done is then you've snatched the coming out thing right out out of my hands i mean it's no longer on my terms it's it's something that i need to do in order to live my life the way i'd like you know and of course i mean i'm not trying to uh, erase uh, journeys of uh, coming out where you know it has been a huge celebration and all i'm not trying to take away from it i just uh, just trying to contextualize uh, uh, this whole thing a little bit so yeah coming out is uh, is a huge uh, is is a, is is a huge deal is seen as a milestone it's a huge stressor as well and one of the things that makes it so stressful is the multiple times you have to do it it's it's not like that degree that you can just get at one shot you know you will have to keep going back to that school you keep going to you, you might fail the second time also so even the outcomes are not sure you, there is there are certain risks involved uh, risks might be different from uh, risks might be different in different spaces outcomes might be different uh, uh, in different spaces there is a, so if we see it not as an event but like the opening ceremony to a series of events i think that might help us really take a look at the energies we might need in order to uh, you know make the decision to come out to see it as the starting point rather than the destination i mean in some way self acceptance can be separated from coming out here i'm trying to also separate that you know you accept yourself but also to see that when we talk of coming out do i know in what ways will i be able to uh, engage with what follows do uh, in what ways will i look at the risks in what ways will i understand how much of it is coming from my need and how much of it is being demanded of me how much of the coming out is non consensual in that way you know if it is being demanded so all of this i think um, if, if 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 i can think about this for myself i think that would be a good way to also take care of uh myself <laughs> so yeah um uh for this question uh, something that comes to my mind is i was actually watching this documentary disclosure last night on netflix it's about a representation of trans people in hollywood it's amazing actually and there's the someone who said there that you know uh coming out presupposes that there is something to disclose right and it just assumes that you have to sh- you're hiding this thing and you just have to tell people this so i think that's that's a good perspective on like coming out and of course like who just said it doesn't like end one time like i think i've come out to my family at least like three four times now but just still in denial about it and also it's such a um, such a continuous process in a way because every person you meet you have to decide like how much of yourself you you want to share with them right like including like taking cabs and people will ask you things like random things and each person you have to decide how much to share and how how much to not share and that's just so weird to constantly just uh you know calculate what risk there is just to quickly think or oh, if this is like if i can say this or if i can say that and if i'm safe to say this i think it's just extremely tiring to constantly do this with everyone you come across um so yeah i think coming out is definitely not one big moment when you just like tell everyone that oh this is who i am but it's just like this process this life long process i think this is also like again like i'm going to like pop culture but i think ian mcclennan like i was watching this interview and he said that i'm 90 years old and like this driver asked me today are you married and like so i am still coming out to like every person even though i came out like 50 years ago you know so that's just how it is like every single person you're deciding how much to share and i think it's extremely stressful and also like i think while we having discussions about coming out i think it's also important to acknowledge that some people do not have the option of not coming out you know there is something like visibly queer people especially a lot of trans people they don't really have the option of not coming out so to say 
so uh, while the closet is extremely traumatic if like there is a closet and it's extremely oppressive some people don't even have that option to be there right so i think uh, discussions on coming uh, like coming out becomes such a only thing like such an important like the the thing we talk about queer people and the only like every time i meet people they just keep saying things like oh like are you out like have you come out did you tell your parents like why is this such an important part of my story like i don't know like it's just supposed to be this significant thing that is that has to be so important and that everyone is to know about somehow so i think like while i am also extremely proud some way that i did have the chance and opportunity and the privilege to come out even though like you know like they were in denial or whatever but i didn't face like physical violence so to say so i feel like i am still grateful that i had that opportunity but also it's just like ridiculous that that is the only thing we keep talking about you know so yeah i think i don't really have anything else to say about coming out i don't okay. think queer people need to be mindful of like other people's reactions except for in terms of like safety this is something i do tell people that you know like it's important that you feel safe if you do decide to come out uh sometimes like i said that that option is not accorded to you but if you can do it i feel like that's that's a good uh like sort of what to say criteria for yourself to have yeah yeah thank you so much it was it was beautiful to hear the both of you talk about um some of these things that i'm you know sort of leading into my next question which you had said about how self acceptance is not the same as coming out and um and namia you said you you just need to be mindful of how you feel right like it's not about other people you're coming out is not about other people and and um you know i'm just sort of piggy backing on those insights i wanted my next question was you know um while there is so much going on there is so much um such unique stressors um upon queer lives um i'm wondering um uh, you know how how might i find hope for how might i find strength in 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 affirming myself um you know uh, especially when i don't have support what is your sense of um what what do you say so um i think uh, search for support systems begins by taking stock of what you have lost you know where, where what what are the gaps that you might need to fill what are the support systems that you can no longer access for because of your uh, gender and sexuality that doesn't conform uh, to the ideal so i think uh, just just knowing that you will you may not have the chance to look for support systems within normative kinships you know there is no uh, sympathetic relative uh, or, your, or your or parents or you know or all those spaces that you uh, uh, you perhaps had in a pre <laughs> coming out era in that sense uh, may just uh, may just no longer be uh, accessible i was just uh, saying this to uh, uh, some uh, this other person uh, that uh, you know it, it might be simply about even not being able to have conversations beyond hi how are you because i how in in what ways do you expect me to talk about my life keeping in mind your discomfort or disavowal of all of that you know so yeah loss of support systems is a huge huge uh, uh, is a huge event of sorts so once we i think uh, in some ways have been able to take stock of that we also realize that we will have to put in the work to look for alternatives which are not outside uh, which are outside these normative kinships which means perhaps um uh, community uh, spaces or queer friends uh, that you uh, make i mean i'm uh, if if you if you have uh, cis heterosexual people in your life if you continue to have them <laughs> great but i think i also speak from the experience of having lost even long friendships you know friendships that are 10 years old 15 years old and just losing uh, using those forms of support system and then seeing that uh, community spaces or queer friends are where i i will find uh, that support and at the same time i mean this might sound a bit uh, again uh, quite uh, like a sad uh, tale because i'm talking about how in community if i find say three people 
I will continue to reckon with the loss of 10 people. So the three may not even in pure numbers make up for the 10 that you have lost. And the other disproportionate part of it is that I will have to, uh, it's not as if my life struggles have changed in any way. I'm actually dealing with far more in life because of my location, but my social system has reduced, sorry, social support systems have reduced. So I have five struggles and two sources of support. Now the five in number have not reduced, my support system has reduced. So there is a disproportionate uh, Nest to the whole uh, idea as well, and I think uh, I mean when uh, when around you you see queer people uh, such as yourself live, try to uh, I mean survive of course, and also try to thrive at the same time. You see that people are really um, uh, are really able to uh, you know figure this out for themselves, are able to uh, reach out. Uh, of course, uh, we, we are talking about things like access and uh, geographical uh, sub, uh, locations as well. Uh, if you are able to um, uh, reach out, you draw on that for support. And I think, uh, I think what I'm trying to do right now is avoid the word resilience, uh, and which is I'm trying to think of a hundred other ways to talk about it without talking about uh, resilience. But then it is there. I mean, you see it in uh, marginalized lives, how we are able to make what we do of it, despite the absence of uh, so much out there, I think, yeah. So to uh, sum up, agency is very, very important. Let's, uh, let's continue to center the agency of people in even conversations about support systems. So the support systems that they may choose to access, the, uh, the families that they build along the way, but they were not born with, all of this has to do with the hard work of the queer individual. You know, I just want to add um, that resistance to say the word resilience, right? I feel that too. And I feel like um, it is also present and don't want to say the word because I think it's important to locate where the, where the pain is coming from and the pain is not internal. Like I'm not feeling um, stress about being queer uh, by myself. It is actually because of what is being pushed upon me about who I am supposed to be instead. And I think um, if we can sort of, uh, this this thing about resilience and sort of I, uh, how uh, sort of romanticizing that uh, pain of the margins, so that that's what it is, right? And, and if uh, I think that peeling those layers of uh, who we are happens because we have to peel it away. What we're peeling away is the gender binary that has been thrown upon us, the heteronormative, heteronormativity that has been thrown, thrown upon us. And if I can sort of, it's, it's, these are the ideas that sneak upon us and, and pull us down um, from the voice that is present within. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to reflect on that and say, um, I think the problem, the locating the problem is necessary and the problem is uh, this box that we're told um, we need to subscribe to, live within and exist in. Uh, um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think drawing from what Pooja has said, you know, like this loss of support that you had earlier, like and this loss that you might face or do face because of your gender or sexuality and how that like, like taking stock of that leads you to like reach out for support and all of that. Um, I do like personally feel community has been something so important to me. And it may not be a physical presence of people around me, but like community in the sense that, you know, like when I was living in the small town and I like, there was no one around me, I uh, took to books and literature, right? And to read about queer people like me in history. And that gave me the sense of community that was not available to me, like not uh, accessible to me. So I think we can find the sources of support in different places. And most often, of course, like birth families or like friends or all of these things, they, they, you might lose out on them. And that is just so tragic, but it's such a real part of the queer experience somehow. But I really do feel like just finding uh, you know, community in any form, online forums, books and literature, just looking like trying to find queer movies. I think this, all of these things have really helped me uh, find, like ground myself and, you know, know that I belong to a history of people like me 
who have who share similar narratives who have this universal experience even like though we've lived completely different lives and i think that has been something where i've been able to draw support from and i do encourage people to go and seek all of this out if a physical community is not available to you um and what you said about you know this the pain understanding that this pain is not mine now you know it's not my burden it's what is being put on me i think having that awareness like knowing that it's not like my fault that i am suffering and it's because the society is structured in a way that wants to put me down so having that awareness itself i think is so important this is in fact again i'm going to sorry like steal from puja because she mentioned this in another session she where she talked about inner resources i think like that was so significant because like she was talking about how like before we i we told other people we were pure we were like focusing like we had our own like ourselves to depend on and that like somehow like finding out that inner resource again i think is very important and at this i like credit goes to puja for saying this because like she said it in another um uh, session uh, so yeah i think finding ways of support uh, that can be accessible to you and that can be available available to you i think is very important because you definitely need a support system and if it's a physical presence that's not available to you then then there are other options for you like you know my books have been something that i've always been obsessed with and they let me i started reading all this queer literature i think like i collected like 100 queer books on my kindle and just started reading all of them so you know so i think like for me that kept me alive for like 2 years almost when i had absolutely no one around me i wasn't telling a single soul so i think those places and those those support like that support can be accessed you know what of course this also like this is this also comes with privilege definitely like i could download those books and i could go and find them out uh, so i mean definitely that is there but as much as you can i think it, it is a good way of like online the forums and all of those things yeah i think that's a good way of getting some support when you don't really have a physical support system in place thank you thank you lamia um lakshmi you're here does that mean we need to wrap up okay <laughs> um can i do one more like really tiny okay so i just uh, i wanted to wrap up with some reflection on what uh, um who a queer affirmative therapist is um and what to look out for because the last session we sort of ended on you know go see a therapist and i want to uh, say that not just any therapist a queer affirmative therapist and so real quickly if you both can sort of just reflect on um what it is that uh, someone should watch out for when they are looking out for therapists it'll be a nice way to sort of wrap up our session so yeah so um uh, what uh, who is a queer affirmative therapist or what can i look for in a therapist uh, to um uh it is uh, so here i'll just begin by talking about uh, uh, a certain uh, liberal or a neutral or an objective viewpoint that largely the mental health field upholds you know that all of us um, uh, i all of us need empathy and all of us need support and the, every client uh, needs support without looking at where certain marginalizations would place the client at a disadvantage so what you might want to look for is is a therapist who is able to hold that difference and that marginalization for you if there is an assumption of sameness i have depression you have depression they have depression they have anxiety if it is only about a certain enforced sameness then the particularity of our lives of our queer lives of our sexual gender identity will never get uh, the the support it needs you know we're talking about so much erasure and invisibilization outside we don't want that in therapy therapeutic spaces also so therapeutic space should be something that accounts for this difference is also prepared to do that extra that is needed for the difference you know so we're talking about uh, equity here so what is in what ways can uh, the therapist Uh, do that little bit extra needed for a person who comes from a marginalized location because we also know that 
everything that psychology and counseling teaches us in terms of techniques and uh, tips and things like that processes and all have all been modeled on the privileged persons they they modeled they studied they are and for uh, they learned from uh, therapeutic work with uh, uh, the privileged so if 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 that is applied without looking at the specificities of uh, marginalization then i think that will only add to the erasure so it has to be again in very simple words a space that sees you for who you are from sees your marginalization does not assume a sameness in your experience of the world because as you also said earlier what uh, the, so much of my distress is located in the uh, the source is located in the outside so much of it is located in the outside so th- maybe that that could be another thing to look for in what ways are these connections being made between the self and the environment between uh, the self and the outside so in what ways can the uh, is a therapist also able to do those help you make those connections because you might not be in a position to see those connections because you're going there in distress so that could be another thing to also look for so i think yeah these are the few ideas i have right now um so my understanding of where formative therapy comes from like what puja shruti and everywhere at gsb has taught me so uh, more of the same thing that puja was saying but you know like therapy that uses a rice based approach you know understands that mental health is a part of the larger uh, human rights uh, struggle you know and not just locate uh, as like mental illness in the individual in the body and somehow just like not take into account what are the con- what is the life like what is the context of this person you know like mental illness is not just a neat box that you can just pack it and be like you know this is this is anxiety now let's work on this and you just like never consider where this person is coming from so instead of locating it in the person and in the individual understand the context understand it as a part of the larger broad human rights uh, like social justice uh, movement and struggle and all of that so yeah i think for me the very important word was the therapist ally uh, so and going beyond just that one hour that you spend with a client in the clinic and i think like this is something that i have definitely brought into my practice and you know like i do try and go that much extra for my clients so that you know i like of course i'm queer but at the same time like i also have to be an ally to my clients right so i think like that that therapist ally this this just this term itself i think like very easily puts across what the queer affirmative therapist is supposed to be like awesome thank you so much um i am going to uh give it away to lakshmi so she can kick us out of here but thank you so much this was so brilliant and um pooja and lamya it has been so brilliant to have you talk uh, and for us to have this conversation uh, i think these ideas of really looking at um how my experience as an individual who identifies as queer is invis- invisibilized and erased because uh, essentially of my identity location and what it means to sort of these experiences of loss and what what i'm grappling with as a queer person are real and these are the very things that lead to mental health distress and i think it's so important to this is why mental health is located within our identities and uh, intersectional identities that we hold um together so i think that was so brilliant and thank you so much for doing this with me thank you so much thank for you. having me yes absolute pleasure to be talking to the two of you i think uh, i think between the three of us now we seem to have uh, covered quite a bit yes yes, yes thank you so excellent thank, thank you thank you so much lamia pooja and aarti this was such an insightful session right from being comfortable with your own identity with self acceptance to queer formative therapy i think we covered a really broad spectrum and we would also encourage everyone to reach out to more therapists and seek help as and when required across our perspective our community partners for today have been doing some brilliant work in this field and we motivate you to reach out to them thank you so much moving on to our next panel it's it's really funny how everything suddenly falls into place right so when a programmer sits down and charts a programming 
sometimes you predict how the pattern of the event works but sometimes things just seamlessly flow from one into another like before when divine scarlet spoke about seeking therapy to our next panel about mental health milamia spoke about how she tends to escape to literature and reads books so that she feels at home that she feels comfortable being queer in india and especially in a world that is designed in binaries and heteronormativity it is such a difficult experience in times when the reality that we understand is often becoming too difficult to deal with one tends to see like seek escape into art and literature very often they're not this fictional universe becomes another place of disassociation a place where one has to sometimes struggle to find their own voice heard or represented and this representation also is for the riddled with the politics of its own for a whole era of queer individuals across the spectrum raised on chuktai and salvadurai's funny boy it is very liberating to read more accounts of individuals through various media if art reflects life how is the reflection of queerness and how has that evolved over time to answer these questions and to lay, raise a lot more our next panel looks at showing pride to through art and words before i welcome our panelists i would like to say this panel is an association with daisy family which is another group doing brilliant work in the art literature and community building space let's welcome our panelists our first panelist is priya dali priya dali is an illustrator who uses her art to talk about gender sex and sexuality her works i wanted to be the man of the house and maya the warrior are just a couple of examples where she draws on personal experiences to break gender based stereotypes she is also the art director at gazi family a mumbai based organization that offers lgbtq plus community a safe space to share their opinions and stories our second panelist is shaikat majumdar shaikat majumdar is a novelist scholar and a popular commentator on arts literature and higher education he is the author of three novels including most recently the scent of god a queer narrative that attempts to trace the journey of the protagonist's identities across institutions and asks a very essential question that says but will that give the boys a life together in a world that does not recognize their kind of love it was one of the times of india's most talks talked books in 2019 and a finalist for matribhumi book of the year award in 2020 he is taught at stanford university named a fellow at humanities center at wellesley college and is currently a professor of english and creative writing at ashoka university our next panelist is sharif rangnekar sharif is the author of straight to normal my life as a gay man he is the festival director of rainbow lit fest queer and inclusive a communications consultant and former journalist over 25 years of experience in the field of media publishing music curation and public relations sharif uses talks writing music to advocate change and garner support for the lgbtq plus community a tedx speaker sharif provides counsel in the area of diversity and inclusion in the workplace specific to the lgbtq community our fourth panelist is rakesh mandrekar rakesh mandrekar is a queer this was in the business of movie publicity design for more than a decade now before he started to play with visual frames he enjoyed studying fine art painting at the jj school of arts where he received various awards and recognitions like the dolly kurseti award and a feature at the bombay art society to name a few his desirous queer sensitivity helped him to add perspective to commerce in art which helped him move swiftly from being a senior art director at marching ants the organization that he currently works with he is actively participated in and witnessed the evolution of movie publicity design from commercially successful queer themed cinema in bollywood which has come a long way from being implicit and illusory to being explicit and provocative this conversation will be moderated by anushka jadhav anushka jadhav is an educator artist and gender activist who does talks and workshops on gender sex and sexuality in educational institutions across the country She develops curriculums and conducts teacher trainings in a bid to help create inclusive classrooms and has worked with a range of stakeholders including teachers, principals, management, parents and students. She does the programming for Zeen Bazaar and helps design, curate and organize Daisy Family's on-ground workshops and talks. She's also the co-founder for No Country for Women, an educational organization aimed at situating gender advocacy 
within education and bridging the gap between activism and academia. I now leave it all over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lakshmi, for that wonderful introduction. I think you've covered um, all there is to say about the introduction to the panel, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Uh, and I'm going to jump right in. Um, so like you said, um, art in all of its various different forms has always been one of the primary ways that um, humanity has asserted itself and expressed itself. Um, and unfortunately, um, a large part of the ways in which we've interpreted this expression over the last couple of centuries, at least in the mainstream, has been very heteronormative. We've assumed a very heteronormative interpretation of this um, art, be it sculpture, paintings, murals, or the written word. Um, and so what I want to do today with all of our wonderful panelists is sort of talk about how we're centering this for the queer experience um, and talk about how our individual work um, is lending itself to this larger narrative. What are we trying to do um, with our individual work? So I'm going to ask each of our panelists to then sort of describe their work um, a little bit and how that relates to their identity and their life experiences. And what is it that each of us are trying to achieve with our work? What space is it that we're trying to carve out? And what impact is it that we're hoping to achieve? So I'm going to begin with Shoykat, perhaps. Could you please um, add <laughs> to this? I think you're still on mute. Shoykat, I think yeah, you're on mute. Oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, hi, hi Sharif. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. I'm so glad I was listening uh, completely wrapped to the last couple of panels. What a wonderful group of people you brought together. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I wanted to start by responding to the question that whether social experience has been heteronormative. The fact is Indian culture, as we've seen now, has actually been very plural, very fluid. There have been, if you look at our uh, our religion, our pantheon, it's really fascinating. I think the change really started with British rule. It's British rule, which really a certain kind of Victorian prudishness, a certain mm -hmm. kind of Protestant prudishness really changed things. And even legal systems like, you know, Section 377 were the creation of British rule. So in a way, you know, when we say we are heteronormative, we are... Um, sort of weirdly being Western and Protestant. And that is where, I mean, I mean, I'm, you asked me to talk about my work and I, I felt, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a teacher and a writer and, I'm, and my main connection to this thing is my, is my novel, The Scent of God, which um, has been, you know, discussed quite widely in this, um, in this circle. And what notices me is that I'm delighted that the queer community has celebrated this book, criticized it in every way. But when it comes to the mainstream community, it has constantly been kind of put in a kind of a pigeonhole that, oh, it's a queer book. And as a writer, my dream is, this is, a, this is a love story. This is a love story, a love story between two teenage boys who are in a boarding school um, and they are in love. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a, a scary, forbidding atmosphere because it's run by Hindu monastic order where, you know, where celibacy is central. They have to be celibate. And these are boys who are trying to find their sexuality. You know, this is like the arrival of puberty when we suddenly become sexually aware before we know about gender. We welcome a human touch. It doesn't matter if it's a boy and a girl. Of course, in the course of the novel, they figure out who they are. And that is part of and how that plays up against Hinduism's Plurality is a part of the book, but what I what I feel disappointed is when um, you know I, what I'm waiting for is the day where just you know a romance is a romance. Why does it have to be sort of put in a box? I think it's very important that queer people and queer traditions you know we we celebrate it because the, these stories have been marginalized. But it's the duty of mainstream society to kind of I mean do we talk? It's a bit like saying oh that was an interracial love story. You know we we don't need to have these labels anymore. I mean I, I just to give an anecdote I was at a Gurgaon uh, bookstore a bookstore I really uh, respect and the bookstore owner who's a who really you know, likes my books and has enjoyed my previous books as well and says that, oh, you know, I've been trying a lot of book clubs to adopt your book. But, you know, this is a suburban a kind of a conservative society. And whenever they pick up the blurb, uh, they kind of pull back, you know, can you rewrite it? So it's like we, we are asked to, when we tell a queer story, we are asked to reprogram ourselves. We are asked to adapt 
our stories to the taste of a heteronormative society. And that I think is disappointing because, um, you know, what I, I mean, even, even if you look at the, the way the book, the cover was made, I mean, the cover, uh, which I think attracted a lot of attention, you know, I mean, is it, what is especially queer about it? You know, it is some, somebody who is in the throes of passion. And what I liked, what the designer did with it is that he was able to bring a sense of the divine, a sense of the religion. This is, this is what drew me about the title. The scent is a very physical thing, a very sensory thing, but God is abstract. How do something as abstract as religion become a sensory and physical thing? What does it mean when you're sitting in prayer and your mind is floating in a hymn or sort of in the smell of flowers and your knees are touching another boy? You know, how does sexual awareness arrive in this, in this atmosphere charged with religion? The religious and the sexual are not as far apart as we think. Obviously, we have our great Hindu classical texts for that. And I think that atmosphere, I mean, I went to a boarding school very similar to this. And I remember this unforgettably charged atmosphere where, you know, this kind of saffron brotherhood. But at the same time, there's a deep homoerotic connection. You know, a young monk playing soccer, that kind of naked arms coming out, the power. And, you know, and this is, this is a very natural part. This, is, this doesn't have to be fabricated. But at the same time, I think what I wanted to tell was that I wanted to tell the story of this unforgettable atmosphere. I want to tell the story of these two boys. It's a coming of age story and how they figure out. And I'm really happy, you know, obviously it came out after the historic decriminalization of homosexuality. And there have been a lot of discussion of the literature that has come out of it. And I think, you know, queer society is absolutely in the right to talk, criticize, celebrate these books. But I think a huge responsibility falls on mainstream society, the so-called heteronormative society, to really look at queer art, not merely as queer art, to look at it as, as human art. So that I think I will I'll open my comments with that and let that just take over from there. No, absolutely, I agree with you. As I, that was actually what I meant when I said that um, our interpretations have been heteronormative. So I'm not saying that We've had art that was heteronormative over the ages, but that today specifically, given um, the kinds of regimes that we're under, uh, the interpretation of art that exists is forcibly heteronormative. And then what does that mean for us as creators when we want to assert that, no, well, our art is queer um, and we won't let another interpretation be possible? That's, I think, what I was getting at. But yes, please, Sharif, can you add to this discussion now? Yeah. Uh, so, um, so I've had a book out, which you obviously know, it was called Straight to Normal, uh, My Life as a Gay Man. And uh, unlike Shaikat's, it's my story. Shaikat, uh, uh, well, we're, we're great friends now. And uh, so, uh, so I think, uh, to me, I, I don't want to really talk about my book at this point, because I think when I'm looking at the whole space of art, etc., uh, my journey really in terms of expression other than writing about uh, queer issues uh, and about my life or what was happening around us way back in 2004 when Pushkin Chandra was murdered across very close to my home or uh, to many other incidences that have taken place from time to time. To me, it was a form, you know, uh, to express oneself. But music was also something that I, I, I turned to because I think I grew up in a time where, where lyrics mattered, where people listened to music, where people absorbed what was being composed and, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and gave that a certain seriousness, you know, whether it was the influence of a Bob Dylan or a, or a John Lennon or a Roger Waters or a Joan Baez or whoever. There were just so many. And we didn't even realize that even great country singer-songwriters were like John Denver, who was a closeted gay man. And uh, so for me, that was one form of expression to talk about, uh, you know, queerness, it says, with, with, with our first song in my band called Head, Friends of Linga, it was Head Held High. And we invoked the go in the first verse, uh, you know, where the mind is without fear. So it, where, that's where we, and we talk about the mind being in fear and being conditioned, uh, you know, with the stares, with the glares and, the, and, and all of that, which creates that fear. 
and that song did do well uh, i think primarily because there wasn't much else out there at that point in 2013 end and soon after the supreme court order uh, and then obviously i i think these these all of these factors and the you know writing and as psycho chodas books i have mine was just so uh, uh, this book uh, i just realized through the rainbow lit fest which we were talking about just the other night and uh, anushka then uh, that i uh, wanted to i didn't intentionally do it but i think we broke away from the idea of a literature festival being limited to a book to published work you know uh, i think it was more about uh, expression uh, through art you know whether there was drag uh, whether there were you know artists who put up paintings uh, that that brought their sense of expression and it wasn't also their sense of expression necessarily on queerness but just what they could create as well you know uh, so we had also poetry obviously we had slam we had music uh, we had mushairas we had a whole host of things which addressed the issue of gender erotica uh, lives that we lead live you know lived experiences our politics as you were talking about it you know certain politics that exist in today which dominate so many things we talked about mythology and history uh, which shaikat was i think referring to earlier so we did a whole kind of a broad you know brush kind of thing across a whole spectrum of uh, for the simple reason and i think uh what nandita das and devdat put it across beautifully because there is something about expression whether it is written in a book whether it's a poem whether it's art whether it's any other form is it has a way to touch the soul it has a way to touch the heart and that's a nice quiet way and gentle way to get into the psyche of people and i think that's what we tried to do there and that's what we are think discussing so it's not really limited to to a straight to normal or to uh you know only those those books which all matter which all matter because uh, it gets into the mainstream uh it it really kind of uh you know puts things out there and i think another point that we made uh, at the lit fest is that not everything has to be written not everything can be published not everything gets published you know because even publishing is not as inclusive as it should be or could be <laughs> uh but it's also the fact that we can read the writing on the wall and we can talk about it so that's yeah absolutely I agree. uh thank you for that uh priya can you chime in please <laughs> and so you have to repeat the question for me i'm totally lost <laughs> <laughs> thanks so, for that i wait i i, no, I, I mean, waited until the third person uh no but i just wanted to tell me a little bit about your work and where that comes from and what is it that you're trying to achieve with it what is the expected impact what space is it that you're trying to um, carve out with your work and what is it that you're trying to change about the space of narrative with your work um so i primarily work around illustrations uh, comics uh, graphic narratives um uh, to i mean i won't get into details of what i have done this i'm still the starting out but the space that i do hope to create is uh making a uh, relatable content i mean i think growing up there was always very heteronormative um media and content stories in every space right? not just like bo- say bollywood for example but even just children's stories or anything that you read you see like coding your advertisements uh, all of it is always very like man woman kind of yeah um visuals that you see so for me i think that's what i've been trying to do with my work with gc and otherwise um <laughs> just trying to put like really gay content out there everywhere as much as possible um uh, also i mean to but to talk about it on a more serious note it's also representation right i mean um we so much of we consume so much visual media that i mean it's important to see us as represented in different forms so it's not just i mean yes stories are one point but then also like to look at it from a uh, illustrator's point of view is to also make sure that um, your the bodies that you draw are inclusive are um, i mean they show the real spectrum and not just like the ideal type that is always um 
sort of shed in the mainstream then also just color and uh, like um, i mean i think shaikat also said different kinds of love and uh, different kinds of narrative as well because there's such diversity of experiences there's no one a uh, linear way of looking at it so i think like with my comics and in general with gc also that's what i've been trying to do uh, just making sure that there's we bring in different narratives and different perspectives to um yeah so the yeah let's i think it visibility uh, diversity and visibility of diversity yeah. i think is partly what you've been talking about yeah absolutely um rakesh could you please also add to that yeah yeah firstly thanks a lot for having me here uh and i feel like such a nice introduction of me is already given uh so yeah so i work as a senior art director uh, for movie publicity design firm for marching ant uh it's been almost a decade that i'm designing uh, movie campaigns uh, i must have designed more than 60 movie campaigns till now uh like san ki aap thappad mission mangal these are the recent ones which i have designed uh and then i have been uh, very lucky to design movie posters where queer uh, personalities has depicted so beautifully so the kapoor and son and romil and jugal which was the first uh first gay uh, like same sex web series uh, which came out and now while talking about my journey as a junior art director junior designer uh, to a senior art director and my journey from being a very uh, unsure a shy hesitant boy to a confident person i guess both of these things have gone very hand to hand together uh, so uh, again whenever i tell anyone about my profession okay that i design movie posters so uh, so people are like oh ye kaisa professional you know i get like that kind of weird comments and i like for them is like you must be just like taking faces of people uh, of actors and putting it at right it's not more than that and i'm like uh, well it's not that uh, and uh, then but still i i take it like different people and different perspective in that way uh, but for me when movie poster designing comes for me it's it's a art which which is about a conscious decision about how much to show and how much to hide so that you create an interest within the audience and pull the audience to watch a movie and then i realized that kind of hide and seek game i'm kind of playing in my my own life as well so the the friends whom i'm out to i'm a very different person and like i'm a totally different person whenever i'm going to like a family gatherings okay so that time actually i realize whatever i am hiding is nothing but a uh, uh but the hesitation and the guilt or uh, the shame what i have for myself and the things what i'm out about is nothing but the confidence what i have in me so the same part uh like it's not only about the gay people it's it, it relates to every, like a straight uh lesbians gays people of different color people of different shapes like whenever anyone uh expresses their personality people have different opinions their own perspective and uh, judgments about it which kind of makes it like a socio political reality i feel somewhere uh, that so somewhere that creates a doubt in your mind that like you know uh are you what you what are you expressing is it right or wrong but i guess it's very important to stand as an individual and celebrate the pride yeah thank you totally thank you thank you so much for that um i've heard from all the panelists about the lovely um sort of intersections between their own personal experiences thoughts and ideas and between the work that they're putting out and the impact that we're all hoping to achieve i think one of the other things that's imp- really important to talk about now um to tap into the larger conversations that are happening about narratives is ownership of narratives and representation right um who has the right to tell what story uh and how does one tell that story how do you not co-opt somebody else's experiences uh, and exploit 
another individual's life just for your art um and so i just would love it if you could sort of all chime in a little bit about what it is that you think about this entire conversation um what do you think makes for good representation and non exploitative representation um so again if we could begin with choika that would be lovely yeah no that's a great question and that's a very very tricky question I and mean, who gets the right and i think sharif when he um organized the rainbow festival um he put me on a panel which was um, who tells a story an artist or a queer queer artist and i this is my first queer book and i um also do not identify as queer so uh, that question often comes up because it is um assumed that um if it's a queer novel the writer must be queer and i will say what i um said at the festival that um i think when you're talking about um the um the minority representation the minority group must take leadership that's my position there's no question about it there's no question about it they must take leadership they must they have the first right uh to say but i think the rest of society must also listen to what they have to say and follow their leadership they have to follow their leadership uh if you think of civil rights in the us in the 60s obviously the black leaders were there but the but the significant number of white especially jewish people who were committed to civil rights brought a lot of victory even today what is happening with the you know black lives matter you know story you can see that it's very important and um uh, that uh, other people follow their lead and speak up and uh, when it comes to art however things get a bit complicated because um art must be real and art is like a mirror uh, a mirror which is to be held up to life and life has its beautiful moments life has its ugly moments and an artist um does not really have any obligation to leave out the ugly in fact an artist's job is to see the beauty in the ugly you know ugliness can have its own beauty aesthetics is a very wide ranging term and um that's when things get difficult like one criticism uh, um, i know my sharif knows this very well about my novel that was made was that oh why mm, um i think it was chintan who uh, wrote about it in first book that why is love so quiet why is love a little hush hush and i can completely understand that after the abolition of section 377 the mood is that oh we must stand up for it we must assert loudly and i've repeatedly said that in the public sphere i'm as loud a champion of alternative sexualities gender non conformity as much as possible when it comes to art however i think things get a little complicated i mean when you're talk telling the story of two teenage boys who are figuring out their own sexuality and are in an atmosphere where sexuality itself is suspect which is supposed to be a celibate atmosphere there is a certain hide and seek game going on there is a certain indirectness and i felt it called for a soft and lyrical approach which i understand has sometimes from an activist perspective it it has fallen short but i as i said that you know uh, it is very important i mean we've also suffered you know decades of white representation of india oh it's this world of you know snakes and this or whatever or this poverty porn it's only a land of poverty and so it's we have every right to be sensitive to how we are represented so it's very important that we keep these conversations open and it's very important that we take the cues from queer writers we are uh, leaders but i think it's very important that the rest of society also wakes up and joins the struggle that's when we can make these non normative desires no longer non normative but something models to be emulated right absolutely thank you for that um i do realize that there is a lot of i i feel like one of the things that we've all been also talking about is whether experiences can be um boxed in and whether it is even possible to say that unless it is your own experience you can't talk about it because is that viable is that possible and then does that then add another layer of uh, policing does that mean that then certain narratives will never get out because access isn't 
universal uh, and so what does one do and i feel like that adds an interesting dimension to the conversation so thank you for that shrikat yes um, if i can just add on to that just a moment i mean sexuality yes. i think is actually the most fluid of identities you know of course one can say the same about class and caste and everything even there are fluid markers there but i think compared to certain traditions sexuality is not even a given thing you know what, what the lifestyle one leads the decisions one make are not a marker one can even identify oneself as certain things a certain sexuality based on certain divisions but you got that identity never exhausts yourself there's always something of you that is spilled beyond that and i think an artist's job is always to come sort of get that lost part that excess that cannot be contained within things like passports and certificates and legal documents Okay, thank you for that. Um, Shari, can we hear from you? Yeah, I, I, I completely get where you know Shaikat is coming from on this, and, and I think it's, 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 uh, you know, during this panel discussion, it was amongst the first of the panel discussions on day one of the Lit Fest actually, uh, and uh, there were people like Gazal, who actually believed that, uh, you cannot, box. you know things in that way because it really comes down to how well researched uh, anything is you know particularly when it comes to the written work and uh, and that's where actually the 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 uh, you know where the difference stands so now we do know for example a book that was on transgenders uh, in the community and you know the controversy that happened out there where not only was there problem with the content Uh, there were also other issues related to privacy and whatever else but having talking about privacy they also had that in the case of a very well known gay author where the book was withdrawn as well and the case of the trans gender book that was not withdrawn you know invisible men we don't have to hide it it's all there on uh everything that's when these problems arise in terms of authenticity you know but it doesn't mean like me being a gay person i cannot write about the heterosexual world obviously where i'm also coming from is i'm completely surrounded by uh, a large you know heterosexual world so i can claim to at least write that because i've been part of the mainstream as well from where i come from so i think it's it's a it's a it's it's the onus also on the artist uh, whether they're a uh, songwriter or poet uh, someone who's writing fiction non fiction any of those things i think the uh, you know because we don't raise this question when it comes to a photographer for example who does a series let's say in black and white and we all go in awe and we look at the shadows and and all of that and they manage to capture uh, so many things in a beautiful manner right and that that moment we tend not to generally at least i haven't seen too many controversies or controversies over that uh because the lens is for some reason looked at differently when it comes to them but i i i so i'll go back to the point is the onus is really on the quality of content the quality of research and i've had discussions with apurva and all of them and see i think when we look at some of these things there has to be some kind of co creation if we look at an aligarh for example the scripting and the involvement of a gay person in that i would believe has lent to the quality of the interpretation of a story no doubt the directors played a fabulous role or the producer or the actors for example they've all played a really great role in making that what it is the same with made in heaven there are a few flaws and we can argue them out but if you just look at the overall uh i think again it is a form of co-creation so i think somewhere uh, when someone is working uh, you know i'm i'm sure that even chaikat wrote this book it, he is anyway talked about his own lived experience right he's been in in a space like that so he can look at it from that time it will have his gaze just like you know i mean it will have its gaze no doubt about it but we have to balance out as to how much of his heteronormal or heterosexual outlook is interpret you know influencing the overall uh text that is out there and so i think some way we have to learn how to negotiate we can't also box people immediately just because uh you know they heterosexual because the story of a 
of a mother of a gay man or a lesbian woman would be very different from the gay man or the lesbian woman yeah. now do we just remove that completely you know it's we, we've been reduce engagement discussion and the possibility of some solution yeah absolutely i think you brought up this really interesting question of lens and veils which is sure. the the perspective from which one right yeah. approaches a certain area and a certain narrative which i think is very essential just, i feel like as long i'll as just add one thing on which was that in this as shaikh had said earlier we need to lead the space still you see if we give it up completely and we all sit back and say oh we don't have space we don't just it's like coming out it's like standing up for our right if we don't do that then the space is gone then there'll only be one lens dominating yeah. that i think is is so we need to invoke the plurality we need to invoke the democracy whatever is left of it <laughs> yes i absolutely agree just the fact that like yeah, like the yeah. both of you said um it is important to identify a lens and then to also articulate it because then you know where yeah. you're coming from and you're not yeah. then co-opting another person's experience because you're saying this is my lens this is my perspective this is the position the social political position that i'm coming from and then these are the limits to my uh, position and therefore this is my limited perspective and that being said yeah. supplementing that with adequate research with an actual understanding of the world that you're trying to build um yeah. and the fact that consent is taken into account that privacy is taken into account of the individuals Absolutely. that you're speaking Absolutely. of um yeah. is one of the ways in which we can sort of mitigate this problem and speaking of i mean you mentioned photographers and i just want to quickly add i wish we spoke more about photographers and consent because the amount Absolutely. of work i've seen um sort of branded me um uh, and the amount of violation i have seen that happen um in that name is just horrifying so i wish we did speak more of consent to when we are can we have you chime in now please um i think so i, I like i think sharif and shaikat have made most of the points that i had to but um i think what happens is that when you are not talking from a place of lived experience or if you don't identify with uh that group of people uh, or don't have any first hand uh, interactions that you end up talking from a space of assumption uh and uh, second hand knowledge that you would have probably come across through xyz people or just like read uh, like online content so then there is that room for um things to go here and there uh, so i think that is one thing that definitely needs to be kept in check and also other thing that uh, sharif i think mentioned about co-creation right i mean there there's always room for collaboration and i think more than ever today there people are a lot more open to collaborating and sort of working as a team uh, or uh, you know so i think when so if you have the platform i mean i understand that some people have the space to talk about certain narratives and in general have them heard and then some don't so i think to the way to bridge that gap is that um meeting people halfway in that sense extending your space uh and um instead of just completely talking from a space of um okay this is i mean from an imaginary space sort of co-creating like you said and yeah i think that's that's primarily my point <laughs> thank you dash i love uh, i love the point about co-collaboration co-creation because i think that's very very essential especially at the end of the day like i mean obviously you come with a certain set of experiences and learnings and the other person has their lived experiences so there is always room for a more powerful narrative to be born and you can then bring your skill sets and their skill sets together um so yeah i think that can all thing i think it's a better form of procreation <laughs> i agree i agree it's especially important when we're talking about um, all of the spaces where so many power structures are involved right if we're talking about oppressors and oppressed if we're talking about mainstream and non mainstream and when there are individuals that have been consciously involved in the repression of other individuals i think one of the ways to bridge that one of the ways to reach a slightly more equal space is to um pick up interactions that are not governed by that power imbalance right and for collaboration is one of the great ways in which we can do that possibly
Is Rakesh, can you also please add to this conversation? Yeah, yeah. I felt almost all the points are already covered. Uh, but still, uh, I would like to talk about uh, like how, because I work in Bollywood, which is like a mainstream industry. Uh, like the, I feel that we have come long way till now. Like there was a moment where queer characters use like a comic timing in the movie just to laugh on. And yeah. now we have movies like Kapoor and Sons, which where the character is so real life and breaks all this uh, stereotype. Uh, it's the, it is the character who is so well doing and everything. And I feel uh, the same shift, it has come in a movie poster designing also. So I still remember the time when I was designing uh, Romil and Jugal posters. I had like an entire script to read. Uh, I read the script and then I came up with uh, a, a print campaign, how it should be. So I was discussing it with along with my coworkers. So I said that we should just pitch it like a, any other uh, romantic movie, like a romantic show. And then these people, they just kept on looking at my face and I'm like, okay, did I say anything wrong? And they're like, uh, no, I guess uh, we should, you know, pitch it something like uh, a relationship between two friends or maybe a romance or something. I was like, what? No, so like, it just put me off all of together. And I was like, no, 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 this is a romantic story. We have to uh, pitch it like a romantic, romantic uh, show. And uh, no matter though it is between two boys or maybe a girl or boy, but still to do a justice with the content, we have to show the way it is. And then I realized I'm not only taking a stand of the, of the art project, but I'm kind of a taking stand for myself also there in subconsciously. Uh, and then uh, I, made, I came up with one poster, which is like a marine drive where all couples are in their uh, like a very lovey-dovey, cozy romance under an umbrella. And these two boys, they're like, they're all out there uh, sitting and no hiding, nothing shame. Uh, so that's the poster which came out. And there was one more poster where it was like an intimate scene between both of them. So these both posters came out. I was so happy about it. And so the time when these posters came out, uh, I was traveling to to Kochi Mazuris Banale Art Festival uh, to Kochi. And from Kochi, I went to Munnar just for a break from art. And on my journey from Kochi to Munnar, to the small villages of Munnar, I could see posters of Roman and Jugal. And I felt so good, you don't have any idea. Like I really felt that I'm opening up a conversation in common people about a queer life, you know? And I feel like that was like a very small, like because the kind of work what I do is like very few times I get that opportunity to do something for the queer, queer, uh, work, queer work. But then uh, I felt somewhere on a very small part, I, I contributed to the community. And uh, I'm really looking forward to do more uh, projects where I could do posters, book covers and all of that on the queer life. Yeah. I love, I love the anecdote you brought up because I think that really sort of grants new meaning to the phrase we keep hearing about that the personal is the political and that really is um, a great sort of addition to that phrase. Um, and yes, just the importance of representation, what that means for each of us. Um, thank you so much. Thank you all of you for adding to this wonderful conversation. There is so much more we could talk about, but we're, we've overshot by a large margin. So I'm going to let uh, Lakshmi take over again. But thank you so much. It's been thank a lovely you so day. much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you Happy, so Pride. Much. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. Bye bye. bye. This is such a brilliant and wholesome conversation. Thank you, all of you. It means a lot. I mean, I'm not even kidding you when I say that we lost track of time. And we just hope we get to have more of these conversations in physical spaces after all of this is over and enjoy more art from you. And thank you to Gezi family for partnering with us and helping us bring this panel to life. And we'll quickly move to the next one. So, as a queer individual, very often most of us look at our identity through the constant negotiation with our not so private roles that we are expected to play. How do we then take our personal stories in places 
that often do not understand why not having inclusive practices and spaces affect the whole community. How then can we truly take our pride to work and make sure that we are not only heard or seen, but also our views and voices are sustained? Our next panel of the day looks at the idea of work through the lens of queerness and inclusion. For maintaining pride and pride at work, our panelists are Amit Kegre. As a national strategy head, Amit oversees the planning function of DDB Mudra Group's biggest clients, including PepsiCo, Aditya Bella Group, McDonald's, Johnson & Johnson, TTK Prestige, amongst others. In furthering the company's vision of creating a strong creative culture, Amit also leads Omnicom's Open Pride India chapter. Open Pride leads a company-wide efforts for LGBTQ plus community and its allies by promoting awareness, acceptance, and advocacy by creating opportunities for leadership, visibility, community involvement, networking, and business. A second panelist is Vishaka al Dutta, who is a senior HR professional and leads inclusion and diversity for India Publicist Sapient. She has been associated with strategic HR efforts, culture and diversity and inclusion for over 14 years. She's passionate about building community support groups and manages large networks focused on support for women, mothers, and single parents. He's a strong ally for LGBT plus support movement in India and supports advocacy for the community at workplaces. Sridhar Balan is a chief business officer and at, uh, at Tonic Worldwide and our next panelist. He also oversees inclusion and diversity at the company. Part of the founding team, he spearheads projects pertaining to new media and below the line communication and has a diversified working experience with global brands. He also assists optimum solutions for achieving brand visibility in digital media spaces. This session will be moderated by Prafal Baveja, lead of innovation at the event studio. Prafal is a marketing innovator, technologist, diversity and inclusion evangelist, event conceptualizer, and academic. With two decades of marketing communications across events, PR, digital and television domains, he offers 360 degree marketing consultancy, business growth hacking, augmented virtual and mixed reality content creation, apart from experiential curation and networking through the Vivid Diversity Fair. Over to you, Prakul. Hey, thanks, Lakshmi. This was a brilliant, brilliant introduction. You've been doing a great job. And uh, thank you, Social Samosa and uh, the whole team. It is such a awesome session. It doesn't feel like virtually sitting at our places, doing our thing. And uh, the work is on, and pride is on, and both of them are on. So uh, I'll first like to welcome everybody. It's it's not easy to be, uh, you know, reviving all the work routines as uh, we're on lockdown and celebrating pride and, uh, you know, sharing. Uh, so first, uh, Vishakha. Uh, all the great work that you do, I know of, uh, because closely I've seen uh, the Interpride group that uh, Vishaka also worked with, which is working with Pride apart from Publicis Sapien, uh, which is great. Uh, I would like to open directly with a question and uh, for Amit and for uh, Sudesh as well, along with Vishaka, whoever wants to lead can. Uh, so workplace pride, uh, I'm wearing mine. I have always done that. I've always had what you see is what you get kind of a stance. Uh, as far as y'all are concerned, uh, since since not everybody is uh, from the community um, and still y'all lead these functions, how does that come about? Uh, what role does sexual orientation, gender equality, uh, play in the inclusive policies of your business and how, how does that part come about? Uh, so if you could go ahead first, Vishaka. Okay, um, how did that come about? I think, uh, so, so I think there were always two sides of uh, people at work, right? Uh, possibly a lot of us didn't even realize that workplace policies were not inclusive. Uh, you know, many, many years back when the inclusion and diversity works would have started. This is maybe 12 years, 13 years back when I had started. We were only talking about women, uh, maternity breaks, uh, you know, how they are going to be, you know, how we are losing them in the global leaky pipeline, the LGBTQ uh, part of the story was not even understood, right? 
uh, and hence uh, some of it got understood i think then the voices got louder and the voices inside the organizations got louder and everybody just woke, woke up to say that okay now this is something that we need to deal with um of course you know there are i think at that point of time there were two reactions one we don't understand it what is the need to talk about it a uh, third probably is like okay you know how many people are there that that we have to uh, really do something very big because any change if you have a resistance to change these are all the things that you will keep asking yourself right um i mean i've been in a uh, in a in an organization where for three months uh, we were talking about okay what do we do about certain policy changes benefits and at the and this is only in the hr group and at the end of three uh, months when we were supposed to finalize some things i was got, i got asked this question is this a leadership priority at this point of time so there there have been these there have been these experiences but there were also i think more people at least you know and like me like i was like okay why do, why should any policy be you know exclusive at all it's meant for everybody right um and you know obviously once you start knowing people i i had the privilege that i think people from the community accepted me like me and my son we were actually part of their chosen family they became part of my chosen family and uh, you know once you know them there is no lack of inspiration to say that we have to do much more than what we are doing i i think uh, corporations haven't done enough like you know I, i we can talk about what we have done i think i represent a, a you know a group that hasn't done enough and there is just so much more to do um people like us actually keep thinking what is it that we can do more and and i think that is where it will you know these are all the things that probably has brought what we have today and there has to be so much more thank you i will go to amit before going to sudesh uh because from b2b and very organizational hr very uh, you know engine that runs the business kind of a perspective that vishaka has the uh, going to amit and because it's also a narrative that is you know a public facing the brands that you all handle the kind of work that reaches out uh, the voice is that much more amplified so amit why don't you tell us what sure. the perspective there sure thanks thanks praful and nice to meet all of you I think I I just want to sort of you know extend what uh, what Vishaka has also said alongside a note to uh, uh, one part of your question, Prapul. That uh, uh, how does it work when somebody is not part of the community, and uh, why is it important? I think that uh, that question I think it's a it's a it's a it's a non question in my mind because diversity. uh is not something at least the way i have looked at it and this is the way we look at it in our organization uh you don't have to be a woman to uh, to root for women you don't have to be queer to 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 sort of you know feel uh, queer, queer people's needs and 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 the res- and and the respect that we need to give them so i think that 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 discussion needs to be sort of you know at some point uh, we all need to recognize that it's not just the queer community but it's everybody together who's sort of you know fighting for this voice uh, whether you're queer or not doesn't matter i mean there are people who identify themselves as queer me for example there are people who uh, don't ident- identify themselves as queer and it's absolutely fine uh, to answer your second question um, in terms of uh, you know an organization that's consumer facing uh and perhaps um you know kind of uh, uh, does work that a lot of people uh, watch and see um uh in terms of content that we take out uh does it behave any differently from any other organization i i suspect not because at the end of the day organization culture is organizational culture right and i think workplace pride uh what it needs to at least the way we've approached it is that right from all aspects of diversity whether it's uh, diversity for from a gender perspective race perspective sexual sexual orientation or religion or any other aspect of diversity it's it's about how committed you are as an organization and how much you're able to really walk the talk um and and i believe that you know there are different kinds of organizations that are there in india right now there there are some who are who, who are quite nascent on this journey and are starting to you know realize and recognize the importance of it and there's some which have moved quite a lot forward yet i won't say that the journey is 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 done yet i think there's a very long way to go all i can talk about is sort of you know from the point of view of what we've done uh, at the ddb mudra group uh, from the point of view of workplace pride i think right from um, we started uh, 
open tribe which is which is uh, the uh, ERG specifically for LGBTIQ plus community way before uh, section 377 was actually struck down way before it was abolished when it was kind of you know at least in the corporate uh, corridors you would hear oh is this safe or is this legal or is this sort of you know all right to start something like this in an organization because isn't homosexuality illegal and you had to sort of you know cross those barriers before starting an ERG like like this um uh, that said we did start it and over the course of the last two odd years i think we've done not just uh, you know the talk part of it which is really holding panel discussions creating awareness programs within the within the organization we are an organization of 800 plus people uh, uh, creating awareness programs tying up with uh, ngos and ceo cso's to sort of you know have them come over to the office we've launched the program with 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 uh, prominent people from the community whether it was radhika piramal who gave and uh, came and gave a really 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 inspiring you know talk to the entire office then from there to keshav suri who also came very recently for the inauguration of one of the uh, one of one of the programs that we actually launched which was part of our action and not just talk uh, in terms of how we we are diverse and committed to the cause more specifically in terms of you know what are the actions that you can create like i said talk about create awareness program create gen gender sensitization sensitization workshops i think that's the most critical thing uh, the entire world including most people in the organizations are still operating on the on on the heteronormative gender binary sort of you know framework and that just first bit is to just start talking and conversing about you know what are the various possibilities and what are the various uh, yeah possibilities that that lie on the entire gender spectrum uh, from those to, uh, you know, kind of having people, uh, family support systems, putting together, uh, you know, uh, counseling help uh, to really recently what we've done um, at the DDP Mudra group with that we've actually launched what I, I would think is the world's first uh, um, uh, internship program, which is specifically designed for the transgender community and it's called DDP Transit. We launched it uh, four months ago, along with side with the with the Hamsapar Trust, and it's a it's it's an internship program that really welcomes people from the trans transgender community into this in, into the organization. And I think that's one of the first steps that we've taken, not just from a passive celebration of the cause where we say that all right, we're going to make those policy changes and we're going to say that we don't discriminate. That's one step, but the next step is actually to actively seek people from the community. To, to go out and make those measures that this is what I'm going to do to make your goals measurable that by this year, by this time, I'm going to have so many people from the community be a part of my workplace. By this this year, I'm going to make so many people from, from the community be a part of my senior management. I think those are the kind of, you know, measurable goals that organizations need to have and not just celebration of culture, which, which kind of, um, which is important, but I think the, the journey needs to move beyond that. Okay. So, uh, thankfully, I have the honor of uh, initiating Mumbai's first uh, diversity job fair and as part of uh, Six Degrees and Vivid. Yeah. So uh, what we need is to look at a whole lot of other organizations and what they are doing. And, yeah. and uh, uh, there are at least 200 to 300 uh, diversity and inclusion professionals doing a whole lot of great work, sharing knowledge day in and day out. Uh, thankfully, a whole lot of us keep in close contact and exchange notes literally almost every day. And uh, that keeps us, uh, uh, you know, having reality check on where we stand in overall scheme of things, how we can affect uh, change, how we can collaborate and launch new programs where the success has been there or not been there. Plus, uh, uh, you know, across the class and caste spectrum yeah. uh, with the representation, uh, because somebody who's a ground worker, and uh, uh, worked for three months for Mumbai Pride, uh, and and we, you know, giving them a platform to talk their heart out yeah. and how six condoms and and two uh, lubricants are the actual things to get thirty permissions sure. plus from Mumbai Police across uh, you know uh, three months. Learnings like that would might not come from CEOs and CXOs. So uh, those are needed. I will ask Sudesh to sh uh, share how the new age media, the digital uh, marketing and the digital uh, world and language there and, you know, so-called 
millennials uh, how do they take it how does your organization uh, you know look at it and what are you all doing are your voices on mute uh, suresh uh, we can't hear you uh, yeah. yeah this usually happens uh, just saying that <laughs> so uh, thank you praful and uh, uh, thank you lakshmi for the, the nice introduction uh so uh I'll just add on to what amit was uh, saying right now you know you you don't necessarily uh, need to uh, be that or uh, be part of the community to you know support the community right so uh you know i completely agree with that but that being said right so uh, I'll, i'll talk about our example itself our, our scenario itself where we were not uh, you know though we were comfortable with everything we we We, uh, we, you know we right from the start part of a core team uh, included uh, people with uh, different sexual pre- preferences yeah and it's an agency right it's it's just part of it's it's very normal for us right so i was and our logic was if people are not comfortable that's their problem if anyone who's coming in is not comfortable is is phobic about it that's his problem i don't think so we should care about it and he can't uh, be in this organization it's very recently that uh, someone someone joined us around a year and a half back he's still with us he's he's part of your community is an influencer in your community and i was very surprised when uh, before joining in he said uh, you know uh, this is my sexual preference uh, i want to be clear about that I hope there won't be any problem in this organization with that and i think seriously like what age we are in why why would there be a problem saying no previous organization that worked there has been a problem that's why i had to move out and that's when it it you know this realization struck that maybe we need to take this more seriously and not just being accepting about it but we need to uh, you know kind of educate and make people aware within our teams also right that's why this whole process started and thanks to his name is bala and thanks to bala that we started this whole process and that's the reason why i'm here today in this talk because uh, as just amit was saying our efforts need to be more where we need to go out there and we need to uh, make the community realize that there are organizations which will uh, want people like you in right not because of uh, you know your sexual preferences or anything of that sort but there is talent there is ability and that shouldn't be a reason to decide or not decide uh, anything so uh, that's what it is but thankfully uh, you know the the kind of field that we're in uh, as i told you it's a digital marketing agency with young people and uh, to be honest they all are uh, it's it's not very difficult for us to bring about this culture because they themselves are very vocal about this even though they are not maybe uh, you know they don't have different sexual preferences maybe gender wise everything is fine but they are they very supportive about this and they want to take this forward so i wouldn't like to give myself or uh, the leadership of our organization the credit i would like to give credit to the whole uh, set of people we are around 120 people i like to give credit to all of them to bring uh, to build a culture like we have right now which is inclusive i just like to add you know uh, most organization and this is the case with india itself you know we take pride in the aspect of you know when we say we are diverse the diversity is like wow you know there's diversity and it's it's a great nation and all that but when it comes to inclusivity there is still a problem we know in in every every aspect right not not just this that's where i think all of us need to work towards we want the diversity but about the inclusivity but how much efforts we are putting in and that's what uh, our motive has been at least since last couple of years uh we are doing our best to get there and uh, you know uh, make people feel comfortable to be come and be part of our team thank you so this so uh, yeah. what what happens is generally uh, yeah. i i normally introduce a conversation here okay. with uh, right. naturally flowing into the direction that we wanted to yeah. take which is yeah. uh, something of going from diversity to inclusion to belonging uh, diversity yeah. is when there is enough representation yes yeah. yeah. is when there is space on the table and there is absolutely. a certain uh, absolutely conversational zone and yeah. uh, uh, when the person is heard out but if you listen yeah. to uh, uh, yeah. uh, the stakeholder no matter what their gender no matter what their class no exactly. matter what their caste that is where exactly. belonging kicks in and uh, so uh, so that is the differentiation uh, differentiating part between most of the organizations of how their commitment right. to right. uh diversity at workplace uh, workplace inclusion is 
I know for sure one of the most uh or say elaborate and most nuanced programs uh is with publicists and again I'm going to ask uh, Vishakha to share that because uh, you know people do not uh, look at a spectrum beyond a certain framework and uh, Vishakha thankfully has been able to uh, uh champion that within the organization and organization is supported so let's at least ask her for that. Yeah, I wouldn't say I championed everything in the organization, okay, by the way. So I am very, very proud of this organization uh, because you would have seen that this is an organization that uh, sponsored the Transcend program for Hamsafar Trust again before 377. I think there's a lot of respect I have for organizations like this and I was not a part of that journey. I joined them more recently last year. Um, um, the second thing is, you know, the equalizer uh, that we have to ensure everybody's on the same platform like I spoke about is the you can hear me right Prabhu? sorry yes sorry so the equalizer is that you sh you need to have framework that accommodates people so when people want to step back etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, you know if you have you know I, a very simple example is if you have work from home there are many organizations which will have work from home as a flexibility but i myself have seen it's to be you know it, you they will give you like this disclaimer you it has to be used in moderation now that's something that's obvious isn't it there are organizations i've worked with which you know you have to send an email on where you are even if you're working from home etc so why question it right if if so so a framework has to be something that's inclusive so in this uh, organizational framework apart from the fact that everything is non discriminatory by gender and sexual orientation um, you know, uh, we, you know, of course, have the live-in partner benefits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this is also an organization that, um, you know, the insurance includes HIV-positive people. It includes HIV treatment for our uh, colleagues, etc. Right? And that, I, you know, to me, it, it was surprising that a lot of organization or most organizations don't have. Um, apart from that, in terms of, uh, you know, we heard a lot of really, really good um, and very meaningful. Uh, initiatives at work, right? And, and this is the story of how most of it has flown in, right? So one of the initiatives that we uh, followed is in our uh, leadership development program, which is for the top talent of the organization, which is for the next generation of top leaders, right? Uh, we, and it's a curated program for a year, a very, very serious, intense program. We included uh, a full day on LGBTQI inter understanding and interaction. So the leaders spend that time, uh, you know, and they did, you know, so we had the speed mentoring. So the, the leaders are doing what they do every day, which is to mentor and coach people. And we got, you know, we partnered with Solidarity and we got people over, uh, uh, you know, from the trans community, right? And then we had a project also, like a project work that they did together. So it was a very close interaction. So the discomfort the optics and everything else that you feel you actually get you know actually not only understand but you kind of feel it through it and then then comes the realization we also sponsor this program called leading with pride it is a program where people from the community and very strong allies can apply for it it's again a very very intense uh, leadership development program for the external folks right now how how does this help this is a pro program that any organization would find that time now this is open to anybody to apply and once they do that uh, they go through these uh, you know like a you have to have some really high time commitment uh, and my org uh, when they hosted it obviously starting from and this is pre covid days right so starting from your campus person facilities person everybody else has to be sensitized because the id card of a trans person doesn't always ma match their uh, you know how they're looking today etc cetera, etc cetera the LND people were involved. So instead of just doing gender sensitization, we were able to actually induct people in actual projects like this, right? Um, this program also has a lot of our leaders who mentor students over six months. So our leaders get the interaction of uh, reverse mentoring, I would say, for sure. Um, and they have a lot more mind share. The students from the uh, you know, program actually get a um, very seasoned corporate mentor. And this is a program which has a 100% uh, NPS score. It is a program that every student has used to do something much larger with their careers or their lives. Uh, so there are things like this. Uh, you know, I, I feel that these are, you know, and, and of course the rest of the uh, sensitization, et cetera, et cetera, that come in. Can I just build on what you said, uh, Ushaka? I think this is, these are some really fantastic programs that, uh, that you're putting together, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, live-in partner, uh, insurance or 
or or the mentorship programs and everything i do believe that though when it comes to you know uh, the hiv cover and insurance i think it's for anybody or it should be viewed as for anybody and everybody because i absolutely i, I do think that when we when we talk about hiv insurance specifically for the queer community i think we are giving in to and it may so be that you know the the the, the queer community is one of the hrgs when it comes to hiv prevention but but i think if we call it out specifically for the queer community i think it gives into a stereotype i think it feeds into uh, you know kind of unnecessary stigma that the community already faces and uh, 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 yeah that's that's the only limited point that i i, no, I and, and and you're right and and maybe this is a good thing that you said because i'll tell you uh, the the network that praful mentioned uh 3 years back when somebody posted something on hiv which was an lgbtq advocacy group i think uh, i mentioned that you know this is not relevant it's ex- yeah. coming from exactly where, where what you mentioned um after that i was actually made aware of how uh, and and you're right i don't think it should be said like this i i will admit that however what has happened is uh, not having this policy has hurt a lot of people and this is a voice you know there is this whole group of people who also from the community plus being hiv positive is like another completely different area of work and i have a lot of empathy uh, for that work because i you know i know people who are really dedicated to that work so i mentioned it in that this thing but i completely agree that this is uh it should not be seen you know just like a live in partner benefit is not for the community right uh you know all our uh, parental uh, insurance so we have insurance for parents and for families yeah. it is not just for the community it it should be for every, the eap counseling you know eap counseling is open for the colleagues and their families but it also specifically helps when because you will see a lot of parents say i don't know how to deal with this right you will see people wanting to talk to a professional so maybe you know, it simple. was really from that spirit uh, plhiv conversation is a whole different conversation obviously yeah. Yeah. it's a larger spectrum again and uh, uh, you know consent there and a whole lot of conversation which is really nuanced a this becomes a subset of it also uh, somewhere being a high risk uh, population you know right from blood donation to so many policies when you do a simple blood camp within a uh, firm you know these complications arise all of these questions arise right there that's when you sit and you say hey all of these things require some intervention or they require some policy framework and more commitment and clarity and and you know uh, mobilizing things within and outside so this comes up uh, yes labels should not be there but knowing each of these intersections and knowing how it affects current day and age and future policies of the firm obviously uh, we are supposed to say what we are supposed to say there so that remains i think we are running really behind uh, on our schedule so i'm going to ask all of you all to give one one single line about what will you tell a person who is new and fresh at workplace who wants to come out and who wants to look for employment and firms that are supportive uh, let's start with amit quickly and let's just go my 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 i mean i already have that one line in the at ddp we have four freedoms that we live by uh, freedom to fail freedom from chaos freedom from fear and most important of all freedoms freedom to be and we create a culture we thrive on creating a culture that just gives you all the freedom to be all that you are uh, without fear um, that and and that would be my line just feel free please feel free to be so uh Suresh. Yeah. So, uh, so one single line I would say is, and I strongly believe uh, in it and believe by it, and I keep on saying this to young people, that you know the world is trying to be different, right? In every way possible, you are different, and that should be your pride, that you are different, and that will get you whatever success that you want in life, that you are different. That's about it. thank you vishaka fan line and we go back to lakshmi <laughs> yeah so i think uh, be proud be brave right be you at the same time there is something else i would add to it i would add to that that if you need help i am there because i think that is required the environment is not completely safe and everything is not really perfect 
and if people need the help to be themselves then i think all of us have to put our force behind it so winding up this whole conversation it's been a great conversation too much of information too little time and i think we've done great uh, yet uh, uh, as a diversity inclusion professional uh, and as i go ahead i look beyond human diversity into biodiversity into cultural diversity and and see how nothing compares or competes with each other in nature nothing compares or competes with each other in art and we have so much to learn from languages and nuances and things and that that's a gift that keeps on giving about uh, drawing parallels from there and enriching our systems each policy each framework i'll leave you with that thought thank you so much thank you for being with us today thank you lakshmi thank you thank lakshmi you. thank you thank you lakshmi thank you professor thank you so much everyone yeah. this was beyond brilliant and all of you gave us so much insight but i really appreciate how there was this one key takeaway that all of us could put top of our minds that really means a lot and thank you for always being there not only for the people in your organization but for everyone who ever seeks out for help thank you so much thank you bye bye thank you thank you yep moving on to our next session we have spoken about art and literature we have spoken about work the idea of work and i feel somewhere in the middle of this all lies a very very essential idea of self expression all of us have our ideas of an ideal self and our real self and very often than not there is a huge difference between them and self care and self expression often helps us bridge that gap what are the tools in which people do it usually is makeup similarly makeup often becomes an important tool not just for creativity but also a tool to explore the possibilities of existing and being this session is for everyone who has struggled to get their eyeliner on fleek or their highlight on point or for anyone who does not understand contouring or breaking and even for the pros in the room just to you know brush up your skills please welcome the makeup guru for our day roshan nasa roshan nasa is a queer makeup artist and a social media content creator from australia melbourne They are uh, they love inspiring generation of South Asian queers and everyone from South Asia to accept, love, and appreciate their culture and their self identity. At just twenty one years old, they have a huge passion for activism towards fighting for women's rights and bringing up conversations about racism and colorism in their community and beyond. Please welcome Roshan. Hello. Hi. How are you? perfect how are you and this is i'm good thank you so much for having me oh i don't know what's happening hello Hello? Yeah, I'm back. <laughs> oh my god, I was like what happened? Yeah. I was like the blank. <laughs> okay, first things first. See, all of us are huge fans of your skills, right? Because they're bad skills and I just wanted to oh, thank you. How you look at makeup and like what's your relationship with it and just how you look at the world through that lens. Well, um I started makeup when I was doing uh theater. So I did a lot of Broadway. I did Mohini Atam when I was 5 and I got my passion for makeup when I did dance. And so from that, I was like, well, I should give it a go. So while I was in high school, I got a, a Oh what was it? It was a scholarship into a makeup course actually while I was in high school. And so I was doing like high school and beauty school all at the same time and it was so much fun and I think for me as a kid like brown kid, the only brown kid in my school at the time and there was a few other people of color there but I was very one of the only ones that was very expressive, outgoing and I just never let it stop me. Like I just wanted to do makeup because it made me feel beautiful, it made me feel pretty and it was a form of, of a way to express myself and you know not really just 
I thought to myself, like, why do I have to hold myself back, you know? And so I would wear makeup and it would be bad makeup. Like it wasn't good makeup. It was like really like cheap, like $2 makeup from Target. And I'm like, oh my God. But it was, it was good. Like, I think just being able to progress and with my beauty course and learn from that, I just, my passion just kept growing. I guess I completely relate to what you said about cheap makeup from Target, right? Because I think all of us had have had that phase in our life where we used to all use those glittery uh, lip glosses and then yeah. we kind of graduate to lipstick and that's a yeah. progression that is supreme in I everyone's know. life. And <laughs> <laughs> I think just to try and understand how, so basically you were the only brown kid in your school. Yeah, and so then, I was... I was- I was the only brown kid at my school and growing up in Australia, you know, it was just, there was just a lot of white kids. And I was just like, oh my God, like as a kid, I didn't really think much about it, but until like, you know, a lot of the topics about my sexuality and my race came up and then I felt like, oh, there's something different about me. And, but at the same time, I just never let it get to me. And as you were saying about Target, Girl, there was no shades of my color, like at all. It was just like the whitest shades. And I'm like, what am I going to do? So like I got the bronzy shade and I like yeah. put it on my face. And yeah, totally. But I've got so I've got a couple of brushes here. So if you guys want to see some makeup yes. or whatever. <laughs> I think most um, of the comments in our comment section right now are talking about your glow, your one earring, your purple outfit. And it's... Oh. Thank yeah. you guys. Thank you. I've got this palette here and it's got a bunch of like different colors. You guys will absolutely love it. So it's got all these shades. So pretty. So I was thinking about maybe doing like purple because I'm wearing purple today. So a tip that I can give though, especially for people who are brown and would make sure that you wear a foundation that is your shade. That is so, so crucial. And I think a lot of the times, you know, especially within the Indian market in India, there isn't a lot of shade options and makeup is, it, it's expensive anywhere, but I noticed when I was in Mumbai, it's exceptionally expensive in India. And I was like, well, you know what? There's nothing wrong with online shopping. There are amazing brands now like Fenty, um, which are cruelty free as well, which is really, really awesome. This brand is by Chi Chi. So they are also cruelty free um, with eyes. Indian people, brown people, we have the best eyes, okay? We, our features, are our eyes, we look beautiful with gajo. We look really beautiful with like a smoky, hazed eye. So I think I'm just going to go with like a simple sort of like a pinky, purple kind of look and talk as, as I go. That sounds great. Um, so you tend to, when you're doing makeup, you tend to want to start off with a lighter shade. So that would be considered your transition shade. So you just want to start from the edges like this and you just want to, and make sure you hold the brush like this. If you hold the brush like this, it's going to give you a heavier application and it's going to make it too heavy. So with makeup, it's easier to add on in it, rather than taking away. And so with a light hand, always hold your brush from a further away distance and then just blindly just apply it in a window wiping motion and just back and forth like this. And this is a blending brush. So you can use this with multi different looks as well. So it's a very universal brush. Um, if you are not very into like brushes or you're not very familiar with brushes, I think the bre best brushes you guys can get is a brush like this, a blending brush, get a flat brush like this. So it's called a flat shader brush. And then I would probably consider, so this is a smaller flat shader brush. So probably like a small, small, smaller flat shader brush and then a tapered pencil brush like this. And so what this is gonna do, it's gonna be able to go underneath the eye, give you more of a very smudged out liner look if you want that. And then with the blending brush, obviously that's gonna give you more of a room to blend out everything all together. So yeah. so makeup oh my god it's everything i love it so much <laughs> i'm just taking so many notes right now i'm not even kidding you really oh my <laughs> god i love it i just i i, I think makeup for me it, it's it, it really helps me express myself and especially for young brown kids i think there is such a stigma around who can wear makeup and who can't wear makeup and i really hate that i think we need to 
look, I would consider Indian culture to be the most effeminate culture in the world. And it really is very, very, um, it's just very diverse. I mean, I'll, if, even if you look at what I'm wearing right now, it is just a simple purple kurta. And then I'm just literally paired it off with a purple dupatta. And it's like, even just a kurta, it's very feminine. And, 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 and it's so crazy how we can wear these dress dresses, like uh, garments. And to the West, it's like, oh, why are you wearing a dress? But it's not a dress. It's just our culture. And, and so we need to like, if we can wear a kurta that's really, really colorful and blingy, why isn't a boy allowed to wear makeup? Why isn't a girl allowed to wear makeup? Everyone is allowed to wear makeup. It's just a form of expression. So, yeah. So um, you often come back to India for a lot of events. I remember meeting you at the Mumbai Pride this year. Yes. And, um, so I just wanted you to understand, like, do you feel like, I mean, I don't know if it's accurate to draw a comparison like that, but is it more liberating to kind of wear makeup and exist socially like back home in India or is it simpler in Australia? What is your experience with that? So I was actually very blown away. So when I was in India and I was in Mumbai, I was actually very blown away with the LGBT community there. I, I was, I didn't know what to expect to be completely honest. And I was like, is the people are going to be out there as, as they are in Melbourne? Are people going to be a little bit more reserved? And honestly, I loved it. And, it, and personally, I didn't see any difference um, with the level of self-expression at Pride. I think it's real. I felt I kind of got emotional because I was like, wow, these kids, these young people are out here doing what they love and they're out here just expressing themselves. And I, being living in Australia, like you don't even have to think twice about what you can wear and, and who you want to be. Everyone just sort of, there's ignorant people everywhere but you sort of just have that agency to just do whatever you want because there's laws to protect you. Whereas in India, there, there are laws, but as you know, they're not enforced. And so people, like my friends, um, they did wear makeup and they were going out on the streets with makeup and everything. And they even said to me, like, I'm a bit scared, even when we were in a very big group. And I really said to them, like, you don't have to feel scared. I think it's just about making sure that you put yourself when you put yourself in a in a vulnerable situation being a boy wearing makeup i think you also have to uh, be aware and they definitely know you guys have know that you have to be aware about backlash and people staring and people judging you and everything but i just loved how confident everyone was they just did their thing they were happy to be who they were and and i never saw that I, and i saw it from youtube but i didn't know how much of an uh, of a, an environment it was um, to just be out there and just express. And I really, really loved it. In Melbourne, it's a little bit, um, it's just all over the place, really. People don't really care. And I, and I understand my privilege of growing up in the West, of not having to worry about being a brown person, wearing makeup or anything, um, and being, you know, t different. But, and I told my friends that it's just, and everybody who's watching, I think it's so important that you don't let your culture and your society and who you grow up around, don't let that stop you. Do not let that stop you because ignorant people are everywhere. And no matter where you are in the world, people are going to have something to say. And I don't care if it's your parents. I don't care if it's a friend. You have to be so happy and so proud of the person you are because you are one in a million. Being born today, you are truly one of a kind. And every and that little sperm that was in your mother's womb, you were that one baby. So be proud of who you are because you were the selected one. So there's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> that is so cool. Like, this is super personal to me, right? Because um, my sister is watching this panel and she's a huge fan of makeup, but she had to spend a lot of time navigating this space. And... One of the things that you said really strike that you also pursued Mohini FM. Yeah. Right? And as like the effeminate culture comment comes also from that place, right? Because as dancers, you're motivated to put on makeup yes. before you go on stage. You're always supposed yes. to wear something as basic as an alka that we say that you wear on your palm or a mehendi or a henna a tattoo that you get to something as major as Kathakali where you spend more time putting on your makeup than actually rehearsing your performance. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's so true. Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> does, it, does it make it easier to then, you know, 
um, approach Indian parents through this, like, through makeup? Like, does it make the conversation easier? How did you experience coming out to them back in Melbourne? Um, so I'm actually really, really privileged because I actually am adopted. So I have white parents and growing up in Australia, I, my mom was always really, really encouraging for me to go and do dance and, 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 and be a part of my culture. And so she actually signed me up for Mohiniyatam when I was five. And, mm. and I'm so, so thankful that she did because I chose to stay doing it for ages because it helped me build my self-confidence. It helped me feel like a part of my own heritage and where I come from being in Australia, being a brown kid, being an immigrant. Um, but definitely being effeminate and being in the brown community within traditional dance, like I guess as you would know, like you, you sort of, are, you kind of get away with it. Like you yeah. kind of get away with wearing makeup because it's like, oh, it's a dance form. They understand it. But it's also, but then it's like the second you're out of that dance environment, it's like a huge no, 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 no. Yeah. You know, you're, you're a boy. You, you, you can't do this. You can't do that. And it's just like the hypocrisy is unbelievable because it's like if you could wear it on stage with hundreds of thousands of people watching you, but you can't wear it on the street, it's, it's just so ridiculous. But, like, I was really lucky because, the, because my, my dance community – uh, Tara Raj Kuma, my, uh, one of my my dance teacher, um, she was so accepting. She was so tolerant of me. She was so accepting. And everybody that I danced with as a child um, really didn't play a mind to it. They just let me be and let me be who I was. And I am still friends with all of them to this day. So I think when, you build, when you're a child, it's a little bit easier to sort of meld your way into who you are with the people that you're surrounding yourself with. But if you're a grown-up and you're a little bit different, I guess it's sort of like it kind of adult adults and kids can be so mean to people who think they're grown up enough to grow out of a phase. And it's like, if I went in there now, I think I'd be getting a different kind of reaction. But back then it was, it was really good for me. Like I, I was just myself the whole way. I'm just loving how your look is also coming together. Like I'm partially like shifting between the conversation and just <laughs> looking at you. <laughs> Like a super basic question, right? So what is your, one part of my question is what is your guide to a beginner with makeup, standing in the middle of Target, thinking what to buy next? Or just for someone who is traditionally not quote unquote allowed to buy makeup. So a lot of times I have a lot of my um, non-female friends, like gender binary friends or, yeah. you know, male friends just come up to me saying, I'm curious about makeup, but I don't know where to begin. How do I go yeah. about it? What is your beginner's guide to folks like us? I think just don't hold back. Just go straight into it because makeup, you have to remember that makeup is an art form. It's it, There is no limits. And like dance, it, there's no limits of what you can do. And I think when, you, when you're starting out in makeup, for me personally, really look look up to and, and, and find other DC brown empowered queer uh LGBTQIA plus youth that are into makeup as well and, and see yourself in the people that you watch. I think there is a lot of huge uh, saturation of like, you know, Americans and Australians and white people doing makeup and, you know, white gays and white queer people, but we don't see enough of Desi representation within the uh, makeup industry or the makeup passion world, passionate world. And for me, I try and look for all those things. And I think that's really helps me feel more empowered because I'm like, oh, that's so sick. Like, that's so awesome that they're so outgoing and they're expressing themselves and they don't let their society hold them back. So when you're starting out with makeup, try and find people that are look that look like you, that come from the same culture as you and get inspired and don't feel afraid to leave them a comment and be like, hey, you're my idol or whatever. And when it comes to buying makeup, just make sure you just, buy, and it doesn't have to be expensive makeup. People think you have to buy really, really expensive makeup. This was only like, $45, right? This eyeshadow palette was only 45 Australian dollars. You can get ones that are $20 and, and they're really amazing. So I think literally just get something that works for you. Start off with the basics, get like a simple brush set and just work with those brushes until they break or whatever. And then when you are ready to move on and get more skills and watch YouTube videos, 
you know exactly what to do. And, and I think just keep learning from everyone, learning from your friends who do makeup and don't feel afraid that is color too, too, too much. Like people are a little bit scared to wear bright colors, but I think just go for it. Like don't hold yourself back. I mean, if you're, if you're okay to wear a, a bright pink t-shirt, wear bright pink eyeshadow. <laughs> so just go straight in for it, I think. <laughs> That's so amazing. So we have quite some time for more audience questions. So if any of you want to ask anything, want to know anything about makeup, so just just ask away and we'll actually those questions. I also want to say thank you so much for having me on this because I'm I'm <laughs> really, really thankful for having this platform to obviously express myself, but also, you know, to be a representation for other brown kids. And we didn't have that growing up. You know, we didn't have that representation growing up as young brown kids feeling like we were worth it. And especially growing up in Australia, all I ever saw was white people. And so I and I so I love this generation where we're getting this platform, we're getting this opportunity to express ourselves. So thank you so much. I'm really grateful, right? Because we're living in times where even you know, women who are traditionally ex like expected to perform certain roles and also have makeup on, like we see, we yes. grew up on a dose of daily show, daily soaps that showed women just getting out of bed with a full face makeup on. And we were always told to be ready and dolled up. But still yeah. wearing bright colors, like say black, like you just mentioned, is still a stigma. And it's still too much to fight on a daily, you know, brown household level. In times like these, exactly. I really, really feel inspired looking at you, looking at a whole community of people who are just out here saying, be what you want to be. And that's really important. So as much as it's our pleasure to host you, it's also so much fun to watch you do this live. Oh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm so thankful. Thank you. That's, and so, you're an inspiration yourself. So thank you oh, so much. Thank you. So we're having some very, very particular questions coming up. One, um, if you had to pick only three things for a look, what would you pick? Um... I love the whole, like, this is very pretty. I love this purple look, but I'm very classic when it comes to makeup, especially eye makeup. I love the traditional Desi Kajal makeup with a bit of smoky eye and the bindi right in the middle. Like, I really, really love that look. Um, I don't know. It, it, uh, I, my favorite look would probably be, like, Rani Mukherjee. She does the most beautiful yes. smoky eyes in her films. And I really love how they're very bronzy and they're just subtle. They're really pretty. And I love the kajal. Like, kajal is probably my favorite. So that's, like, my staple go-to piece. Yeah. And mascara and brows, of course. <laughs> Another question. Um, what are some drugstore products you would suggest? Um, I really like... I like Revlon actually. Revlon have really, really good mascaras. Um, and I know uh, Maybelline has a really good foundation. I don't know, I haven't really seen foundation shades in my complexion, but in terms of um, range of like eyeshadows and their lipsticks, I really like their mascaras as well. So drugstore, so probably Maybelline and Revlon um, are really, really good. And even Rimmel London. I think Rimmel London um, have a really, really great range of uh, different eyeshadows and brow products and things like that. And they're quite affordable. They're not too uh, expensive. Definitely Chi Chi, the eyeshadow palette that I'm using, their brand is awesome. Drugstore, um, really affordable. Their eyeshadows are really, really incredible. As you can see, they're really pigmented. Um, and I also like uh, BH Cosmetics. They're not a drugstore, but they're really, really awesome. They sell all sorts of different products. So you can get on their website and check that out. Yeah. So another question we have um, is what would you say to the people who have a hard time grasping the concept of self-expression? Um, I, I think with self-expression, it's just one of those things where everybody does it differently. And I don't think we need to put ourselves in a box where you have to feel like you got to compete with everybody else. Like, oh, like, okay, I'm gay, but like, I'm not as gay as that person. Or, oh, like, uh, I don't, I'm lesbian and I don't really know, like, am I too butch, you know, or I'm transgender and I don't have the resources and the money to feel fully woman or fully man yet. I think everybody is at their place and you're at the right place right now. I think don't put yourself through, through so much pressure. 
with everybody else because you don't know what everybody else's circumstances are and financially where everyone else is to be able to go through those processes and where they live. So I think if you are coming into yourself and self-expression, do it in the little things. If that's wearing mascara for the first time, I, I get a lot of comments on my Instagram about, wow, you give me confidence to wear a bindi. I mean, who knew? Like wearing a bindi is such a su such a huge thing for some people and I had no idea. Um, in terms of their self-expression. So I think if it's just a simple black bindi, if it's just wearing mascara for the first time, if you're wearing like a junka or something and you haven't worn that before because you're too afraid to express your culture, um, just do it in little steps. And, and through that, you will be able to build more confidence. Don't rush into it. It takes time. That is so cool. I guess we have time for like one last question as you round off your look. So I'm just going to- Yeah, sure. That. I'm living for this look. <laughs> okay, we have one more here. Makeup artists that you really look up to and why? Hmm. I honestly, I've always loved her. So Michelle Fan. So she is an amazing creator. She used to be really, really famous on YouTube when she first created her channel. And she is really incredible because she's nothing like anyone else has ever been on YouTube in terms of makeup and beauty. She really explains it really simply for young people. And she speaks in such a subtle and smooth, calming way. And she's not just putting on makeup, she's explaining why she's putting on the makeup and why that individual product is necessary for the process of the makeup that she's putting on. So she's giving the makeup a reason and the, and the product a purpose. Whereas a lot of makeup YouTubers today, they kind of just talk through it or just do their own thing and put on their makeup and it looks beautiful. But I think especially when you're learning and you're starting out, especially when I did, she was perfect. She did everything so amazingly and she just explained it and she walked you through it in the most simple way and explains why you have to do it in that particular way. And I think that's the best teaching. Yeah. This is brilliant. Uh, we have, okay. Any tip to stop the kajal smudging, especially for oily skin? You need to have a waterproof, uh, non uh, uh, waxy um, uh, based eyeliner. So, so because, because our eyes produce a lot of uh, sweat or produce a lot of oil, you need to have one that doesn't contain a lot of oil or a lot of wax because it ends up melting away. You need something that is really good for uh, uh, matte, uh, dry, uh, oily skin. Um, you can, whether that is a coal liner, whether that is a traditional kajal, um, you can even add an eyeshadow primer. So but if you guys haven't got an eyeshadow primer, I definitely go and recommend buy an eyeshadow primer and then that will prevent it from creasing and also smudging during the day. But because usually Kajal, you want it to be a little bit more smoky, a little bit more sultry, and we want to look sexy every day because that's our goal in life um, with a Kajal. But if you don't want to smudge, definitely try and put on uh, eyeshadow primer and you should be okay. That sounds great. Oh my god! Oh my god! I think I, I think I'm like done. Oh my god! I, this actually happened to so quick. Um, and then I'm just gonna add a little bit of black here. We can take one last question. So if anyone has anything to add to say as we're wrapping up the look, we really look forward to that. Wow, this happened so, so quickly. I love it. This is, a, by the way, this is the quickest I've ever done an eyeshadow. Okay, and I'm done. And I'm going to put a little so bit of cool. highlighter and then that's it. That's it, sisters. I'm done. So people have also asked you, how are you so confident? So I'm guessing that should be the ideal, like last thing, like we end this conversation on, of course, you can always reach out to them. They're really, really accessible online. 
Um, how am I so confident? Yeah. I think it's just, for me, it's just natural. I just, I think for me, I've, I've been this extroverted and this outgoing all my life. And even when I was four years old and five years old, I was just always unapologetic about just expressing who I was. And confidence doesn't come from outside sources. And I think a lot of people think that you got to get confidence from your friends or you got to get confidence from the people you hang out with or where you go, where you're living. Um, it comes from within. You have to believe that you're good enough. And you have to believe that you are valuable and you and what you have to say is important. And the second you realize that you are amazing the way that you are and, and, and you draw positive attention to you, you're going to you're going to bring amazing, positive people to you. And that will just happen organically and naturally. And going back to doing the little things, doing whatever you can to make yourself feel confident and make a list, do a to-do list every day of today, I want to accomplish doing this today, or I want to accomplish doing that today, whether that's putting on a, on a mascara for the first time or putting on gargle for the first time, going and wearing that with pride. Go out there and be like, I look like a boss ass bitch and I'm going to rock today and I'm not going to let anybody stop me. And I think having go, having that attitude and going out there with no, um, no step backs and that perception of people are going to judge you, don't think that way. Just think that you're rocking it and, and, and you're going to draw that amazing attention to you and um, amazing energy to you and you're going to believe it once you feel it. So, yeah. Thank you so much. This was such a brilliant conversation and I cannot wait to try and experiment more with makeup personally and also ask people around me to give it a shot because this looks amazing. Like if you could do this in like such a short amount of time, I cannot Ooh. believe the amount of magic that can come through. <laughs> thank you so much for being a part of the conversation. Thank you, thank honor. you so much. Thank you so much for having me on here and thank you everyone for watching. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to quickly move to the next section um, before we move on to another panel, another discussion. There is a tiny moment that I want all of us to share right now. So back at our team's discussion, we were often talking about how and what pride means to us and what does pride mean to a community. And we realized that our words were definitely falling short to encompass all that we felt. So we did what we could do the best. We reached out to people from the community and the allies and everyone around it to say what they feel about Pride, about Pride Life Fest. And here's a very, very short montage of all emotions packed in one video. Hey there, your Instagram stories are full of you making pancakes, pasta and pani puri, but you may have missed out on one. So today we're gonna make you taste the shades of our rainbow. This is the month that we stand for certain participation, dignity, quality and increased visibility of LGBTQ. Let's celebrate the colorful impact that this community has had on the world. And engage in normalizing conversations in each and every Let's prove it together that to love is to be free. On 6 September 2018, when Supreme Court decriminalized the consensual sexual conduct between adults of same sex, and once you celebrated with us. Today, we want to thank each one of you for coloring yourself in shades of red, orange, yellow, cream, blue, and purple. You went for pride parades, read our queer narratives on Instagram, shared them a thousand times, and oh, when your signboard read, love is a terrible thing to hate, we completely felt it. You have always looked out for us. But today we wish for another opportunity. We wish to look out for you while being true to our identity. We want our goal to connect us. You and I are similar in our differences. But we also want that little girl in Latu who is confused about her gender identity to recognize herself. To dream and to hope that if she has enough strength to stand for herself, then she may not have to marry that boy at 18. We want that 15 year old boy to believe in himself when his classmates call him with different names. We want him to know who this is now and this is. We want him to trust a world where he can have a bright future too. And we want him to know 
that we can dream of in equal worlds where they're accepted as who they want to be. A doctor, scientist, banker, film director, or a CEO, irrespective of their sexual orientation. Nobody will question their choice. Being part of this community does not make you aware of your sexuality. It's only when you educate yourself. We want to inspire in you. We wish to make this world a place where who you are, whom you love, does not have an impact on your basic human rights. A world which is full of diversity. We want to be celebrated as Hereby, we invite opportunities to empower us so that we can empower you. And trust us, it would be a moment of pride to reach out to you. We hope there comes a day when we reach from LGBT to life gets better together really quick. We bring to you a platform, hashtag Pride Life Fest, where we move one step closer to acknowledge, accept and appreciate one another. Share with us that one moment of pride when you have successfully crushed a stereotype. And remember, your sexuality is not who you are. It is part of your identity. Team Pride Life Fest wishes you a very happy Pride Month. 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 Happy Pride Month, everyone! And just it's 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 so fun to also spend this time with all of you, and also so so heartwarming because in that one minute you could think of all of these moments that make up most of our identities today. And I really really appreciate that all of us could be here. We've seen almost a hundred participants join in since the time we started, and so many of you are still glued to your screens across platforms, and we really appreciate that. Quickly moving to our next panel. So when we think of um, drag, or when we think of, let me start with makeup, right? And then we moved on to kind of understand how this becomes a part of someone's identity, how does self-expression emerge from there? And to now understanding drag, uh, of course, when I say drag, most of y'all think about RuPaul's Drag Race. But our country itself has such a rich history and culture of drag. We're all born naked and the rest is drag. But in a country that has that is as diverse as ours, with so many different cultures, how does one then define this performance? When a Met Gala looks at camp as a theme or concept conveniently ignoring the history of camp, and it was drag that started a very important political conversation, what becomes the history of drag itself? And that too in India. Let's hear it from our panelists today. Our first panelist is Ms. Benji. She's a queen who represents the aesthetics of Bollywood. She's funny, quirky, full of surprises. She's sweetest until you show your homophobic, transphobic, or mainly dragphobic comments. She has basically performed at the biggest venues in the city on the most international platforms. Her strengths are dancing and comedy, and her weaknesses are cute boys and non-fitting clothes. We also have with us as our second panelist, someone who could give Cardi B and Nicki Minaj a run for their money, India's first queer rapper with a drag that slays and talent that can make you raise more than just an eyebrow. Please welcome Tropical Marka. Joining them is supposed to be Zish, who is a multidisciplinary artist, but we're still trying to get in touch with them. So let's figure out over time if we can have them on board. And to moderate this conversation, we have Patruni Chidananda Sastri, who is an expressionist dancer, performance artist, drag performer. Patruni Sastri's unique style called Indian Expressionism is a new way to tell stories of awareness of the society within the framework of classical Indian dance as they perform Tranimal Drag, a drag style which deconstructs fashion and makeup, often using found objects and the element of surrealism with the drag name Suffocated Art Specimen. Also, the founder of Dragpati, an online space for drag in India. Over to you. Thank you for that wonderful uh, 
you know, introduction and uh, thank you all the panelists who are there over here. Uh, hi, Ms. Banji, and we are just uh, trying to see uh, Mark over there. Can you guys see me? Yeah, we are not able to see. We can hear you though. Yeah, we can hear Hi. Why can't you see? I think uh, you just need to click on that uh, video button over there. Is it on? Not yet. Is it on? Yeah, it's on, it's on, it's on, it's on. Hi! Yeah, hi and welcome to the panel discussion over here. And uh, today I will be going ahead and asking you a few questions. Uh, and uh, let's let's have a chat about what exactly is the drag culture in, in, in India altogether. So firstly, I just wanted to quickly, you know, ask both of you, uh, hey, Jishan. Jishan. Wonderful. So uh, let's first quickly go ahead and your journeys with uh, drag and how did you start with drag, starting with Ms. Benji. Um, okay, first of all, hi everyone. And uh, I hope everyone is having fun so far with all the sessions that are going on. And uh, we have come to the most fun part of the session, the drag, uh, uh, something that everyone loves, something everyone is confused about. You know, it's, it's a whole new topic. So let's dig into it by starting who really is Ms. Benji. So I started doing my drag when I was in uh, my third year of engineering college that was uh, in 2014 where I performed as uh, a drag persona and uh, I did a pinga number in full Navari in my college and uh, yeah it, that's how in 2014 I first did my drag and then I took a couple years of break and then in 2018 I started drag again at Kitisu with the gorgeous Marka and Zish, who are also panelists today. So I'm with my debut queens again here, which is so amazing. Wow, that's really wonderful uh, to hear. Uh, next, you'd we'll go to Marka, you know, my favorite, you know, I started my drag with the inspiration of Marka, so yeah. yeah. Hi, everybody. First of all, let me take this mask off since I'm at home. Hi. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Yes. So let me first of all thank thank you guys for having me here. Secondly, I hope everybody's in the house and not trying it because that Mountain Dew is getting you fat. You don't need calories, boo. Okay. And uh, starting drag. Well, uh, I would blame that on my mother because she used to always get me dressed up for every fancy dress or whatever as that bitch who shows up as a girl, and that has just inspired me to play with her makeup and play with clothes and. Kitisu is like one platform that gave me the opportunities to take my drag and my accumulated drag knowledge and share it with you guys. So it, it was it was like a very weird journey by what exactly am I doing with my life? My parents were like, are you a deranged man trying to dress up like a woman and do this entire mess and like, hamara naam kharaab karne ki koshish kar and all that. But then I had to explain it to them that this is something that's part of our culture. It's part of what you taught me to do. And uh, I'm just celebrating myself because I found myself in this. So it, it, it has been like this beautiful gift that, that the universe has given, and my parents have given me to celebrate myself. Wonderful. Thank you for that, uh, Marka. And next we'll move to Jish. Jish, you know, the master of illusion uh, where uh, we could just see him each and every time he pops up in the stream. Jish, over to you. Hi, first of all, uh... <clears throat> You guys are looking all brilliant and phenomenal. I love each and every look of you guys. Yeah. Uh, let me tell you all about me. Uh, I am Zishan Ali, aka Zish, uh, well known as the drag phenomena of India. I started my uh, drag career uh, as a just a play thing, and it started off like just Halloween queen kind of a thing. Uh, but sooner or later, I realized how much of a voice uh, this drag persona has and how many changes can it bring into the society. And uh, soon, as soon as I started doing my looks, I was a bedroom queen, started uh, doing my looks in my rooms. And little by little, uh, things got featured and realized how much of a voice my drag personality has along with myself. And that led me to explore my actual personality and explore uh, the reality that drag has to offer in a way. 
Wonderful. Now we'll just quickly go on to the questions. So I do have prepared a lot of questions for all of you. And are we just shooting the, those questions to one another? And I believe, uh, you know, there's something which would help us uh, with the purpose of this particular conversation. So starting with the first question, it's to uh, I see that uh, you shared something mm. in your recent video, so, uh, which is really wonderful about drag. Okay, I think this. Yeah, so uh, I see that you have shared something, a recent video, which is really wonderful about drag, that drag is an art profession and shouldn't be mixed with sexuality and, uh, uh, and gender. So uh, can you throw some more light on, uh, you know, why drag is something which is, which is, something which is not uh, to do with either sexuality or gender, but it's something which, uh, which is more specific to an art form? Uh, that's for me, correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, it's a it's a huge topic that could be debated and discussed. Uh, drag is also uh, it is an extreme form of art form and uh, related to complete artistry. However, drag can also have a huge interlink. I do believe drag does have a linkage to gender and sexuality quite a lot for some. It may not be for everyone, but for some. And I think drag ha is a wide subject related to each one's personal take of drag. I think it's authentic to your own self and not, uh, there's no written book on drag per se. So if for you, it's just an art form and a profession, fabulous. But, but if for you, it is linked with gender and sexuality, fabulous. And that's okay too. And I think that's what, that's something that got cut out from that video and I am kind of displeased by it. But then in totality, I feel drag is interlinked. It's up to you how you link it as if you wanted to link it up as that. So it's a personal take on drag person. Each one to their own drag, by the way. And that's wonderfully said. Uh, well, you know, drag is again something which is quite personal in its own nature. So the next question I am uh, to put is to, uh, to Marka. So how do you think about the current Indian drag scene coming up? And what do you think as we, as a drag artist should do to make it more diverse? Well, I would also like to add to what Zishan has to say, first of all, uh, that yeah. I'm sure you all have a favorite Bollywood actress like Rekha Madhuri Dixit. What is, what is the Rekha-ness or Madhuri-ness that you like? Well, that's her drag. Like the fact that Rekha wears her eyeliner all across the back, to the back of her head and Madhuri has got this gorgeous smile and he, she wears her hair in a particular way. That's her drag. That does not mean they're lesbian. Right. And... Coming to uh, coming to making like right now the drag culture in in India is is quite diverse because we have like queens that that use the rural aspect the natural Indian aspect of drag because drag originated in India if you guys don't know that because uh, all the maharajas and all all the darbars mm -hmm. if I may all the darbars that had had the dancers like females are not allowed to dance back in the day if your if your daughter is a dancer she probably is a hoe that the entire concept how it used to run but so men used to uh, dress up as women and perform for kings queens and for like entire courts and drag came up from there so uh, right now we get to see a lot of aspects like when maya the drag queen miss benji bring the bollywood bring the culture in with somebody like zishan uh, brings the fashion element when i bring like the weird wacky element to it so this, this is like creating diversity within ourselves already. And there are so many queens that are inspired by us. Like there's nasty bitch out there who's, who's all about the body and all about that aesthetic of shape and the femininity. There is a gentleman Gaga who's bringing up a little bit of Arabic influences with her belly dance and uh, also using quite a lot of Indian music also. Then we have Mademoiselle who's another upcoming queen who plays between, she, I, I for sure know she's all that Bollywood, but she plays with a lot of English music, which is bringing like Western culture back to India. So we are, we are very diverse. If anybody thinks that we are not diverse as a drag queens of India ourselves, we also are embracing other cultures. So girl, she's diverse. Wonderful. So that's, that's really a wonderful, uh, you know, take on the Indian aspect of, of drag. Uh, and this is the other important question, which I would like to ask uh, Ms. Benji. Uh, do you uh, think there is something called as drag phobia? And uh, did you ever experience or felt 
subjected to it? And if so, what should be the best approach in curtailing that drug phobia? <coughs> okay. Um, I think drag phobia is pretty much there. And uh, drag phobia is, you know, it's sometimes subtle, it's sometimes loud, and it's it's definitely there. Like, you know, whenever uh, a man dresses up as woman or a woman dresses up as man, I think uh, a lot of people cannot take that concept very well because they are like, you know, okay, why are you doing this? What is the need of it? And I mean, like, I don't get it. Why, why is that question in the first place? Like, makeup, mira, kapde, mere, body, mere. I can do whatever I want, <laughs> right? So who are you to ask me, first of all? And then, uh, then you come up with all these phobic uh, comments and statements. And then I'm like, wow, this witch is getting onto something. I love it. Let's get into it. So drag phobia is, I feel, you know, you have uh, a scare of people who try to shift their gender whenever they want. Because I, I also feel it's also because, you know, some of the people are too scared to do it. That's why they hate it. And uh, so that is one thing. And uh, second thing, how I deal with it is uh, instead of ignoring it, I try to deal with it then and there. Uh, with my replies, with my, uh, you know, I just like the other day, like when you shared the drag phobia post on drag one t so you posted a lot of common drag phobic statements that happened so whenever i saw that statement i was like i have an answer for all of these so i had literally posted answers of all the statements that were posted by you and i was like yeah uh, thank you for for answering that question and this is a question which is for everybody on the panel it's a long question so i would uh, you know just read it a bit uh, slow so uh, the, question, the question is like, while India as a country has always been accepting traditional folk and cultural art forms with awards, scholarships, PhD and degrees specific for art, uh, while drag existed in India as an art form for more than a decade, uh, and drag artists uh, have been there for, for ages, however, it's never given an equal uh, existing platform into the art, art spectrum. Uh, like drag artists are not invited for national awards or not given an awards uh, through a national platform like you know Padmashri and Padma uh, to the field of art and study. So do you think it's in a high time to call it out and push those boundaries to make it even more mainstream? Who would like to go first? I don't know. I think Marka should go first. Yeah. <laughs> no, I like, well, like Ms. Bhanji said that I don't ignore but I acknowledge, well, that is where we, we it's our fault because we, we chose, to, chose to ignore where we can educate. People don't know that drag exists in India. Like there are hardly like 20 drag artists in India and there are about 10 or 20,000 LGBT people that know of these drag arts. So what we need to do, first of all, is educate the masses that, hey, bitch, we exist. And secondly, we've been here for a long time because uh, I don't think that was a woman dancing in like a Maharaja court. So it's an art form that has been that has been cultivated in our country in a way and respected in our country in a way. But right now, thanks to the British rule that came, or sorry, <laughs> no, Section 377 uh, uh, does play a little a part where most LGBT artists or queer artists uh, are more inclined to the performance art where they like to experiment with their sexuality or they experiment with their look or things like that. But it's it's definitely our fault, the drag artist's fault, because we do not take the time to educate. What we like to say is fuck you bitch, or this or that, or ignore or something, where we can just, instead of putting up a mascara fucking tutorial in every day or something like that, why don't we talk about how it's normal? Like I took a rickshaw ride in this, can you believe? I finished my cigarette, <laughs> then I, this, this entire shindig shenanigan <laughs> took way too long to start. And I was like, bitch, I need to smoke. So I got into a rickshaw like this, okay, like not even like, like this. I went down to the place and I'm like, tell you the I smoked my cigarette and I came back. And there was literally everybody at that shop, although I can't tell you where the fuck I got it, but everybody at the shop was like, and aap kya karte ho? I, I put them back to my Instagram and I send them that vice video where I answer 10 questions about being a drag queen and shit like that. 
So educating the masses. So at least those random people on the street now know what a drag queen is. We can take this to our educational forums. We can take this to our political forums. We can take this to wherever the fuck we want. It's our baby, hun. No, exactly. Going off of Marka, <clears throat> it took us such a long time to get over those three seven seven law as a whole and explain people that queer community exists. and to get the queer art to be featured and more provoke like explain to people i think it's a long journey ahead to reach to a point where a uh, queer artist could be themselves be queer out and loud and still be accepted by the political scenarios by uh, the masses and uh, you know receive a padma shri or something like that i think right now uh, it's a high need that we educate as marka says ki we really need Uh, people talking, discussing, and evoking the actual identity and speaking their truth in a way, and that's currently extremely essential. Henry, so it's my chance, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, see, whatever you're saying about uh, getting awards and uh, Padma Bhushan and all that big names that you took, I think we have a very long way for that because. first of all see most of the knowledge people get about drag or whatever is from uh, internet is from media is from tv that they watch so internet is still fine like you can google and properly get to know about it next comes the most fucked up part is indian media and how they show drag so if you see indian media and drag it just means a drag queen is nothing but a comedian right so there is there is not there is no this uh, diversity that is shown like how there is a diversity in kitchu or in, in any uh, indian club that is running drag shows like we have look queens we have dancing queens we have singing queens we have political queens there are so many uh, types of queens that are there and we are not acknowledging that we just see ki theek hai agar ladka ladki kapda pehen raha hai to matlab wo comedian hai there is nothing more to it so you know once we uh, move past that Check you know it. when first we uh, get the the drag queens that are there for now on to the tv movies and show us as normal as other participants in the movie or tv then people will understand oh okay so there is like a drag total art so it has a meaning and there are types and all that so yeah then once people you know get to Uh, understand it and you know because see if people have problem they are going to have problem in this that is nothing we can do about it but we can try as much as possible to at least make it normal so yeah one well, thank you so much for that so this is a rapid fire round and it's for everybody on the panel so yeah. the first it will one be very confusing because is... everybody's <laughs> going to answer together <laughs> Yeah, so I just to you know take up the time crunch which we have over here. So I was just like you know let's wrap it up in a bit faster way. So uh, the first one is like a multiple choice question. You have to choose one: uh, wigs or glitter. Wigs, bitch. Wigs or glitter. Glitter. Oh, glitter, honey. No wig. I'm I just imagine. Cover myself with glitter head to toe, so that works. Yeah. Yeah, bitch. Come on, glitter queen. <laughs> yeah. And the next one is uh, workroom or stage. Repeat, repeat. Uh, workroom or stage? Everywhere. How dare you? Bro? All the places, even a washroom works, honey. If it comes yeah. to me, oh. At this point, anywhere. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I love her. Wonderful. Uh, fake nails or fake lashes? Fake lashes. The fake nails. Over here. Fake nails. <laughs> Anything but a fake personality. Amen. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Amen, bitch. Amen. Yeah. So, if you have to wake up as a rue girl uh, from the drag race, who would you be? If I had what? If you have to wake up as a rue girl, rue Paul girl. We we are. We know what a rue girl is. Rue Paul herself. I'll be rue Paul. Fuck I everybody else. <laughs> I would be Bianca Del Rio. Bye. Wonderful. Bye, bye. <laughs> and uh, one thing which you always uh, wants to be a part of your makeup kit. Weed. 
बाकी सब काम चला लूंगा मैं लेकिन यू नो वॉट Please type it over there. Yes, look at all this embroidery, latkan, all of this. Look at this. Look at this. Up close in my face like that. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Hello. So I think uh, we haven't got any questions as of now. So thank you very much. Do we have any viewers? <laughs> Is there a lot of viewers? Yeah. You know, for we have one question. I think we there have two is... questions. Yes, yes. Yeah, we have a question. We have two questions. Where is it? Two one is for Patruni, one is for Patruni, and one is this one by Atmaj Vyas. Okay, can I'm... you see it? If you can't see it, I can uh, read it out yeah, for you. Yeah. Can you just read out for me? Yeah. Okay. The first question is Patruni. Can you explain your makeup, please? Okay, so this is oh God, God bless all of them. <laughs> now this is the real spill the tea. Yeah, so, real now. Yeah, so this is something which I really wanted to put it on my face uh, as soon as I can, and this goes look which I do. So I am wearing a shirt which is given my father, and uh, and uh, and something which is a sari which is which is with my mother, and these are all the embroideries which I just stole it from my mom. You know? Yes, yes, you get that. Yes. And and this is a door curtain which has you know Om Ganesh Hi Namah on the top. Oh wow! I want to highlight this, I'm but this is something shook. which I want to keep it. Spiritual queen. I'm shook, legit, like shook. But are you are you suffocated enough? Yeah, yeah like suffocated. who needs a mask, bitch? Who needs a mask? <laughs> fuck you, Corona. Fuck China. <laughs> okay, so second question, ready? Yeah. What do you think is the next step for drag in India? Did everyone hear that? Yeah. Who is okay. it for? It's for everyone, I think. It's very okay. Can I can I put my two cents in this one? Put four cents, bitch. Just a bit. I'll be ruk me. Okay. So so uh, I would like everybody to know that there are queens out there like Sushant, like me, who are who did it. when it was not okay okay that and now we're still doing it uh, but i think there are there are there are so many opportunities and so many new stones to be picked up and so many new stones to be thrown further off when nobody thrown a stone that far with music with art with we want recognition for it but we are not embracing who we are there are padma bhushans and there are all these national awards given to i have friends who are gay and who have received bal uh what is it called bal Pad- padma bhushan or something like that mm-hmm. it's a crazy 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 cray okay all in all okay uh, yes but uh, these people are not out about their sexuality they are not celebrating like which i am a gay artist who did this and i am surviving and i'm playing they like you know they are not embracing who we are we are not we are not swallowing the truth We are just not celebrating ourselves enough. Where other people start celebrating us, and Benji feeling too hot. I can't. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> yes, I can't. No, I have a. This is the product. This is the packaging. <laughs> yeah. So it's just it's just that uh, there are so many new new places and so many new untouched territories that all you little girls need to start exploring because i can't be rapping for all my life like you know there are other singers out there but i have no music no exactly i feel there are so many queer artists out there who are hiding themselves and not showing themselves because they, they are still feared that they won't be accepted as they they are and i think that has to change and that couldn't change unless we people are talk, talking about it and expressing that it's okay to be your authentic self It's not a fucking crime. You can be who you are and achieve all those things that you wish for. And I think that's extremely essential that we speak about it and educate people about it. That it's all right. It's okay. Right. 
Rishan is like hyped and all. Yeah, that's bitch. Yeah. I mean, you did like this. Yeah, like even I'm like so very pissed with this because there are queens that are like opportunity. Nahi hai. Absolutely. I did not have an opportunity. I had to create an opportunity for myself. Sushant so did not have an opportunity. He had to create one. Maya, exactly. you did not have an opportunity. Nobody even knew what your style is. You had to bring it out there, show it to people, and that's how people were like, "Fuck yes." If you're doing it yourself, no one ain't gonna come and pick your hand up. You gotta do it. You gotta take care of it by yourself, and then show it to people, and then shit starts happening for you. Exactly. I and uh, I'd also I'd also like to add to what Patroni had to say. Uh, well, Sushant and ZTV has played this huge part in this. Where Sushant was celebrated as a drag artist. Rani Koinu was celebrated as a drag artist on a national, international television channel. ZTV is not a minor thing. and even with uh, like they 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 opted to select me for a reality show to represent gay culture and drag culture with this mission xpd mess that i was in and i got an opportunity to educate so many people from villages that i met that what exactly is it that i do and i have gained so much love i'm sure even you guys get a shout out shout out message or some little small town little chintu sa bachchu that sends you a picture of his hideous makeup or bhenji just keeps sending you pictures and all that but there are <laughs> Hey. <laughs> no, 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 no. But there are so many kids that do get the inspiration, but they just need to like believe. Which, if I did not believe in what I could do, can get me somewhere. I wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here. But Tony wouldn't be here. Benji still here. <laughs> Even I don't know why I'm here. The road is over, Vish. <laughs> I'm no, sorry to intervene, but. Celebrate who you are. I'm sorry, really sorry. sorry to intervene in this brilliant discussion, but I think we should save some for the roast that's about to come later. Oh, honey, you have no and, idea what's coming in. Yeah, I have no clue what I'm walking into. But uh, <laughs> I see we can't access the show right now, so I'm really, really grateful for all of you. This was such a brilliant and such an insightful discussion. We need to start these conversations on so many levels, and I'm glad to have people like you to look up to who are taking the initiative. Uh, we'll see it once. Then we couldn't read their bio. So, uh, for everyone who does not know, Zish is a multidisciplinary artist creating waves in the fashion and makeup industry. From being on the cover of Vogue India to being the iconic face for Fashion Showcase by Mini Chirora at Lucknow, she has worked in several ad films and theater art productions as head makeup artist and costume designer, and is also known for gender redefining modeling work. Zish's drag journey began five years back. And since then, their work can be found in all major magazines and media platforms. And they've also and Zee has also performed on all kinds of international and national platforms you could imagine. So thank you so much for being a part of this. We so really, much. really appreciate. Thank you, thank you so much for having us here. Breaking so barriers all the way. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. Cannot wait for the roast. Yeah. <laughs> oh, get your tissue paper because yeah. so it's gonna get <laughs> dripping, honey. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, quickly, we again after this brilliant discussion about drag, it would be almost appropriate to have someone actually perform for all of us. So please join me as we welcome Sanket Savan, aka Gentleman Gaga, who's a fashion stylist, drag artist, self-taught makeup artist, and a belly dancer, bringing to us a very exclusive drag performance. Okay. Just give us a second. Okay guys I'm ready
frequency. Hi all, my name is Sanket Savant, aka Gentleman Gaga, and um, oh my gosh, what do I start with? Uh, firstly, it feels so great uh, to perform once again for you all, and I have to say I must you have always been slaying, so the I have really nothing much to say about you because you are as fabulous as I am, but maybe a little extra. And Zishan, love you. So um, I would just like to wish you all a very happy Pride Month and just make sure that you all spread more love and less legs, unless it's for a dance move. So without much further ado, can we all get just started? And I would love to perform an act for you all. I already, I just heard someone saying yes. All right, let's get this started. Stronger than I've ever felt. This is the 
All right. I hope you all are having fun and I've enjoyed my act. Ah, and thank you so much, Social Samosa and Local Samosa for giving me this opportunity and allowing me to perform for you all. Happy Pride Month to all once again. Um, am I missing on something? I don't think so. I think I have spoken enough and I, we, we do have a lot of other artists coming up and they'll be serving their realness for you all. So that's all from my end. This is Sanket Savant here, AKA Gentleman Gaga saying goodbye and lots of love. Thank you so much, Sanket. This song is so brilliant and I cannot even begin. We all are definitely Gaga. So this is so cool. I, I just tried uh, serving some Ariana Grande realness today. <laughs> like just Gaga has to like, you know, Gaga needs to rest for a while. Like there's too much <laughs> Gaga happening a lot, like, you know, these days. And I'm thoroughly enjoying her new album, Chromatica. Chromatica? So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can't wait to see right. you soon. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. This was so brilliant. I don't know how, you know, for me to say, I don't know how we could top this is just a setup for you all to get more surprised with what is, uh, what is like arranged for you in the due course of the lineup. Now, moving on quickly to our next panel. If you've ever been to Mumbai Pride, you might be familiar with this saying that goes something like, Prem manje, prem manje, prem asta. Tumsa ani amsa, same asta. Uh, technically, it translates to love is love and yours and mine is the same. These iconic lines by Mangesh Pat Gaukar are the apt ones I can recollect thinking about the upcoming panel. In times when dating gets redefined every single day and you are just one person standing in front of the world asking to be loved, how do you define love? What are these evolving love languages? How do you decipher them? Is love as universal as we think for it to be? This panel on love is love is one that you would definitely super like. Please welcome our panelist, Atmaj Pyas. Atmaj is someone who's outspoken and vocal about topics like mental health, matters concerning to the LGBTQ plus community, positive masculinity, and is known to serve truth bombs in sarcasm quite often. Quite often. From being a virtual merchandiser, a fashion stylist, a lifestyle writer, getting brand and content strategy for a digital agency, to even hosting a travel show, he has added many feathers to the cap. He seems to be in no mood to stop and currently works as a flight attendant for a leading airline, thus giving his career literal wings as he takes off and lives his childhood dream of traveling the world. The next panelist is Sahil Yaduwanchi, a Mumbai-based assistant director, video producer, film editor, as well as a lifestyle and fashion YouTuber, Sahil Singh Yadwanchi believes in normalizing the rules of beauty and fashion for men and women. He strongly feels that nothing changes the perception towards the LGBTQIA plus community and the people realizing that we are ordinary and normal as everyone else. And these two things are something he truly believes in and voices every single day of his life. He loves to flaunt his coal eyed lights and an occasional eyeshadow, but is not one to shy away from crop tops, and you will see him as a cisgender boy next door very often. The last panelist for this panel is Arun Nayak, a little wacky with a twisted sense of humor and can laugh at the silliest possible things. It's difficult to keep his mouth shut for long, not because he talks a lot, but because of his bunny teeth is how exactly he describes himself. A HR professional who is done with the corporate world and has ventured out to be his own boss. He's a proud queer person who never shies out about his sexuality and also does not feel shy to wear it on his sleeves at all times. One who believes it is important to create a safe space for the community and who tries to contribute as much as he can by talking to people around him in personal and professional space. He loves movies, food, travel and is practicing self-love and personal care these days. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the panel. We are so excited to have this conversation. Um, okay, I have a bunch of questions to start with, but also since this is such a diverse question and such an interactive question, I would love for the audiences to also drop in their questions in the comments so we can pick it up and ask. So my first question to the whole panel is to understand love in the times of prejudice society. 
all of you are individuals who often wear your heart and your identities on your sleeve you've all been in roles of art in roles where you have been the person who could drive a force but in times like that when we say love is love and tumsane am the same as to or that all kinds of love is the same is it really so what about the society what about all the prejudices that comes along how do you tackle with that on a daily basis hi so um i'll go first um can you hear me yeah i can so um Okay, first of all, thank you so much for having me over here. Um, secondly, you know, I think I learned at a really early age. Um, back when I was like, I've kind of gone through the whole transition of uh, being bi curious, bisexual, and then finally coming to the uh, conclusion that I'm gay. And um, you know, I learned quite early on that um, one rule that you kind of need to hold in your mind is that a society that has prejudice against you or the person that you love or the kind of love that you have. um is in a society that needs to be looked up to or respected you know we live in uh, this particular kind of society but it's it's something that holds people down and it holds um it actually pushes people to the brink of you know going kind of borderline insane because you know when you're forced to keep your identity a secret for such a long time uh it does things to your mind like it takes toll on your mental health it takes toll on the relationship that you have around you and for me i personally feel like a society that kind of tells you that it's not okay to be the way you are or it's not okay to you know love who you want is not a society that i want to be a part of anyway so you know f society is basically what what i would say and i think when you start from there the prejudice and the level of confidence that you have in yourself kind of starts building up and um, especially in a society like india you know like for me I, I kind of started off being a little more, um, you know, where I I don't need to explain anything to anyone. Like, why should I? Like, I don't owe it to anyone to explain it to them. So if I'm happy, I'm cool. I think later on down the road, it kind of became a thing where I started to tell my friends about it, and I started to explain to them. Like, I had some really severely homophobic friends as well. But I think over time, educating them and um, explaining things to them, it definitely um, kind of paid off. uh so yeah what i would say is that you know just don't worry so much about what society has to think uh, about you just live your life and honestly just love who you want to love yeah uh did i go right yeah i agree with asma ja you know uh, i i'm i'm a little bit of an optimist like i don't go to be like with, with no offense i don't go to the extreme of saying you know as a society because i also make the society but i agree with him everybody to their own but i feel uh, you know it's not only love when it comes to the community i feel even when people love the, uh, you know somebody else who is of another age bracket like you know maybe 12 years younger or 12 years older or you know uh, you know i'm just saying when when you talk about love is love i feel we need to also look beyond community and that's where you know you actually try it and you actually figure out that prejudice is kind of kind of exists everywhere god forbid you start dating somebody who's 20 years younger than you and god forbid you also have a lot of money you're just like a sugar daddy or a sugar mommy and that has nothing to do with uh, being from the community so yeah uh, but i feel having said that like as much as right that you know just you, you got to live uh, how you want to live i've been very privileged in the fact that uh, and i i think i've count my blessings every day that i've never had to face so much discrimination be it from my family like my family is very supportive uh all my friends for that matter i think they knew about me before i knew about my own self uh i was this uh small not only a small town right i'm from chandigarh so that's okay but i went to bangalore so you see the transition and i was like accepted with open arms so i think i've been lucky that way but having said that of course i have had my own privileges but i always make sure that you know there's this whole saying which goes uh which is true always that कुछ तो लोग कहेंगे लोगों का काम है कहना एंड दैट्स ट्रांस ट्रू फॉर एवरीथिंग आई कैन डू एनीथिंग और एवरीथिंग राइट आई कैन कैरी माय फादर ऑन माय बैक माय बैक माय फादर कैन कैरी हिम ऑन हिज बैक पीपल विल स्टिल हैव अ प्रॉब्लम राइट सो आई गेस इफ यू वांट टू एफ द सोसाइटी एफ द सोसाइटी इफ यू वांट टू बी इनडिफरेंट टू देम बी दैट और जस्ट लिव योर ओन लाइफ या लाइक आई डोंट थिंक वी हैव दैट मच टाइम एंड स्पेशली व्हेन यू थिंक अबाउट लव You rather be consumed, all consumed in that, right? Any kind of love. I'm not just saying romantic love. You be consumed in what you really like, and you know about your self care and about being with your family and friends, and just don't care about the world. 
Well, I'll go now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Right, great. So I will second Sahil. I'm like, I, that's exactly what my thought is. Uh, it is not just about the LGBTQ uh, per se, but uh, love in general has been, uh, you know, uh, uh, has been looked down upon uh, by the society or if you are, you know, in love or in relationship with somebody who's not uh, of your caste or your religion, it always become a taboo. And um, the, the irony is, we are in a we're living in a country which which celebrates love. I'm like, we look at our uh, past, look at our histories. We we have, you know, tremendous love story that that has flourished over here. But ironically, now we don't look at as what we, we used to look at back then. Uh, having said that, uh, like Sahil said, it is up to you whether you want to say F to the society or whether you want to just live with it. I'm like, nobody, uh, honestly, I'm like, uh, maybe it is privileged to, to live in a, a metropolitan city where people don't uh, you know, care much about whom you live with or uh, whom you're dating or whom you're seeing at this point in time. For us, it is like I said, it's, it is a little bit privilege. Maybe not for somebody who is not from a uh, from a, a town or who's in a, in a little rural area. It may for them it must be society must be playing an important role over there. So that's that's what my thought is all about. I, I really find it interesting how you all all three of you had this common thread about how we even perceive love in a very unilateral way, right? Like love is always supposed to be contingent upon having another romantic partner. But we don't often think of love as something, say, as simple as self-love. You know, something as simple as how you love your pet animals or how you love your family or your friends. But that being said, uh, that in times of today, we see this very strong development of forces of hate, not only in terms of anti-love hate, but just anti-identity, anti-your anti social position, anti-everything that you could ever stand for. And this hate is sometimes supremely blind. I mean, it is making people go off dating apps, social media apps to kind of, you know, confine them in rooms and spaces where they do not want to interact with the world because it just feels so loveless. But in times like these, how do you still keep your belief in the universal idea of love and tackle this head on every single day? wrong song. <laughs> but on a serious note, uh, I, I agree with you. Sorry, can I go first? Yeah. Uh, I feel uh, I, I'm a diehard romantic. Uh, and not to say that I, I'm hopeless and that, oh, you know, I don't believe in fairy tales. I'm very realistic about it. But having said that also, I've been single. I'm pretty never dated. I'm very happy. Very, I, I think I'm absorbed in myself far too much. Uh, I think I just, I'm too confident. Like I think also it comes from the kind of uh, family I've been brought up with. Uh, uh, it's always been about standing up for yourself and, you know, by yourself first. You need to be in your beliefs, be it, uh, you know, uh, things like, you, like the way you said, you know, if you stand for individuality, people will hate against you. People will, again, it comes down to the same thing. People just, you know, they lay low. They just want to hate on something. <laughs> like you do it, what what do I do? Oh, that guy is a like today I put an Instagram post and I was like, you know, can men wear makeup? And I did a poll. And I'm wearing just like a little bit of some coal. And I was shocked because I was under the perception that a lot of people who follow me actually believe in what I believe in. But you would not believe about 70% of the people said men should not wear makeup. And I was like, this is surprising because uh I mean just look at film, right? Uh there but yeah it comes down to self-love you have to because again if you can't love yourself you won't love anybody else right and when it comes to i think also this love is just amplified times 10 because of rom-com movies yes i cry and sob when it goes movies because that's like a part you always want you know that's a nice thing but you have to be very realistic about the fact that it may not happen to you right these are ideas that are built around you much like any concept in the world, right? You need to be very self-aware of these things. And I think as long as you know, okay, okay, I, I'm, I came alone, I'm going to go alone, right? And this is my family, this is my set of people who matter to me. That has to be a first priority always, right? And I'm a living example of saying that you can survive easily 27, be very happy, 
be like no yeah i we all get it it being from mm-hmm. the right so i guess i'm good that like you have to love yourself first if you can love anybody else that is really important uh you're on mute yeah <laughs> all right so um, see oh, that's what happens i'm like see, uh, when you come to my age i'm like i'm 40 and i have re- i've realized that um, it's okay to not to be in you know romantically involved with anybody at all the time if you if you love yourself if you if you take care of little things that uh, to for the people who are around you uh, that takes care of that uh, uh, loneliness that people talk about i'm like you follow what you like i, I love cooking i'm like most of the time the kind of situation we are living in we are in lockdown we don't have any other means to you know uh, take care of um, your needs so i go to kitchen i cook i eat i'm like that that's that's what makes me happy so what makes you happy should uh, be the first priority in everyone's life love will come i'm like you will meet somebody and the uh, like i said again when 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 you come to this age you realize that everything is not as good as yashraj movie yes everything is not about you know you will fall in love and this is going to happen practicality is a part of every everything it's it's a core of every relationship so that's about my, from my side you know i can agree to what uh, arun also said about practicality and i think before i get to that point um something that's really important to understand is what exactly do you think is your definition of love um everyone i think has a different idea and a concept for what love is and i think it's important to kind of understand that like for me love means something completely different than what it would mean for i don't know someone else and um i think we often times we confuse ourselves uh, to such a point where we don't really realize what it is where we're looking for you know so like i can be like yes i'm looking for love but is it something that i'm actually looking for or is it just you know physical um contact that i want or is it something emotional or am i trying to like you know pass my burden on to someone i think understanding the concept of love is something that everyone strives for and i think you can read as many books as you want watch as many movies as you want it's always going to be different and you know what sometimes when you get love or your definition of love it's completely completely opposite of what you were expecting it to be sometimes it turns out to be a nightmare and it, you have to just take it in your stride and kind of move on uh from there because there's no fixed definition of what love is exactly and starting with yourself is the first and foremost i think is the most important part that you need to uh you need to grasp because if you cannot love your flaws your your screw ups the decisions that you made and the regrets that you have every bit of it that you have is something that you need to love first and accept before i think you can actually even open yourself to someone else coming into your life and i think these are the kind of things that play a really important part so you know when you when you say love um and love is love but yeah love is love because you don't know what the definition of love is so that's exactly why it's a very broad interpretation and sometimes it's just better not to even try and define it because it's a feeling so when you get it you know exactly what it is and if you don't have it you just keep looking for it that is that's like a perfect holistic understanding of love i could ever get but it also makes me question right so like you said that love does not always mean what you think it means it can mean so many other things but that being said do you feel like how the dating practices have evolved or like with the coming in of dating apps and having so many options at your disposal where you could seek love do you feel that kind of complicates our understanding of love as a person too do you feel like sometimes you get super cornered into believing that this is love and nothing else could be you know does something like that happen yeah i think it's you know honestly because of the number of options that we have we've started to take everything for granted um you know we've taken these little connections that you have with someone you know even looking at someone across the bar and you have this kind of moment and you have this whole connection and then you're just like okay you know what's crude i'll find him on instagram and then you kind of go through instagram and you're just like okay fine i'm going to stalk the shit out of it but in that moment where you could have spoken to the person you could have lived in that moment and been in that moment you decided to kind of go with the option right Uh, there's a, there's a whole thing where people have forgotten how to be old fashioned and sometimes i think that's what we kind of need to go back to 
um, everything has become so quick and it's very, un- it's kind of ungrateful in the sense where I'll meet this really cute boy on like Tinder, Grindr, whatever it is. And I will have a few conversations and then it's just going to go into something, either it's going to go into like, hey, pics or some shit. You know, it kind of goes that way. Or you're going to actually have a really great conversation with the person and then eventually you're going to be like, Meh, okay, I don't really know where this is going. We've given up on the concept of actually getting to know people. And I feel like that is where we are starting to screw ourselves over. Because in this whole process of being quick with everything, one, I think like romance is dead, almost dead. And like, I think the last person I even spoke to about having something semblance of a romance was think three years back so you can imagine it's uh, maybe this is my bad luck but I think like everyone kind of wants something and everyone has this preset agenda um, which is caused by the options because now like if I go on to Grindr or if I go on to Tinder I'm just like okay I know what I'm finding over here like it's just going to be this so now I have this assumption so I know I'm not going to go there and then if I go to a bar and I'm trying to look at someone they're going to be like oh you know what I'm going to find him on Instagram so it's it's like this whole vicious cycle that keeps going around in circles and my only suggestion is, you know, put your phone down, look at the person, talk to the person, and actually build a connection. If I if I if I take uh, you know your point forward, I feel uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, what we don't, what we stop doing, I think, is also like I don't know. I'm I'm on the on the you know I'm taking a risk of sounding a little insensitive, but at times you'll see a couple, whatever, and you you like you know they don't look like they could be dating you know maybe the one person is you know more handsome or prettier you know if you're just looking through that and you're just like how does that happen and that answers most of the thing because they care to build the connection right most at least in our community a lot of times you'll see somebody with their clone you'll see Atma with his clone Arun with his clone me with my clone clone or like completely you know yin yang situation because that's what we're constantly looking on these dating apps and like, you know, uh, Atman said, we'll find that person on Instagram and God forbid you reach that person on Instagram because the stalking skills of everybody right now are great. I feel you can reach there and you'll be like, okay, what are the flaws, right? You start looking for people's flaws. Or like, oh, I don't like his nose. I don't like his chin or yada, yada, yada. And you will not care about the person that that person is from within. I don't care about your gender. I don't care about your uh, sex. I don't care about anything. But whoever you're planning to love because on Grindr, on Tinder, we're just like, you know, this is the face, this is the job profile, all blah, blah, blah. So you can already imagine the kind of uh, dating situation you'll be in, the kind of restaurants you'll be going to, the kind of, you already pictured it, you've already kind of, in your head, you already dated. Now you feel like, why do you need to really do it? You know what I mean? And you'll agree, both of you, that we've been talking to people for like two, three years. You know what I mean? And we've never met them. So then we're like, Are, yaar, to yahi padha hai. like, he's just a tap away. Right, you just go and get you tap, and that person's like, "Hey, where have you been?" And you still won't see. So I guess that's again taking us to a point and kind of conclusion is to look beyond everything. Like I'm not even saying looks, just look beyond. Be in that moment, like we said. Just just grab that opportunity and don't care about anything else. You will not get that opportunity again, mind you. Like you think you may, but you will not. Well, uh, so agree to both of you what you've said. Um, I have been, uh, you know, dating since uh, way before the dating apps were even invented. So um, can you hear me? I'm like, am I audible? Okay, perfect. So, <laughs> so I've been dating. I'm like, I have been in relationship for really long. I'm like long, long, six, seven years uh, in relationship. And um, see, you meet a person, you spend time together, you, you, uh, you, you know, tend to know that person. Uh, I'm talking about pre all this dating app uh, era. And then you realize uh, that you, the time you've spent, there are times uh, when you are in a relationship. Uh, you, so at some point in time, you get into a relationship just because you want to get into a relationship. And that had happened with me as well. I just wanted to get into a relationship so desperately that oh, this is a thing that I, I, don't know, I have dreamt of. But when you are in a relationship, then you realize that, oh, no, this is not what exactly uh, I was uh, dreaming of. Uh, because when you 
I'll be the person and there's no uh, growth. There's no personal growth for both of them. I'm not talking about me, but it is about both of them. Uh, uh, partners should grow together. Uh, there should be something in for both of them. They should learn. So that's where I thought, oh, I, I got into a relationship way too soon. Now with the dating app, now with all these possibilities, I'm like two meters away and 200 meters away. That That's a little scary. I'm like, that's actually a little scary. I, I come from a time when I'm like, I used to walk on a street and I used to look at a stranger's eyes and that's how we used to connect. <laughs> now two meters away is like really scary for me. <laughs> For for all the lovers of rom com, I mean that's the most ideal love story, right? Like you walk on the street, you look at someone, but then realize we've also all come to realize that over time, rom coms have become the most scariest situations you could ever exist in because you cannot just fall in love with a stranger across the street, and that's the practicality of it. But that being said, I have one last question for all of you. We all have spoken about love as a concept beyond looking at you know heteronormativity or the gender binaries because somewhere i feel like as a concept itself the society has convoluted love so much all these you know subcategories come very later the idea in itself for anyone for a cis het queer gender non-conforming person love is still equally difficult in times like these if you could make one change to how dating or the perception of love works in the society what would that one change be for each one of you? Um, so I go first. Yeah. Okay, so one thing that I would really like to change is the amount of hatred that exists inside the community itself. Um, I think it's something that people don't talk about a lot. And um, it's something that we kind of glance over because it's good to look at the prettier picture and stuff like that. But when we are celebrating something like pride, getting our rights, and in having this entire moment, I think it's also critical to... Um, to you know, talk, continue to talk and educate about such instances. And two, when you're spreading love, spread the love inside the community as well. Stop looking at other people. Like, stop thinking bisexual people are confused. Stop thinking lesbians are butch. Stop thinking gays are all feminine. We have our own stereotypes that we are putting on each other. And then we're looking at the general public and saying like, oh my God, how can you look at me with that stereotype? We are the lens that can change everything. So let us start by changing ourselves and educating the people around you. And I think from there, that's when you can start building a bridge of respect. And that's when you can start changing the way people perceive you and perceive the person whose hand you're holding as well. Ahan, would you like to go uh, next? So, I was just thinking. No, uh, I completely agree with that. But I feel uh, respect needs to come first. Uh, I feel... Uh, but since he's addressed it, I'll go, uh, I'll, what I feel most important is, again, comes down to how much you love your own self. Uh, because it honestly boils, boils down to that. Because if you're insulting somebody, uh, if you, you know, on, on these apps, you'll see, uh, you know, skinny people do not text me. Asian people do not text me. It's very, very uh, abusive at times, right? But I feel it's, it's not coming from so much as, they, of course, they want to say, I, that's not my preference, which is fine. But I feel that that self love, that uh, confidence in your, in who you are, in being comfortable in your own skin, it's a reaction, right? That self development, that being at peace with your own self and who you are is lacking. So I feel uh, any kind of respect towards the world, any kind of love towards the world, any kind of uh, you know bringing happiness to the world. First has to come when you respect yourself, when you're comfortable in your own skin, when you're looking to improve. Uh, put your ego aside and uh, ex you know listen to what people have to tell you that this is not right about you. You know maybe you can alter this. And I think that's where because if that changes, forget love. Everything in the world can be solved. Honestly, not I'm not saying coronavirus. I don't I don't think anybody can solve that. But <laughs> most of these societal issues I think can be solved uh, if you start respecting yourself and just treat other person the way you will treat your own body or your own mind. Thank you. Well, uh, from my side, um, uh, don't confine yourself uh, to a certain uh, uh, section. I'm like, don't think that, okay, for me, love is this. Oh, I have to be like this. So love is, is kind of uh, 
it's universe and like it, it's huge it's humongous uh, there are so many things that you can do if, when you are in or out of love so give that much of ch- uh, space uh, when you are in a relationship for both of you i'm like i always believe that you, there should be uh, equal respect uh, when you are a uh, partner you should respect your partner and give that space to each other that's what something which we don't do usually so how have, have that individuality when even when you are in a relationship being that individual that that essence should not lose uh, should not be lost when you are when you are in a relationship so that's that's it that's from my side thank you so thank you. much for such brilliant insights into the idea of love i believe atma just saying something and sorry for yes, sorry i just wanted to say one quick thing um it's something that uh, saikat majumdar had spoken about earlier when he said stop putting thing don't put things in a box and let romance be romance and i think like that really hits home on this entire topic so i just wanted to add that just keep that in mind thank you so much these were such brilliant like and no hold holds barred kind of insights and sometimes you need to have the real conversation and know the real deal going forward thank you for also addressing what we need to do as a community and also what people who are allies and people beyond people in heterosexual relationship everyone across the world who ever felt in love needs to do to kind of upscale this idea of love that we hold thank you for a brilliant discussion thank you you're welcome thank you thank you thank you Up next we have someone who was on a panel before coming back with a brilliant performance please welcome miss benji Hello everyone. Hi, my name is Nile Joshi, aka Miss Benji, and these ten minutes have been allotted to me to perform for you guys. And so, okay. So before I start my performance, I would like to thank Social Ketchup and Local Samosa for providing me with this opportunity. And I will be performing one number, one Bollywood number. Uh, I'm an Indian aesthetic drag queen, so I mostly perform Bollywood numbers. So I would be performing one number, which is of almost three minutes. So I want you guys to watch it, enjoy it, and suggest some songs that you think I can perform for you. A good Bollywood number, okay? Think of it, and then I'll get back to you and I'll perform a audience choice song too. So are you ready? Whenever you're ready, just give me. messages replies whatever are we ready okay okay i'm getting ready yes 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 okay guys meanwhile you think of a song and i'll start my performance. Hey, what's my name? What's my name? My name. 
Thank you so much, guys. Okay. Let me check out the comments. How do I check the comments? <laughs> so bad with this. Okay, here it is. So we have Dilbar Auraja. Dilbar Auraja. And oh, by the way, thank you so much for the lovely, lovely comments. Illegal weapon, Auraja. So we have two votes for Auraja. All right. Come on, guys. Vote, vote a song, and I'm going to perform for you, lovelies. This fucking hair goes in my mouth. What the fuck? Makna Auraja. So I think most people are going with uh, Chamak Chalo is actually one of my favorites. So <clears throat> I think first I'm going to do Ao Raja and then I'm going to do uh, Chamak Chalo because I love that one. So yeah, thank you so much for your inputs, guys. Have fun. Meanwhile, I'll try to switch it on. It's so hot. Oh my God. It's hot. It's humid because of Mm -hmm. The rain thingy and all that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. How is the how is the weather there? How is everything going? Sorry, I'm all sweaty and shit. Wow. So we'll first go with Ahu oh, Raja. Mm -hmm. Raja. So are you guys ready? Just send messages or say ready, whatever, and I'll start. I'm getting yes, yes, yes. I want more yes. Come on, guys, more energy. Miss Behenji's show is full of energy. Come on. Yes, yes, can't wait. Yes, yes. Love it. So let's start with our Raja. <laughs> Oh, I'm a 
Okay, so that was our Raja for you all lovelies. Thank you so much for request. Thank you so much for being so interactive because you know the entire point of doing a drag show is that the audience is having fun and I'm assuming you're having fun. So thank you so much. And now I'm going to play Chambak Chaldo by Karina Kapoor. And uh, oh, thank you so much. Thank you for all the sweet comments. Uh, sadly, whoever is writing illegal <clears throat> weapon, I've never heard that song, so I don't know the lyrics, obviously. So I'm so sorry, I can't do it. Oh, bad, bad drag queen. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, are we ready for Chamak Chalo? Are we ready? Yes, no. Yes, okay, one yes. Ready, ready. Guys, this is this is the spirit I was looking for. Yes. The more you'll cheer me up, the more I'll be like, come on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so we are gonna start with Chamak Chalo and you guys have fun. I don't know how much time I have. So maybe I can do another number, but okay. 
I think we can chat. Sorry, we're almost out of time. Awesome. Yeah. Amazing. So thank you so much, everyone, for watching me perform. It was surely amazing. And please follow me on Instagram if you want to see more of this energy thing going on in your profile. And thank you for joining. And I love you. Thank you so much. For this. Thank you. Thank you, love. So wonderful. And thank I you. mean, it's like, we need to run the conversation fast in tomorrow to begin with. Moving on quickly to our next panel. We now have something super, super sweet and interesting. That is the tale of two. To understand how couples have lived through their entire lives and, you know, despite how the society dealt their hands, they were always together and so, so happy. Now we have a few people who are here to share their personal stories. So I would like to welcome our panelists for this session. Sumitro. Sumitro is a communication expert and PR evangelist working with the Global Advertising Agency. He's also transforming communities using art through a Mumbai-based art NGO called Chal Rangde that propels to change the mindset of people. With his partner, Pradeep Rana, he, Pradeep Rana, he is constantly creating content for the travel startup, Romanchan. An ex-research scientist turned content producer and travel influencer, Pradeep Rana lives for the moment, capturing the best of his life in travel. He's a social media content strategist for a short video platform and is always conceptualizing ideas in his mind. Both of them found each other in a city of dreams and since then are inseparable in love. Their love story has not just been featured on Mumbai Mirror, Humans of Bombay, but also touched millions of people on social networks. Our next panelists are Ananya and Radhika. Ananya is a writer as well as a student of literature and gender, currently pursuing her second master's degree. Radhika is a freelance producer in advertising. Ananya likes to read and cook. Radhika enjoys playing the saxophone and tap dancing. Both of them are very social, enjoy meeting their friends and family, and share a common love for travel. Also, we have with them, joining them would be Martin, whose partner couldn't be here, which we are really, really sad about. But Martin and Amit have both been living abroad. Martin is 31, born and raised in upstate New York, went to Michigan for college, graduated with a BA, BS in biology and chemistry. He recently graduated from the Metropolitan College of New York with, with an MBA in general management and international business and is currently looking for opportunities. Over to all of you. Hi. Hi, Priyanka. Priyanka? Hi. No, this is Lakshmi. Lakshmi. Hi, Lakshmi. Sorry, we got a little. Hi, uh, Martin. Hi, Ananya. Hi. Hi. Okay. So, uh, like, sorry, I missed the start part. Uh, Lakshmi, uh, do I have to start? Do we have to start? Yes. I mean, you could start with telling us about your journey and how did you go about and how did you both meet and be curious about everything. We want to know everything. Okay. So if we start telling everything, uh, I think the next day will come. So <laughs> we will take two more days to yeah, tell yeah. stories. Like a capsule version of everything. Maybe. Okay. So... Um, you know, we, we, I was in my uh, 20s and he was in his 20s. And like uh, any other 20s, we were figuring out our lives, um, you know, on our journey to achieving dreams and all of that. So we landed in a city that is City of Dreams, Mumbai. And, um, you know, luckily, I, I was residing in a house with uh, a lot of boys and he ended up there coming. And we kind of, you know, we, we looked at each other and we figured that, you know, this is him and uh, yeah so uh, so he, the uh, thing about me uh, I'm from Himachal so I'm kind of a little shy person so I have never made eye contact so whenever I speak I always look down and I, I look there I there but never into the eyes so he was the first one I made eye contact and I think it was it lasted for more than 10 minutes and we did we didn't realize that it happened and there were so many people around us but only two of us, we didn't know about each other because we never met on uh, any uh, from any dating app or uh, on a uh, gay parties or uh, any LGBT events. We never met on uh, these things. Yeah, it was like normal for us. I yeah. know why I uh, we there is one more reason I am there as a speaker here because I do not feel that you know 
you need to carry that tag along with you to show that yeah i am from this community and i i i do not believe in that because it is a spectrum and we are evolving with time and nature so today what we are we are enjoying the life like this yeah. Yeah. tomorrow i could be anything else during my childhood i was in <laughs> something else so um yeah so he he is multiple personality so don't even go there like uh, our our conversation will take like uh, two days but if we start talking about him it will take two lives so you decide i really want to i really want to know about ananya and priyadarshi it's really cute you both are so cute ananya and radhika <laughs> ananya and radhika hi kavya ananya yeah sorry so, like you we met on a dating app yeah okay uh so for me especially because i present as femme i feel like it's really hard to meet women in real life because no one assumes that i'm a lesbian so it was easier for me to put myself out there on a dating app with my you know saying that i'm a lesbian and i'm looking for women and so do you want to <laughs> uh so we chatted on a dating app for a bit but i didn't feel like there was anything so we sort of didn't plan to meet uh then we gone for a queer quiz event uh that yes. was being held in bandra and so she had also come and i knew she was there that's why i actually went for the event <laughs> she was like yeah look you like something so she came for the event and that's when we met in person for the first time and we talked for the first time and we really clicked and uh that's when we decided to go on our first date and i think after our first date both of us like knew and i came back and i told my flatmate like i think i've met the one and yeah that's that's that so it's been how long you guys are together uh we've been dating for 6 months now wow nice. yeah yeah we are entering entering uh, years. three years yeah, yeah so oh, wow. yeah there's this lesbian <laughs> that is so you hauling which is like lesbians meet each other and immediately like shack up and start living together and ending ending a lot of love lot of love to all both of you and let's move towards martin martin why where is your boyfriend uh well <clears throat> so i'm in i'm in new york i'm in the us so it's uh morning here so he's actually at work he's a physician um so he's seeing patients um and with the the all the covid stuff going on i'm working from home so i'm here <clears throat> so he wasn't able to to be here unfortunately um he was looking forward to it but maybe next time we can we can get him on sure yeah. um but we so we met almost 10 years ago um uh through facebook through a mutual friend um and ever since so uh we um you know we come from very different cultures uh you know interfaith interracial um but it all just kind of seems to work really well and our families get along really great and everything has just kind of actually gone really really well over the past 10 years and it's been very seamless and um uh in October 2018 we got officially married here in New York and had a big oh wedding you guys um, are married Yeah, we're actually married. You yeah. want to get married? <laughs> no, I'm jealous. Yeah. I'm jealous of you. <laughs> yeah, so we're actually married and um we uh had a huge Hindu Christian wedding here in New York and wow. um you guys can whoever's watching if you're interested in in seeing the pictures or videos from the wedding, you can actually just go to my Instagram. It's uh the fashionable couple. You can go there and look and there's all kinds of wedding pictures. We had the the big traditional hindu wedding and a big traditional christian wedding and all of our friends and family were there to celebrate and we had a barat and the horses and the whole thing so it was wow. pretty amazing you are lucky many one. many congratulations yeah. to you oh, thank you yes it's like you know there was a really really cute moment right here all the viewers of course noticed that the moment you said we were married you just see everyone's faces on the panel all of us just melted it's a lucky me i will like urge you i will urge you and social catch up and samosa everybody that you put up a appeal to the government and the supreme court that it gets it's high time get we get legalized to get married in this country yeah. you know um Shit. not i'm sorry not i because, lost it <laughs> not because um, you know we are uh, we are still living uh, in with each other but you know it just it feels comfortable the marriage what do you think anya um yeah i think gay marriage should i mean 
it should be but i also feel like uh when we talk about lgbtq rights we have so many other obstacles to overcome as well in the fall i mean obviously everyone should have the option to get married uh okay. but we have some time like we have trans rights that we need to look into and other things before we can jump into and whatever happens that's great that'll be amazing and everyone who wants very it very soon very soon so yeah it's 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 like the reason why we also kind of looked forward to speak to all of you because throughout the course of the day and for a few panels that will follow after you we talk about all of these theorizations about queer lives right so we try to look towards art and literature for looking at how queer lives are represented we're looking at pride at work we're looking at what exactly happened after section 377 in india and there are so many questions but like ananya said and that's kind of a thing for me that sometimes our struggles are so so personal are so much on the minuscule level that sometimes you know all of these institutions look so like i don't know mega in front of us that we're just like i want to live happily and that that tiny thing is my goal and that is my speck in this entire universe so have you had like of course coming out is a very difficult process and um surprisingly the society expects all of us to come out and expects us to have the perfect coming out story ever and sometimes do you feel like how do you kind of now in this place where you know you're together you've found your partner and you're happy how do you look at the world now like are things as difficult as they were before or are now they becoming easier since you are with someone to kind of share that with i mean martin if you would like to start uh yeah sure i mean so <clears throat> i'm in my early 30s so i've been out now for uh somebody asked me this question the other day and i could i i couldn't even remember what year i came out or how old i was but at least 10 years i've been out i it feels like a monumental thing like i should probably remember that but i i don't but um you know i was thinking about it a lot retrospectively and um for me when i finally came out and told my parents it wasn't a shock to them um and it wasn't a shock to my friends but the thing that i noticed right away when i came out was that i felt immediately more powerful i had my own power my own identity i kind of almost had more of an internal compass and i knew where i could go and who i could be with and who i could talk to and and it was nice to know that i had a community um that was just kind of like waiting for me to just show up um and so that was really something that i think added to the whole power dynamic of my own self and and since then i became just more socially active in politics and in civil rights and civil liberties uh doing a lot more charity work and you know because i i i was able to see an illustration of my own power from within and i think that was super super important because i spent like we all do i spent so much my entire childhood and my entire adolescence and young adulthood hiding who i was and that's what i put all of my power and all of my time into was hiding and covering up who i was so once that no longer needed to be done i had so much more to give the world and i think that that's part of what kind of gets lost in the conversation about coming out is that yeah it's about being true to yourself and who you are and loving out loud and being proud but you know being in the closet is a conversation that i think we all need to have uh with allies and lgbtqia people in general as well because i think when you're living in the closet there's a lot of things that are taken from you or that you're not allowed to have or not allowed to possess and and i don't think you realize it until you're on the other side of it so for me my coming out wasn't like a super dramatic thing it, my parents were fine and you know they kind of knew already and and that was that was not really an issue i've never with my family and my cousins and my aunts and my uncles and my grandparents i never had an issue with anybody um and they were all present at our wedding they were all there they all participated they were all standing up in the hindu ceremony and in the christian ceremony um so i never had an issue with that and likewise amit comes from a very traditional hindu family from gujarat he's a patel um so he was really worried for a very long time he came out later in life like when in like uh maybe at 34 35 he came out 
Um, so he's been out for four or five years now at this point, I think. Um, and he was really worried about their reaction and their reaction was exactly the same as my parents. They were loving and warm and welcoming. And, you know, he came out to them and then he told them, he's like, look, I, I have somebody and I'm in love with him and we want to get married. And, uh, and then the next day I was on a plane to fly to his parents to meet his family and his nieces and my in-laws and my, you know, my new aunts, and my new uncles and my new cousins and, uh, you know, everybody. So it, it, we were really, really lucky in that regard that everything was just, was fine. Everything was fine. And our two families merged together and became one big family. And it's, it's so beautiful to see when we have like, we had a traditional Indian engagement ceremony at his mom's house and, you know, uh, with the temple and the whole, all the prayers and all that stuff. So, you know, you see all these Indian people, these very, very traditional Indian people. And then you see all these very American white people and it's all just one, everybody's one family. And it's really, really, really beautiful. And every time it happens, I get emotional because I look out across the room and I see, you know, 50 or 70 or 80 people all from every single one from different backgrounds and different belief systems and different life experiences and everything and everyone in that room is the same. That is, that is so beautiful. And I just want to quickly move to Pradeep and just, just kind of understand like, was it the same culturally here? Like, what did you experience when you two decided to live together? Uh, okay, so it's been uh, three years we are living together. So that is not a problem. We, we we fight a lot we try to kill all sorry each other so that is fine i never tried to kill you i did but it's okay <laughs> so, so uh that is not a problem but uh, that's always a uh, lakshmi you are a witness now if i'm dead okay fine yeah, yeah i will be free then it's, it's okay uh, so yeah that that uh, that's a part um uh, for us like it's it's never any issue like, it's very smooth journey like three years it, it went like this and uh, you know it's um, uh, we have grown grown up so much in a professional and as a personal uh, aspects as well uh, wh where problem i can see i'm i'm i belong to a place which is uh, a village you know this you can see this is a village this is himachal and uh, uh, People are not educated here. Like they don't. They are not aware of LGBT community, and they are not aware of even if tomorrow if I go and I tell my mother, our father, that okay, fine, this is a thing. We won't, uh, This is the thing I like, boys. So you know what they're gonna say? It's okay, fine. Uh, but get married. You have to marry, na? You have to marry the girl only. So it's okay. You like this guy? Fine. You be friends. You are best friends. Stay together. No issues. So they are that innocent. They are that level of innocent people. So uh, I feel today uh, uh, social media has played a very important role to educate uh, the, the next generation. And I think everyone is uh, aware of it. But I think now the, the next step might be to educate people who are not there on social media. To educate families and educate... Uh, uh, I, you know, I can go and I can, I can tell... Uh, multiple families I can visit, I can tell them very confidently that, okay, this is fine, this is not wrong, and I can explain them. But when it comes to my family, it becomes super difficult. It becomes super difficult. Emotionally, uh, I'm so attached to my family. Like everyone is so cute, and uh, they have expectations. I'm the only child. So <laughs> somebody's writing single person here dying of feels. Okay, fine. Uh, I'm so sorry. You will definitely get someone. Don't don't say that. Don't be dying. disheartened. There yeah. will be somebody. Yes. Yeah. So we will find someone for you. Don't worry. We have so many single friends. So, <laughs> so yeah, that is the only thing I feel uh, we should uh, look uh, forward to educate this that generation. And yeah, that's my. What do you say? <laughs> to contradict with Martin feel. You know, Martin, you belong to such country which is already developed and everything is legalized there. It's so normal. If But the situation in India is so different, like the opposite. We'll have to first educate them that these things happen. You know, then acceptance comes in the picture. Then you have a normal life. But uh, yeah. otherwise, yeah, it is, it is, I won't say it's difficult, but it's different. It's difficult. His dream is to get married on half that age. So uh, it's very difficult. Like, I will convince Lakshmi to get us married. <laughs> yeah, Lakshmi, so, you are doing a brilliant job. I came online to my, today morning and in the morning you are like sitting in front of the camera, I mean the laptop and 
from then you did not move only <laughs> No, not at all. I'm not even kidding you at this point. But also, one more thing I would like to just take a note of. It is so great to see the outdoors. It was amazing. For everyone who's tuning in from Mumbai, we don't get to see the outdoors, especially the sky and this greenery so often. And I'd like to quickly move to Ananya, right? Because uh, since I do know you, since we happened to meet uh, for some work in June, uh, in January, early January this year, and we had this great conversation about gender and literature. Yes. And um, now you are abroad for a brief time, uh, pursuing your degree. So now you kind of have a fair idea of how dating works there, how relationships work there, and you're back home. So, you know, what, where Martin is coming from or where both of our cutest, like the new cute couple of this entire conversation is coming from, you realize that I feel like you're someone who's been on, kind of has seen both the sides of the culture and has that exposure. But at the same time, I feel like gender often becomes a very different conversation to begin with. You know, so what is what is your experience been on this front, and how have you both of you dealt with this on a personal level? That's for um, me, right? <laughs> or is that for? That's for Ananda and Radhika. We can always circle that. Um. So first of all, uh, coming out and finding someone who you want to be with is one whole battle, but being together afterwards is this whole other thing. Um, the biggest thing being a lesbian in India is that there's a lot of invisibilization of the lesbian identity. Uh, for example, words that were once associated with lesbianism in India, like Sakhi and Saheli, which were part of Indian literature for centuries, uh, have been systemically erased. And there's like this erasure of female sexuality, especially women who love women. And so when we turn, when we look back at our history, when we look at our literature, when we look at cinema, we don't find our identities represented at all, which I feel like uh, is different for gay men, for example, where there is at least some representation. For us, it's like almost like starting from scratch and there's sort of no template to follow. And it's all this, you're making your own sort of journey because there really isn't anyone that you know of that came before you in literature or in cinema. And so that's one of my things that I found was hard, not seeing someone like me with my struggles reflected back. Um, oh, uh, difference between India and here. I just feel like it's not even comparable. Like when I was abroad, it was just completely different. Uh, I was in London and it's a developed country, first world country and it was just not comparable the struggles we have in India are just for example like for us we're so privileged we have we live in Mumbai we have access to English education there's just in India there's not even vocabulary for something like homosexuality for lesbianism and for so many people who come from so many different parts of the country will grow up feeling that they're different but never having vocabulary to even be able to give a name to what they're feeling and their whole lives will just go without ever knowing what they are and that it's normal and that there are other people out there, um, which is not the same abroad. So I feel like it's not a fair comparison. But Radhika came out in her thirties and I feel like her journey has been very different. Very different. Yeah, from, it seemed pretty different. I actually came out about two years ago and uh, till then I was like super closeted. Like I wouldn't even talk about anything related to the community or anything, identity. Uh, I had like long hair all the time, you know, feminine clothes and everything. Uh, but then after I came out, I actually first came out to my brother and he said, oh, I always knew it. And I was like, if you knew it, why didn't you talk about it? You know, my brother laughed at me <laughs> and then he puked also. <laughs> we were drinking and I thought of coming out to him and I told him that, hey, this is the guy I'm dating. He's like, ha, 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 and he passed out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry to cut you. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, yeah, and uh, I told my brother I want to, you know, uh, come out to uh, our parents, and he backed me up, and he said, "Yeah, no worries, I've got your back." Uh, I came out to my parents, and they kind of said, "Like, is this a joke and stuff and all?" But then my whole agenda was to first come out to my parents, and then I don't care, I'm coming out to the world. So then, yeah, I came out to my parents and then slowly my close friends. I'm still not out out there because uh, my parents are still not okay with it. So like I'm out, but somewhat still closeted. Um, yeah, now, now. I'm out now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but it, it definitely uh, felt very liberating. 
uh, and I actually find I feel I now have a purpose to live. To be honest. That, that is just so like it's it's like a virtual hug at this point because we've had such diverse inputs, right? Because to understand how culture works in so many different ways for so many different identities, not through any jargons or any complicated language, but just simple lived experiences is so important. And like Ananya said, like we don't have the vocabulary. For a lot of expressions across the spectrum, and I really, really feel that there'll be one day where we could all be the true, like, feel very, very comfortable with our identities, also because we have the language to express that in. And this has been such a great conversation. But on the leaving note, I just want you all to give one message each to everyone who is listening, who's tuned in, and has so much going on through their heads right now. Can we start from Martin? Martin, Martin. Uh, sure, sure. Um, I mean, you know, if, if I don't, I don't know if anybody follows me on Instagram that's watching, but if you do, um, I'm always posting positive, positive things for um, any and all minorities, right? Women or the LGBTQIA community, um, and I'm just trying to show representation that you know differentiation exists, and if you're different, it's okay. And you will find your crew, you'll find your people, you'll find your love. Um, and, uh, you know, it's very important because when I was growing up, I did not have any representation. I didn't know any gay people. I only knew of gay people and I knew them as a joke. I didn't know them as real humans with real feelings. And, and so I had a lot to overcome in that regard, in that aspect to be taken seriously or to take myself seriously. Um, and you know, that trickled down to a lot of different things with feeling worthy of education and worthy of love and worthy of, of friendship. Um, so, you know, I, I just say that if you're struggling with trying to figure out who you are, there are people for you and there are people waiting for you and there's a crew and a family to, to love you and to welcome you. And, I know it might seem insurmountable and very, very difficult uh, at this point, but once you get to the other side of it, it's a whole new world that's going to open up and it's going to be the most incredible thing that you've ever experienced being yourself. Thank you so much, Martin. And we hope to see you and Amit together really, really soon. We really miss yeah. having him in the conversation. We'll quickly move to Sumitra and Adib. Okay, I will... Uh have only one sentence whoever is looking for love i get a lot of message on my instagram on our instagrams saying that you know you guys found each other and it's just so lovely and all of that when will we get love i all i i want to take this platform and tell everybody that you know love will happen when it has to happen so have your open mind have your open thoughts do not have those perception my kind of guy or my kind of girl you know don't put those filters you know the more you put filters the more it gets difficult the universe will conspire differently so have it very clear that you know uh, i am seeking i am seeking for a lovely person let it happen to you gradually it will come definitely it will come okay so Okay, I, I, I will add on this thing. Uh, even if he doesn't come to you, it's okay. You are perfect. You're 100%. You don't need anyone else in your life. So the day you start loving yourself, yes, you will find thousand people around you loving you. So that is, it's 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 a myth. I, I see people saying, okay, when will uh, I get partner? I'm 30, I'm 31, like I'm turning. I don't, I'm not getting partner for me. It's okay. You don't need a partner. It's not that I have a partner. That's what I'm saying. It. It is my uh, thought process from the start. It's okay. It's okay to be single. If, if you're single, there's nothing wrong in that. Okay. Start loving yourself. And as I said, start loving yourself and you will find thousand people loving you. That's it. Yeah. I think that I'm is done. so sweet. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, okay. We'll move to Ananya and Radhika. Okay. I'll uh, just say one thing that, uh, you know, like, like I earlier said that I was I'm like, I'm out, but I'm still not out. But to be honest, I actually logged in at three o'clock and I've been watching everything. And uh, it's honestly given me the confidence to now be all out. I'm not going to now stop myself from posting anything on social media or being open to the world. And it's really encouraged me. 
and I'm going to agree and stick to what everyone is saying, which is just be yourself and love yourself, and you'll automatically get all the love. So, yeah, that's what I'm going to stick to. I'm going to say something really cliche and say um, it gets better. Um, yeah, just hang in there. It, it gets better. That's it. <laughs> Honestly, in times like these, it's less of a cliche and more of a kind of a comfort that we need to give ourselves and everyone around us. And hopefully, you know, we could have these conversations in real time soon. And Radhika, I feel like what you just said is has like kind of made it all come together for all of us at Social Samosa to like everyone, everyone who's worked on this festival, I guess we couldn't have ever had a better receipt or a word of appreciation than what you just said. And I'm really, really glad for this conversation and for all of y'all for being amazing. Also shout out to Amit who's a frontline worker, a physician who couldn't be here, but this is this is just so amazing. Social Ketchup and Local Samosa put together this panel with a purpose and I feel like we've kind of gotten there. Wonderful job, you guys. Thank Wonderful. You. Priyanka, Lakshmi, Thank everybody so out much. there. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. You, you guys practically saw the sunset. <laughs> yeah, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it's dark, dark now. Dark now. <laughs> we wanted to yeah. show you around. <laughs> we'll show next so time. Poetic. We're going to start with another entire round of sessions now. So yes, it's I just perfect. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Up next is someone who does not require an introduction. Someone was someone who was here before and had a very nice no joke with Miss Benji. Please welcome Tropical Marka. Hi, what's up? Can you guys hear me? Can you see me? Is this on? Hi. All right. So welcome to the roast. I'm one of your roast mistresses. And I'm waiting for the other roast mistress, which is Miss Benji. So I'm let's here. like wait for the bitch. Cause like, I can't see you. I can hear you, but I can't see you. It's just like my drag career, yeah? All again. Oh my God. What is Shabnam Befafa doing here? Hi, it was Miss Benji's turn. Shabnam Befafa, get the fuck off my screen. It's me, Miss Benji. It's not Shabnam Befafa. Oh my God. Oh my God. I'm so sorry, Miss Benji. Well, Can it looks you? like the roast has started. But before we get there, before we get there insulting each other, I would like to inform everybody that Miss Benji has successfully pulled off a really, really, really Huge, huge thing. It's India's first ever multi-talented talent house madness. It's a live show that she hosted for like Indian brown artists, not only not brown artists, that collaborated from all over the world. A part of this, how do you also I have a question for Ms. Bandy? How okay. do you also how do you also maintain uh, being the face of uh, drag phobia for India? See, first of all, I would like to thank all the people who gave me this space because of which people are so phobic with drag. Like, you know, you just look at Miss Benji and you're just phobic to drag. How wonderful is that? The yeah. moment that people are Miss Benji, drag queen. <laughs> you so, do justice to that title, by the way, Dave. Learn from the best, sweetie. Ah! <laughs> she did not just. Oh my God, she did not just. <laughs> Okay, so oh, tell me what's up. Okay, so who, who? How should we start? Like, how do we go about it? I started already. Shots have been fired. You're bleeding in the corner. Like, what the fuck? You know, this is what happens mm -hmm. when I learn things from you. <laughs> I have no idea what to do. Okay, <laughs> enough of shade on Marka. No, but apart from that, so see, Marka was one of those first Indian drag queens who I have seen perform live. Like, you know, there was a drag queen in front of me performing and I was in audience. And I was like, I don't know what this creature is, weird looking, so much liner, so many colors. 
but i want to be like this i want these many colors on my body <laughs> so that's how i you know fell in love with martha because she has this loud loud makeup loud personality everything is so on your face i love it like my cum shots bitch i won't know that but okay <laughs> oh you you don't know oh oh i might know about some of your men's cum shot but not yours those videos were not posted by me can you stop fucking bullying me this is cyber bullying and that there goes my lashes they can't take it my god i can't with you i can't listen if you're going to like really come for me come for me bitch like this is your only chance so i'm going to give you the opportunity and they have decided oh my god social samosa social uh, samosa and no local samosa and social ketchup have decided to like have you so that's a huge risk the entire community is taking as a whole so this is your moment girl go for it yes because read me it takes a lot of balls to read the mother herself the yeah, mother yeah too just in case you need extra cuz i don't know if you have a function thanks 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 thank you so much you're welcome huh, that felt so good thanks oh my god i feel extra extra testosterone right now <laughs> Okay, I can so see it. Can... I can see it. Your face, like this area. I can see mm. <laughs> it. It starts around, honey. <laughs> you know, it's all because of the makeup tutorial I have seen of yours. Don't blame that shit on me, bitch. Call Luna. Call glorious Luna and call Deviru, cause this is not my mess. But for, uh, 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 no, don't even call them. <laughs> don't even call. <laughs> this is no, uh, no, no. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. First of all, call Maya the drag queen, cause that bitch started all of this mess. Like I like to apologize to all our allies that are with us right now for this, all all this, this. Do you know because of me what has happened to the drag culture of India? It's dead, dead bitch. It's dead. Ram. It's blind. It's dead. Cause everybody gets a chance apparently. This is like Sikkim Every- Super Lotto. You don't even Every- have to drag apparently, you know. <laughs> Marka, I want your vibes, please. Oh my God, you don't want my vibes, bitch, because my vibes come with a vibrator. You'll be shaking. And trust me, it's not that good. It is. Okay, so talking about Maya, Maya the fridge queen, Maya the drag queen. Uh, oh <laughs> so Maya is, you know, Maya is such a sweet, such a kind heart, and cupboard and. Uh, and you want to add some more adjectives before the words are used any any cubicle thing that you can imagine so okay. just just wrap a sari around it and uh, no, we no, have no no don't even wrap a sari around that so i think we have given up on each other at this moment and we are coming for all the other drag queens yes so i you, do you remember have you gone to like your native place and sometimes you know you have to cover the cupboard and cover the fridge with like a cloth yes. maya on stage Ah, oh, that's her drag inspiration. That makes so much yes, sense. Yeah, yeah. So you know, talking about Maya, she is so sweet. You know, she always used to say that you should learn your own makeup and you should be independent. So now that I've learned a little makeup, now I want to ask Maya that first of all, thank you. When are you learning makeup? And when you're popping a question at Maya, please call Sushant and tell her the same. <laughs> Listen, that that is like a long reach thing. I don't know. If I'll be able to do that, but I have glorious Luna, so you know we can use that medium. कि अपने मामा को बता दो करके. हाँ, अपनी माँ को यार. Very nice, very nice. Yes, very nice. ऐसे गाना गा गा के you just communicate whatever you want to communicate. गाने गा गा का गा गा के से याद आया. There's something called gentleman ga gen. That. That. That thing, yeah. Yeah, that 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 that. A more better known as मैंने ये ज़्यादा सेशन से लिया. Yes. Oh, you know, once I remember, I was I was booked for this show, and I asked uh, Gaga, Gaga, I'm so tense. What should I do? अरे कुछ नहीं यार दादर पे जाना और लॉन्गरे लॉन्गरे ले लेना मैं वहीं से One second, yeah. she said लॉन्गरे. <laughs> Can we all have a moment? लॉन्गरे है है लॉन्गरे लॉन्गरे. Oh, sorry. This is this is why they don't book me. You know, this is exactly why they don't book me. <laughs> <sighs> okay, have you heard about this other artist called Lady Boy? Babe, it's Lady Boy. 
No, that's the servant in my house. Oh, oh okay. Sorry. Then you're I think it's the lady. I think it's lady by. Who is the daddy? Wala dude. Da- yeah, the daddy wala dude. The same. Ah, same yes, yes. Like, kabi kabi aurto ke kapde pehn ke aata hai, kabi kabi aadmi ke pehn ke aata hai. Very that, very that. And I'm very like, you know, I'm like sometimes I'm astonished and surprised uh, that, uh, like, you know, better nonstop. Have you heard that name? Oh yes. It's from Delhi. That one. It's a restaurant, right? It's from a menu card. Or is it a person? Oh. That. Too. That. That. But uh, she's got some immense talent because, like, you know, I've seen her makeup is so flawless. And I wonder sometimes, how can you be stuck up Maya's ass so far? And when you pull your head down, you still have flawless makeup. Now we know why the drop contour is so strong. It's, when it's we need really... a cheap rendition of Jennifer Lopez in Thara, we will let her know. Call her, take her number, DM her, give her all her information. Yes, because because we have a second rate version of Rakhi Samant. Are you talking to me, bitch? Both of us, actually. But okay. Uh, you think you're as gorgeous as Rakhi Samant? Please, here, here. I have a gift for you. This was delivered uh-huh. personally from Lokanwala from Sushant. So the other Sushant. Things have just suit you very well. Things have just got so dark. <laughs> no, because <laughs> you're coming for bitches, like, and uh, this is what you'll have to end your career with. And there are two, just in case one does not. Like, but babe, how can you end something when it's not there? Are you talking about me in Kitty Sue? I'm talking about me in general. I love a bitch who can read herself. Oh, by the way, someone said about, you know, YouTube roasting and all that. Please, let's not get into YouTube roasting because all these, you know who, on the name of roasting, what they do. Who are you talking about? Please be specific. I've been like off the entire, you can't just give me hints. You have to give me full information Mm -hmm. because the children don't know what you're talking about. Oh, okay. So I'll tell you fully. So there is this beautiful, cute boy, Karim Minati. Who? who is the exactly so <laughs> no who did you say i'm not here i honestly did not hear. carry minati exactly so he is the roast king of india apparently and i was like oh wow a roast king this must be fun i should check some roast i'm into roasting and all that so i opened the roast and I, there was like benjot madhushod tiriyasi to Vesi, to Gude, to Chaka. I'm like, wow. All you need to See, do... All those gallies don't apply to me. I don't have any interest in my mother. I don't have any interest in my mother. I'm talking about the... Marika. Hi. Have we met? But you know what? It's so sad that these people need LGBTQ community to roast someone because they don't have their own talent. One second. You have to read this. You have to read this comment. I died. Okay, okay, let me... Okay, There's one me. comment, I died. It's by Dolphin. How the fuck do I read this comment? One second. Please, guys, I need to... Which one, which one? You the last roast. comment by Dolphin. Beautiful boy. Beautiful boy, Kari Minati, the sarcasm is strong with this one. <laughs> I mean... Exactly. Okay, who doesn't... else can we talk about? Like, Because I love talking mm-hmm. shit. Oh, there was another roast that happened on YouTube. Remember the Bollywood roast? With Karan Johar and all that. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you know, again, the uh, definition of roast is so simple. Body shaming, fat shaming, uh, calling out LGBTQ people. I'm like, wow, this is so original. You guys have nothing else to say. Oh. That took a dark turn. And you, and, and, me dark, oh, you know, which I just the, showed you ropes. All the reads about Karan Johar was about his sexuality, which he never accepted. I'm like, original content. Thank you. Like defeat and, and you. <laughs> Random. <laughs> so this is a roast, so I'm like, just, just like Sheikh said, talk shit, get hit. Talk shit, get what? Talk shit, get hit. Sure. So when are you planning to get hit? I, I haven't had any hit, you know, that's why I'm acting so abnormally. 
that space is not tell me the same thing bitch 10 people were hitting on that at least but that is so sweet of you to say 10 there were more i'm a nice sub bitch i guess oh i think we are i've been so bombs bombs is dying or इसके मुंह में कुछ दे दो इससे बात नहीं हो रहा बराबर यू लाइक अल No, I want chutney, samosa. मतलब क्या 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 कहना क्या चाहते हो कि हम बाहर जाएं? Villager bitches, I tell you, they fucking they come from Nagpur and all those places. No shade towards my ex, but see, at least we are from Nagpur, not some bori bili bitch. Bitch, I'm still international. Who the fuck are you again? Shabnam, my papa. So nice to see you. I love you, bitch. Oh my god, Shabnam, right? you you are that machhwara from bori bili, right? Machhi ka thanda yeah. kaise chup? I've got a hook and a fish too. Yes, dolphin. Yes, dolphin. Yes. <sighs> I have to come up with something. Wow. Oh my god. While you're coming up with something, you want to crawl back into the closet because I cannot be any more subtle than that bitch. Like, look at me. Oh, crawling back to closet. That reminds me. How is Karan Johar doing? Uh, how is Keshav Suri doing? How is he doing? I don't know. I hope he's fine. Yeah, just like. Sorry, mother, but I heard. Listen, you have already lost your job. Please, at least I haven't let but me. But at least I've not lost my career, bitch. I still got that because I made that myself, bitch. Thanks to Auto Tune. Well, that was tropical Marga, and this is Miss Benji. She's still struggling and trying. So please, 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 her PayPal information and all that will be there somewhere on Instagram for sure. Buy the bitch a burger or a vada pav, and please so, social catch up or samosa. Please send us some snacks. Na snacks jo achha ne. Please, happy day. Please, please do yar. Yeah. <laughs> I think that should be intense enough. Yeah, you know, all, 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 all the volunteers will just get free samosas for no reason. Hi, 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 Martha. Hi, hi Miss Benji. This is Nenil from Social Catch Up. Hi, hi, local samosa. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, much love for uh, the joke, samosa, ketchup, roast. I mean, like that is now my close to my heart. Oh, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity, and thank you so much for doing this because, like, right exactly. now we need to be the strongest because there are pandemics, there is hate, there are viruses. There have been viruses since viruses since like the nineties. HIV like happened, took half of the gay culture. and now there is this and the only thing that got us out of it is love and friend and just this energy and giving good vibes i hope this entire mess had some good vibes attached to it and i hope you felt it if it's not a vibe it's a virus get tested bitch so firstly thank you so much for like for the entire day you've been entertaining you've been Uh, like you came before you the like spell nilay thank you so paid. much been like on screen like three times and every time you have see i've seen you like in a different avatar i'm so sorry for that you have to <laughs> see me please <laughs> so thank you so much yes please send the samosas send yeah, me i'm waiting mai mai chutney bana ke rakhi hai to tum log samosa beech ke khayenge samosa beech dena ha ketchup ke sath thoda sa chutney like i know कैचअप में एसिडिक हो जाएगा पूरा यू नो स्किन के लिए अच्छा और हार्ट के लिए बहुत अच्छा है आई लव यू गाइस सी यू गाइस सो बाय हाउ डू वी लीव दिस कन्वर्सेशन यू क्लिक ऑन लीव एंड गेट द फक आउट विल बी किक्ड आउट यस ओके लक्ष्मी नाउ यू कैन टेक ओवर मी साइनिंग ऑफ This was such a fun conversation. It was so so. It was such an important breather in the entire lineup, right? Because now we are kind of moving. It's a really important discussion yet again. One of the most essential ones being that we've spoken about being queer, being across the spectrum, being someone who's still figuring out their identity. But when you look at the available information about queer community, often it it is riddled with 
myths and folklore that people just make up. So there is a very, very clear need to kind of bust these myths. So today we have we have with us two individuals who would be busting the myths about gender fluidity. I would first like to call upon Hitain Moonbal, who is a celebrated gender fluid performance artist, drag queen, fashion designer, and a model. Even with the most devastating homophobic experience at their school, they could manage to earn a master's degree in design from the National Institute of Design, Ahmedabad. They use their own body as a medium to express themselves through performance art and photography. They have won many awards, including winning Comic Con display, Comic Con cosplay. But still, they believe that the biggest achievement in their life is accepting themselves. They have shared the stage with international drag artists, are a social activist, influencer, and a motivational speaker. Last but not the least. Megabom Magazine has listed them as world's top seven gender fluid performer, performers who are breaking stereotypes. Please welcome Hitain Dunar. Then you have to unmute yourself. Hello. Hello, everyone. Can you guys see me? I need to respond. Yes, this is perfect. We can hear okay. you. Hello, everyone. Namaskar. My name is Hithi Noonwal. I am a gender fluid artist, and uh, I have started when I was in class six. I was all dressed up. I was wearing lehenga, and I was so happy that day. And uh, I used to, like, even now, and, uh, like, when I was in sixth class, I have always designed everything of my own, my headgear, my costume, even my like accessories and everything. So initially with my parents, it was very cool with them. They were like, oh, come on, our kid is happy and you know, let, let him do whatever he wants to do. Real problems started when I, I was growing up with this identity. They thought, what are you doing, you know? You are a man and you are dressed up like, like this. Who will bury you? They were, there were so many questions. And obviously, they were so worried about me. But what I did, you know, I, I thought, you know, I should have some knowledge about it. What is it? Am I trans? Am I bi? You know, I was not sure about it. So I read about it. And I, you know, I got to know that wherever I am, this is very natural. Nice and this is who I am. And what I did, I started exp expressing and accepting myself the way I am. So whatever I create, my all the looks, they are inspired by my real life stories. Hello. You are audible. Yes. Okay, listen to me. Okay, good. So, you know, for to me, I, was, I wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't caged in a binary gender. So I was very fluid. I was always fluid during, during doing all the fashion, whatever I like. And I was always putting myself in a way that wasn't even masculine and it was even feminine. So this magazine, Vagabond, they only told me about this, that, you know, this is called gender fluidity. Because, you know, sometimes you think like a man, sometimes you behave like a woman. So, you know, it's very free and I feel very freedom that I don't have to confine my gender in one particular stereotype or a binary. So I am very free from the gender. 
and uh, i'm very very glad that i could accept myself like this <laughs> yes hello hi tinga we are able to hear you okay and uh, i would like to say one experience uh that was a reality tv show and uh, it is it, a big show so i participated there as a dancer and uh, they they thought you know i i am just i'm i mean they thought i am someone from the community they can make fun of so or even on stage they said you know why are you wearing all this you are a guy and when i will see you in my dream i will scream so all these were prominent bollywood figures and they humiliated humiliated me so bad on tv and when they aired the show online they changed my music so my music was instrumental ballet dance music what they did they they edited this song dilela melela aisi melela they presented me in a very vulgar manner you know i i think you know this is not just me only there are so many people from the community they think they can use their shot for their rtp and they can you know make fun of them so it was so bad with so bad experience so i was depressed that time and i stopped performing for a few days so my college nid they supported me a lot they accepted my gender fluid attitude they said you know do whatever you want to do walk the ramp as a woman or as a man do the do the modeling for us as a woman or as a woman they they said you are free here you know so at an id i got to know that you know we can be who we are in actual mean and even today you know i i have completed an id it's been for two three years i still believe that you know what if we have a world like that you know a world like my college was a world like i have all these chosen friends chosen family you know and i know me and there are other people various people and they are trying their best to make this change we are just imagining you know oh yes we can you know make this change happen and we are trying our best and i am sure one day we will accept all the gender identities we will accept all the binaries we will respect it and maybe one day you know like we we don't call it any gender today we say we have to then two gender for the common society still right serious critical thinking but we we know that there are more than 66 genders i want today you know when people say oh there is no gender there is just you so yes we are trying and uh, uh, you know i am just thanking right now yes i uh, you know people like you guys thank you so much that you called me because of my gender fluid identity but i'm still looking for that day you know where where gender isn't much of a topic or a trend thing you know i want a time when there is no gender at all everyone is fluid they are free to do whatever they want to wear whatever they want and uh, yes uh, people comment on me and they say you dress like a woman are not you ashamed to be like that so to them i only reply with these lines that you know i am not ashamed to dress like a woman because it's not shameful to be a woman my mother my sister my faculty is like my good faculty is they all are women and if i look like them or if i dress like them i'm not ashamed at all i'm proud of it i am on mute i'm sorry thank you so much it was so insightful and i'm really sorry for what you had to go through but understanding gender fluidity is really a complex discussion that some people really really need to be open to and yeah. thank you for making it so simple for everyone that has tuned in that means a lot Yeah, one more. I want to I say one more thing. Agree. I want to say one more thing. Yeah. So you know uh, what happens uh, uh, with the pronouns for gender yeah. fluid people? They say you know, oh, they are gender fluid. So let's use they and them for them. You know, people say for gender fluid we use they and we use them, and for other people we we use he and she as a pronoun. But I think you know why are we forcing it? 
we say oh, them, we say they. It's my choice. I mean, if you are giving me the freedom that I can be gender fluid, why can't I have my own freedom to choose my pronoun? Even if I am gender fluid, I can choose my pronoun as he and him, you know? So if we are giving freedom, let's not divide it again. Let's not put uh, all these things in a box, you know, that to come on, this is gender fluid and you have to be this and uh, they and them. So freedom has to be freedom without any box, without any LGBT, without anything, you know, we, we, we want freedom. <laughs> yes. Thank you so honestly, much for having me. Yeah, I, I just want to add a comment that we started our day, we started our conversations of understanding pronouns. And this seems so logical, right? Because how we also kind of, we, we generally what happens is allies and people outside the community, or at times even people from the community try to label individuals and struggle yes, to categorize yes. them across boxes. And I'm really glad that you said something that is so, so essential for our understanding of pronouns. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would, I would now like to invite Joanne Dominic Green. Jo Joanne Dominic Green was born, Rai was brought up, born and brought up in Darjeeling and is currently based out of Kolkata for work. She works as a senior designer at a major fashion house in Kolkata and also manages his Instagram blog at the rate The White Hair Bank, where he puts his voice forward through fashion, photography, and art. Fashion for him is a language through which he can communicate better. He defines himself as being both, but neither in terms of sexual identity. He does not like labels when it comes to gender and does not think that there is a particular gender identity that he can categorize or fit himself into. He loves the fluidity in terms of gender that it gives him the ability to pick up who he wants in terms of fashion and lifestyle. And he has always believed that clothes have no gender. Please welcome Joanne. Hello. Hi, you're audible. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, hi, it's me, John. And um, I'm basically from Darjeeling, as I said earlier, and I'm based in Dadda for my work. So uh, while growing up, I have always been like inspired by art, music, rock culture, grunge, and Rajini, and a lot of other things. But I have always found my voice through fashion. Uh, I was going through your live session since long, sometime back, and I think I've seen a lot of people talk about a lot of like retro retrospective, uh, in a different retrospective ways. But I, th being a fashion person, I think I, I really want to talk gender fluidity in terms of fashion because I think I can relate more because fashion has always been a language for me while growing out, and mm -hmm. through fashion I can communicate better. Um, like gender fluidity, uh, in gender fluidity is uh, something that I have literally grown up before it was even a trend. Like gender fluidity, I really love the idea of being gender fluid because it really gives me the ability to become who I want to become in terms of uh, in terms of my lifestyle and other choices. And um, when it comes to defining gender, like I really uh, believe that you know, I do not like the idea of I, uh, I define myself as being both, but neither because for me, gender happened, gender fluidity happened much earlier in life because I being a very uh, like petite and tiny, I could really fit into women's clothing in in uh, retrospect to a men's clothing. So I would really like wear women's clothing and uh, like, you know, I feel really, I felt really confident wearing them. So it happened really early in life before it was even a trend. Like these days we see a lot of people uh, like following gender fluidity in terms of fashion, in terms of lifestyle. But um, for me, it was quite an early, quite, it happened quite an early in life. And um, yeah, so hi, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Hi. 
Yes, yes, we are all here. Yeah, can hear. Yes. Yeah, sorry, sorry. There's been some connection, and um. I, we see a lot of this, a lot of people these days, uh, like especially when you, like when we talk about fashion, like fashion is a highly queer dominated uh, field uh, in terms of like, you know, career, in terms of whatever. While growing up, I have seen fashion for me has always been an inspiration and a career choice from a very early life because I could find a lot of representatives, people who work like people who are core, there were a lot of like representations of people who are core in the fashion industry. But still, I feel that there's certain kind of like shadiness and um, certain kind of non-acceptance in terms of uh, gender fluidity, which I see these days, it's, these days it's breaking in terms of if you see and follow a lot of like international fashion brands and brands in India, there is no categorization in terms of women's wear clothing and men's wear clothing if you go and like see on their racks. Initially, uh, when it was not such a big thing and I would often go to a mall or a store to buy something for myself and if I wanted to buy something from a women's wear section, mm -hmm. I would have to go through a lot of like embarrassing situations and questionnaires and a lot of other things just because I wanted to try it out, try something out which was from a women's wear section. But um, I mean, it's not, I understand that it was not as much as accepted and it's still not as accepted as, as it is right now. But I think we are evolving to a better tomorrow. And especially in uh, terms of my experience, because I come, I come from a place where like my family was super supportive of how I was from very early in life. And uh, I didn't have to go as much as I have seen a lot of people go through in terms of their sexuality and in terms of their choices in life. But, and also uh, that, you know, like when, like I was, uh, I was listening to uh, like the conversation earlier and he was talking about the pronouns and a lot of other things. So even I feel that the more we categorize ourselves into different categories, inclusivity in terms of humanity does not exist. And, you know, like, People do not want to be preached at. There are already too many people who are preaching them to do this, to do that for their happiness. So I always believe that, you know, let them be who they want to be. Let me be who I want to be. Like, I don't want to be dictated on who I want to become in life. It's my choice in terms of my personal uh, beliefs and understandings of who I am. And um, all my life, I, I keep telling this to a lot of people also, like all, I'm, all my life, I've always... All, I hear a lot of people saying that you have to, we have to struggle to fight to the society, to a lot of family, to our friends, to our family members for our rights and for understanding as poor. But I believe that the main fight, the struggle that you actually have to go through is the fight with yourself. Because if you don't accept yourself and you don't love yourself for who you are, you cannot ex expect anybody else to love you for who you are. Because, and gender fluidity is also a very important like you know topic right now not just in terms of fashion or not just in terms of lgbt because you see for example if i go out in a street you see a lot of guys on the street wearing pink and this is not something that is dictated it is not even taught it came with their you know a few years back i remember no guy would wear pink because they thought it was queer it was feminine it was god knows like what they think it is but these days you see a lot of guys wearing pink and walking out in the street with a girlfriend they might not be an ally they might not have an understanding of what gender fluidity or what gay or whatever it is but they wear it so you know like with time and with evolution the people are understanding and it's our job as whoever we are whatever we know like we as an influencer in be it in Instagram, be it in Twitter, be it anywhere, we have the voice to teach people who are wherever and whatever places they are. We have the voice to teach them and make them understand what we know. It's not about, you can't preach people, but you can at least make them understand and, you know, like make them realize what it is because there are already too many people preaching you to do what you they think is right for you. So, yeah, what do you think, like what your view is about all gender fluidity in terms of life. I really appreciate how you said something really, really essential that you need to first accept your own self and often coming out or often uh, explaining identity becomes more difficult when you're not comfortable in your own skin. 
and yes. at that i feel lies at the crux of understanding yes gender fluidity and also the myths that surround gender fluidity because often we just like uh, it ends up said about like just the panelists before you had said that we are so intent upon putting people in boxes that yes. we do not realize how we are actually harming someone's self perception exactly. while trying so i like to see something while growing up i always try to like you know because there are so many if you even if you like go inside the queer community there are so many categories that has come up this days and the more we know the more like more divided it becomes there are so many categories that even i might not be aware of gender binary gender non conforming gender gender queer there are so many the more we know about each other the more dividend it becomes so it's even getting more and more difficult and while growing up i was so confused with where i am who i am what i am because the kind of representation that i'm i was seeing people who were older than me people who were near me who were queer i could not relate to anybody because i i felt that i am i do not want to become a woman and i do not uh, i want to become a man also i i keep telling that you know i am both but i'm neither in terms of my gender because for me fashion a uh, gender fluidity is a state of mind through which a man and a woman can coexist like you know it exists in me so it gives me the ability to become who i want to be at any point of time be it through fashion be it through dance be it through poems be it through writing be it through books so it's all about like you know giving people the independence and the right to become who they are because at the end of the day everybody just wants to be loved and live their life the way they want to like it's all about acceptance what are we fighting for what are we fighting for since forever we have been fighting for acceptance we have been fighting for rights so let and acceptance and fighting comes from within if we don't accept and fight for our own right then nobody else is going to do it for you yeah It was, such was such an amazing takeaway yeah. to It was such an amazing confirmation story. conversation yeah Thank you so much Thank and you I so much like the most perfect so takeaway one could take away yeah exactly. to Thank just you so understand much. I got to sum up the entire conference thank you so much for doing this with thank us thank you so much it was such an amazing experience we hope to see you soon real time so quickly moving towards our next panel to understand um, what exactly happened after section 377 we have two experts with us today but if you remember the 6th of september on 20 in 2018 where when section 377 was finally abolished everyone around was celebrating but for a lot of communities that is where a newer struggle actually began in 2018 we celebrated how we were waiting for this moment of liberation but back in 2019 we saw the most oppressive trans bill or uh, trans act being circulated and wanting to be turned into a bill in times like these what exactly has changed about our country after section 377's decriminalization And what is the future that we are looking at? To answer some of these questions, we have with us Dwani Tripathi. Dwani is pursuing her undergrad in Mumbai. Currently, she is a third-year BMM student with a specialization in journalism. She is a filmmaker and a cat mom. She identifies as a cisgender lesbian. Her pronouns are she, her, and hers. And she works as the joint secretary of All India Queer Association, Mumbai. Please welcome Dwani. Hi. Having a hey, you might have yeah uh, yeah I can see you now. Am I audible enough? Yes. Thank you. Um. So my introduction has already been been given. So I want to introduce myself. Just jump right to the topic. Um. When three seventy seven was uh read down partially. um my friend came to me she's by and she came to me and she just jumped up and said bro 377 gaya and she just hugged me so tightly and that was like a historical moment because we were really happy and for a few days the euphoria you know continued and we were celebrating and everything but just like just like that a few days later the celebration was over and we came back to our regular lives and i don't think we saw much change so if anyone ever asks me uh what has changed after 377's reading down i would say not much that's like the shorter version not much i'm going to be brutally honest i still see people around me thinking that are 377 gaya na yaar kya jata hai ab to bas mil gaye 
it's not true. It's like a stepping stone. It's it's a baby step, to be honest. And it does not actually justify all the hobby we face. In fact, it should be uh, that people learn that oh, this is what you know. This is the, what the community struggle has come to. They have struggled for three decades just to be considered actual human beings. Because before the decriminalization, uh, we were considered outcasts. We still are actually, but. In the in the eyes of law, we were considered criminals, and that's just so dehumanizing that people fail to realize that this is just the beginning of the movement. This is a baby step, and it's going to take us farther, obviously. But um, I think what needs to be changed is that education is not inclusive enough. We don't have inclusive sex ed in schools. We barely have sex ed in India, actually. Sex is uh, a taboo. It is not, it's not talked about. And we are ashamed if we even use the word sex. I remember in school, the first time I learned the word sex, um, I used to ask my friends if they know about it. And most of them were completely clueless. One of them even thought that kissing is what makes babies and not actual, the actual act. And it's, it's, it's really unfortunate and I'm laughing because uh, it's funny, but it's also really unfortunate that we haven't even gotten to a place where we can give heterosexual kids a comprehensive sex ed. Forget giving them inclusive uh, sex ed for um, you know queer identities, making them realize that there is a difference between sex and gender. So um, I think it's disappointing that um, people think 377 is enough because it's not. It's far from enough. and and. Um, um, a lot of people need to learn how to respect queer identities because people assume and assumptions mm -hmm. are the ones that lead to bullying because, oh, this guy, you know, um, he walks like that, he must be gay, or he wears pink, he must be gay, or this girl, she has short hair, she must be a lesbian. Um, the problem with such things is that people just aren't sensitized enough because they're not educated. They come from a place of ignorance and privilege. And that's the reason why I think 377 is just not enough. And um, we need much more than 377. We need uh, sex education. We need workplace rules that completely ban ragging or bullying. We need um, schools to completely ban anti-LGBT um, ragging or bullying. Because even if they do have provisions or rules for bullying against kids, they don't have any specific anti-LGBT uh, bullying rules or laws. And that's the reason why 377 reading down hasn't really brought about a lot of change in society. So um, uh, honestly, I think 377 is not enough. That one decision, even though it was historic, was just a stepping stone. And it's we are far, far away from achieving total equality. Thank you, Dhwani. I guess that's as comprehensive as one could get in understanding the past influence that 377 has had on all of our identities and to then objectively look at the present and not look at it as the utmost victory that everyone waited for, but just the beginning of another whole struggle that we need to gear ourselves up from. But a first step is still a step in a good direction. And thank you for the wonderful insight that you've provided us. You're welcome. I would now like to call upon Anvesh Sahu. Anvesh Sahu is the youngest winner of Mr. Gay World India and creator of the FMNL. He's a user experience designer, an illustrator, a writer, a model, a TEDx speaker, and the only Indian recipient, recipient of the Troy Perry Award for Compassionate Activism. He blogs at the FMNR, a parallel universe, where he gets to illustrate the utopian world he wants to be a part of. He looks at life as a thrilling mystery novel written by God, and since his, only, since his novel has only started, he'd go with, I'm still evolving. Please welcome Andesh. Hi, Lakshmi. Thank you so much for having me. Am I audible? Just want to make sure that I'm there. Yes. <laughs> okay, perfect, perfect. Great. I think Lakshmi, um, we've already covered a lot of important topics uh, around uh, what had, had really happened post Section 377, at least for a lot of kids, um, especially teenagers. And I think I'm at such an interesting uh, juncture in my life right now because I have sort of made this transition from uh, being a teenager at school and then I've uh, moved on now to a more professional space. So in fact, I very well remember back in 2013 when Supreme Court had actually overturned uh, 
the uh, result that was given out by the high court in 2009 that and um, all of a sudden we were all we were all all over again criminals and i think that is the time when i was trying to even understand i had just come out of uh, the closet um, as an openly gay man and i was still having a lot of conversations with a lot of my friends trying to teach them everything um and i think once i actually um, in my first year of masters in fact i do uh, the inter the historic judgment came into being back in 2018 and uh, everything sort of actually started changing and i think to be very honest i didn't even realize very well the very impact of this uh, entire uh, uh, you know judgment i didn't know how incredibly it was going to change a lot of our lives all of a sudden there were movies that were being made around lgbti queer plus plus people of course a lot of it is tokenism uh, we've had some incredible movies perhaps which have been made by the likes of oni incredible movies that have been written by apurva for example nishit sarun's uh, summer in my veins a lot of us perhaps might not even might not have even watched a lot of these incredible films that have come out by you know very empowering lgbtiqa plus individuals in fact i remember recently at the rainbow literature festival um, nandita das had come in and she was telling she was speaking about fire and she said you know we didn't even realize that uh, a movie like fire could have been made back then in 97 98 and could have been released it got full release in india and perhaps will not even get a similar release uh, you know now in 2018 uh, 19 20 and uh, it's it's so funny that you know we perhaps in some ways also going back in time as more and more information is becoming more accessible to people which is incredibly funny but uh, yeah i think uh, i have actually seen the change happen from being a closeted kid and i had come out from a closet when i was around 16 and this is around almost you know good 7 to 8 years the go just like crazy now uh, but uh, uh, i had come out when i was only 16 to uh, at first to myself which is the most important thing i think people always talk about uh, when i were to come out to your when did you come out to your parents when did you come out uh, to your uh, family or acquaintances the one thing that matters the most perhaps is you coming out to yourself you accepting yourself in complete totality that's the only way you're going to move forward in your life uh once that had happened i had actually i was pretty naive and uh, i realized that you know maybe being gay is really not a big deal and i had grown up believing that it was never a big deal for me so i was completely fine with it i was like i'm going to go out there i'm going to speak about it it's not going to be much of a big deal but my very first day of college and i was discriminated i was not let uh, i was not allowed to be a part of this group project and i think a lot of discrimination happens um intrinsically it doesn't really happen extrinsically where people don't really come these days and tell you you know you're gay i don't like you i don't want you to be a part of my project anymore but it happens in subtle ways like the way you know you dis- discriminate uh, you know even colored people today so i think uh, that is when i realized that okay this is really a big deal and uh, this needs to change and it i i have actually seen the world around me change bit by bit i have seen my bullies trying to you know come reach out to me and say sorry to me some of them have some of them haven't but uh, some of them have and i really i'm glad that you know they realized what their mistake was and they've tried to be friends with me they've tried to understand what my stance has been um, of course going back to the conversation around section 377 once it was uh, read down um i think um there is definitely a lot of work that it's to be done around schools in fact i started most of my work during mr gay india as well around fitting out a campaign which is all about you know trying to fit out and trying to create your own space because sometimes you have to create that own space for yourself nobody is going to come to you and give it to you the way it mostly happens for a lot of our cis hetero um, counterparts for us we have to create that uh, space and how do you create that space if you don't even validate your own existence so you have to first learn to realize that there is absolutely nothing wrong with you 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 validate your existence and you create that space for yourself and then you demand that space to be given to you respectfully because you deserve it you are an equal individual who's born with uh, the equal right to dignity and therefore uh, you're given out that space space and uh, over time i realized that okay uh, now that we've been able to create the space for myself how do we empower also other individuals who are around me uh, because not everybody is uh, you know born with that same dna of you know being out there being you know talking about it and um going uh, being 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 an activist perhaps uh, you know going out for pr- pride parades as well i mean all throughout four years of college i was the only one who would go to these pride parades none of my friends um i mean a lot of my friends would want to come but most of them would end up not coming and i would of course i i grew my i sort of 
as 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 queer people we we grew a chosen family you know and um, i'm so grateful that i've had a wonderful chosen family and uh, a, a wonderful uh, you know a family by blood as well both my parents have really i've seen them evolve their thought processes evolve uh, but i think schools in general uh, in fact recently an a journalist from hindu had called and they were doing an article around uh, how has india changed in terms of uh, education in schools i honestly don't think we can say that india has moved much because are we can we really go back to the smallest of schools and the uh, in the nook and corners of, of of india and say that every individual out there is empowered and you know they're they're out there and they're going to be talking about the sexuality out in the open they certainly know there is a reason why there are very popular youtubers who i wouldn't like to name because i don't want them to be more popular than they are already um, unfortunately but um, there are so many indian youtubers who are making all these negative content around who don't even realize what is wrong with their content they don't even realize that using queer kind of connotations to bring someone down is absolutely wrong and is demeaning to the community itself so um that is exactly why we need sensitization not just at school we also need that sensitization uh, sensitization at at colleges we need that sensitization and workplace in fact godrej has come up with an incredible manifesto which everybody should read i've had the honor of working at the godrej india culture lab under parme shahani i think one of the pioneers of you know diversity and inclusion in in india um and i have i actually was exposed to this very um space of while working under him and i'm i'm so glad because today i work i am wo entering a work space um uh, after after finishing college and i realized that okay wow dni is so important i need to be in a space where i'm celebrated and or perhaps just treated as as an equal you know perhaps um i think some people have a problem when i say that you know we should be celebrating all of that because you know straight people are not celebrated but uh, i think and some unfortunately people don't realize that we are also a marginalized community we are a stigmatized community and therefore say when we say celebrate us uh, we don't mean that you make us above you know st our straight counterparts you we are already at a negative level and perhaps straight people are like at plus 10 and when you try to celebrate us you're not making us you're not even bringing us up to plus 10 you're probably bringing us to level 0 so we at least have some you know a visibility and some story to tell um, at least at least a workplace and you know bring out the best of ourselves and i think india slowly and steadily at least the mncs the, the big organizations even if, i mean i know a lot of it is tokenism i have been to a lot of these organizations where i realized that you know they just want to have me because they want to do something around this abhi ho gaya section 377 repeal ho gaya kuch na kuch to karte hain let them let them the world realize that we are true dni at least i i still feel that i'm i'm optimistic and i feel like they're at least trying and that is where the conversations begin there are even if the organization itself is perhaps not as pro lgbt when single individual singular individuals inside the inside the organization listen to these stories and they they perhaps go back to their homes and they google us or they read our stories or they follow us on instagram they still opening their worlds to these world of possibilities and that's where the conversations begin and that's where perhaps we can make a move forward so i do believe that we don't have to always you know wait for some director to make an amazing you know massive you know commercial success movie around uh, you know representation of all different kinds of queer individuals in fact we have a, in a, a myriad of uh, amazing uh, queer directors filmmakers producers now i think that change has to now come from us instead of just having to wait ki koi hame aake save karega hame we have to take that bait in our own hand now From one culture lab alumni to another, I mean, we're <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> And yay, shout out! But also, what you said is so so important, right? Because we have now, after uh, after the decriminalization, have come to a place where people now know us as a community, yeah. recognize our existence. But inclusion is a really, really long and consistent long journey <laughs> that we still need to have. So exactly. thank you, Anvesh, for giving us this interesting insight. It means a lot to us, and we thank cannot wait so to see more you. amazing things. Thank, thank you, and, and a big shout out to local samosa, social samosa. Thanks so much for having me. This is such an honor, and you are such an incredible host. You're doing a fabulous job. You should you should give a pat to yourself on your back and give yourself a big samosa at the end of this. <laughs> I would most definitely. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, Andy. perfect. Take care, guys. Love and light. See you guys. Bye. Up next, we have someone who's talking, who's taking this conversation just another step forward. So far, we were trying to explore what happens on the personal level, what happens on professional level. But what about someone who's living both the lives at par excellence and showing the world by setting an example himself? 
An award-winning fashion and textile designer, a painter, a trained classical dancer, an actor, once a dentist, Dr. Ganesh Nalari exhibits diametrically different talents. He is a prolific motivational speaker and a strong presence at various sensitization programs on child abuse and empowerment. Amongst his various tour de force is a TEDx talk and a documentary film, Unspoken, which, through a painting, initiates a dialogue to end the silence and denials related to child sexual abuse and encourages healing by building one's strengths. Ganesh's, Dr. Ganesh's life strongly feels that Dr. Ganesh strongly feels that life is an oxymoron, and so is design, with various multitudes of style and material, giving him an opportunity to explore what's seen and what's unseen. Now, to give more insight about his inspirational life, we have with us Dr. Ganesh Nalari. Over to you, sir. Uh, so you're on mute, so you'll have to unmute your mic. Got it. Yeah, yeah cool. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me over. It's such an honor. And um, uh, the first thing, uh, uh, a big congratulations to everybody. Uh, in spite of uh, whatever is going on currently, uh, we, you, you guys still managed to pull this off. And I think it came as a breather because uh, there was so much of boredom, suffering, and you know. And uh, I was really looking forward for this particular day and the moment. Thank you. So what do you want to know? So um, you've been on so many platforms across the country. Often not explored. A lot of struggles for individuals when we are coming out. When we talk about so many different aspects of our lives, sometimes our identity can be rooted in the traumas we faced growing up. To be able to speak about our traumas on a public forum becomes a very very brave act in itself. So how did you navigate that space? Uh, because I remember watching you on Satya Meva Chaite and listening to you and being so moved. But then I also realized that your work goes beyond just talking about your experience. But you made sure to dedicate your entire life to kind of create this awareness in society. So what was your journey with that? Uh, like you just mentioned, I was on the episode of uh, child sexual abuse. and uh, But that wasn't the first time I actually spoke about... Uh, uh, my past. It was actually through uh, this movie, which was made by Honor, called I Am. Uh, uh, one particular one particular story in that called I Am Abhimanyu is an inspiration uh, of mine and another friend, Hari Shires. That was the first time I actually spoke about my abuse openly. But that was also around. The, uh, honestly speaking, I never really thought about it. But it was around the same time when my abuser actually passed away. And I think uh, for many years, I never spoke about it to anybody, but uh, it was over a chat with Honor that I happened to mention and he asked me to actually write the story and stuff. But I said, I can share certain aspects of my life, uh, but I didn't have the uh, energy or I didn't want to recollect a lot of it. And also speaking, uh, every time you come on a platform and when you, when you talk about it, you're, you're revisiting a particular time which you want to forget, right? <laughs> so it was difficult. Uh, it was difficult uh, for the fact that every time this topic is, uh, this topic comes up and immediately number of people who write to you, connect to you, I really appreciate it because there are so many people who relate to you, right? And that's when uh, they want to open up to you and they say that you've been in my voice and you know, all that stuff. Initially, it used to bother me a lot. But I think over a period of time, uh, you know, you need to detach. Uh, that is the most important aspect. Anything you do in life, any emotion, you know, uh, ultimately it's shantam, peace. So you have your highs and lows and everything, but you need to detach from every aspect of it before going to bed every day. It should be peace of mind. Uh, that's how I live my life. Uh, and as far as growing up concerned, yes, like I said, uh, uh, born in the 70s <laughs> and uh, being totally ignorant about even the word G-A-Y-G-A, uh, what is it? 
uh, I only knew that uh, from the beginning, it was about, you know it, right? That uh, in my case, there was no exploration about, it was very clear. I knew I, knew I liked boys, but then there was a lot of confusion for the fact that I was being abused by a man. I think that was a conflict which I had to overcome because uh, I was uninformed, traumatized, alone. Uh, uh, as a child, when you're dealing with so many things, you're just quiet. And also I'm the only child, I don't have siblings. So that was a tough phase. And then I think a for the longest time, I kept running away from my own self. Uh, I graduated as a dentist, I, I moved to another city, and then I came back, I switched a career from being a dentist to a designer, and then going away to Milan to do my master's, second master's. And I think that is when I was already 30 by then, when I was in Milan. And uh, that was the turning point in my life, honestly speaking. Uh, very clear in my head that as far as, as far as my sexual preferences were concerned, I was very clear that uh, what I was, but it was a very personal thing. And also speaking at that point, I mean, I'm talking about almost 20 years back, uh, I was not sure about uh, if, I, if I could talk to any of my friends about it because uh, I didn't know if they had the mental capacity uh, the bandwidth to understand what I'm trying to communicate because from whatever I know during those times or even till date it's always a joke in movies right the way a particular character is portrayed a uh, LGBT uh, a homosexual is portrayed in movies and all it's always been a joke that I was very clear that I would love to laugh but I would don't I will not make my life a joke you know uh, and I think uh, and also coming from a particular uh, uh, strata of society, I mean, coming from a very middle class thing, uh, <laughs> we never really discuss about boyfriends or girlfriends or even sex at home. You know, it's always about padu and chaduko, you know, study well, you have to become something. It's all, <laughs> everything, everything is revolving around career. You have to do this in life, do that in life, you know. So I think uh, whatever uh, personal, uh, emotion in terms of a romantic inclination uh, towards men I had was something which was just there. I never opened, really uh, spoke about it to anybody, but much later after I finished my dentistry, I think I mentioned it to, a, uh, to very close friends, you know, whom I felt, whom I could trust and uh, who, whom I understood that they will understand me, I mean, you know, but uh, the turning point really came when I went away to Milan when I actually got fully comfortable in my own skin. I, I mean, in the sense that there was so much of anger before when I used to, I remember my classmates back in NIFT used to say, my God, you're so short tempered. And the same, when I went to Milan, I remember my classmates there, uh, this friends from Turkey asked me, Ganesh, do you ever get angry? You know, that whole shift. Then I could really see the change in me. And most important, like, all the panelists who really uh, who spoke uh, just now, I think they've really touched a lot of important points that most important is accepting yourself. But in my case, it was not about my sexuality, but it was to, which, uh, it was uh, the more chal the challenge was because I was dealing with a certain aspect of my childhood and my sexuality. There were two conflicting things, like I just mentioned, abuse by a man, but yet at the same time liking men. That was a conflict which I think for a very long time I dealt with. But uh, when I was in Milan and the kind uh, Milan, I mean, of course, I went to do my master's uh, in uh, fashion. Uh, but that one year, it was not just about studying fashion, but then it was about understanding my own self, just getting comfortable in my own skin. And today, like I said, you know, uh, over a period of time, you really need to become thick skin to really get comfortable in your own skin. <laughs> you know, a lot of times, honestly speaking, I've really never faced homophobia, but then uh, they were very insensitive uh, remarks uh, at times. I never laughed. Uh, I never laughed it off, but I made sure that I explained. I made sure that a lot of homophobic friends or somebody, I wouldn't even call homophobic. I wouldn't even call these people homophobic for the fact that they were ignorant about it. So it was about just sitting and having this conversation with them and, and then they just realized it's, it's okay, it's just so normal. And uh, uh, talking about such things openly, honestly, I'm not even a, 
an, an activist or anything like that, but it's more about, uh, I'm just trying to be myself. And every time somebody talks to me about it, I never felt the need to uh, hide anything. But yet at the same time, I don't think it is important for me to even tell any tell everybody about it, right? I don't think anybody would want anybody who uh, whom you get introduced to says that hi, I'm X Y Z and I'm straight. At the, in the same way, I don't think it is anybody's business to know who I am. I mean, my uh, sexual preferences are uh, at a pro, be it at a per, professional level or at a personal level. Either way, uh, only until there is more to a particular relationship. And mostly all my, uh, uh, be it with my client, be it with my friends or, or anybody, my uh, relationships with any, everybody has been a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And I prefer it that way because uh, uh, one, I think uh, being a good listener, I mean, everybody says I'm a good listener, though I'm talking a lot now. <laughs> uh, uh, I think uh, being a good listener, uh, people tend to trust you and then people want to open up to you. And uh, when you are a one-on-one -on -one person with anybody, uh, I think uh, you're, they talking to you is about they trusting you. And uh, in return, it's about me respecting uh, the person and their privacy. And I should just thank them for sharing that particular aspect of uh, their life with me, whoever it is. But most importantly, today, uh, you know, with social media, everything, uh, everybody's talking about depression and one particular incident which happened recently, I don't even want to mention it, you know, it's, it's very sad. But then everybody put out on uh, social media about, I'm there for you. Uh, I'm just a phone call away. If you ever feel so and so, pick the phone. Tell me something, how many of us today are actually doing that? With your immediate family, have you ever just casually picked the phone and called your own sibling or your cousins or your aunts, uncles? Have you done that? If not done, you know, why do you have to wait for a point or a, a, for you don't need an you don't need an opportunity or a chance? You can just pick the phone and call and just say, "Hey, how are you?" Immaterial of whatever differences you have, or whatever it is. I think it's just so much more easily, easy if we keep it that way. And everybody talks about, oh, I'm there, uh, I'm just a phone call away and all. Be a good listener. But honestly speaking, you, it's better not to give advices because you can give advices only if you're a professional. You know, they are therapists, they are, they are psychiatrists. Uh, I think it is their duty uh, it is, I mean, they can always counsel them, but you can be a good listener and you can always support them by saying that maybe you want to go for therapy, you know, you should consider this, but uh, you, it is better to keep your advices to yourself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's it. Yeah. What else? You know, like, okay, this might be like a very weird panel to draw, but whenever I hear you talk, whenever I hear Arisha talk about this, I'm reminding you authorize RG from his novel or like, you know, one of those typical, um, like one of those Arundhati Roy protagonists who does not even live just a private life, like chooses to, um, you know, give selective exposure to people, but also carries the burden of so many stories on a daily basis and tries their level best help. And that really, really helps, you know, in their own skin because I think my takeaway from this are two things. One is that you need to be thick-skinned to get comfortable in your own skin. And on the second front, yeah, we really, as a generation, I feel we really need to pick up the phone and call people. I just because want we've become the next generation. I just want to mention another yeah. thing that, um, yes, it is important that you feel comfortable in your own skin. But please, please make sure that... Uh, your sexual preference is a very personal thing. And it, it, it should not be your whole identity, you know? I mean, uh, honestly speaking, uh, in this whole journey of mine, I never really had to come out, come out and tell anybody. But then yes, like I mentioned, I, I told my uh, close friends earlier, but then much later, I'd reached an age where, uh, you know, the topic of marriage coming in in the family, a lot of uh, social pressure for my parents. And it was around the same time that uh, I started my studio and established myself as a designer. 
and uh, I also started doing theater. Uh, so it was at the, it was that, during that time that I actually wrote a play called Mudra. This was way back. It's almost like seven eight years now. I wrote this play called Mudra. Honestly, I wrote the play for a competition, but it was about me telling my parents my story. Okay, uh, uh, it was through the play. It was on stage that I actually through dance. I'm also a trained dancer, so. uh i put that element of dance in my play because it was a dancer story and the the mother telling the uh, the son telling the mother that um, uh he is uh, uh there's a man and a woman in him and uh, that he likes men you know it's through dance i, I actually tell it and after the play uh it uh, he dances in front of the nataraja basically with half face in uh, turmeric and half face in uh vermilion and uh, he tells his mother that uh, i am parvati and i'm and i'm in love with shiva you know and um, after the play when a friend came and told me that uh, ganesh i had goosebumps watching this you know it was just so real and behind me was my mom who actually told the, my friend that but that is all real that's all i didn't even i never i never had to ever talk about my sexuality after that i think the only thing which worried me at a certain uh, time uh, a few years back was i didn't care about the world uh, it was only about me i just wanted my parents to be comfortable uh, about who i am and vice versa about i didn't want them to go through a lot of social pressure peer pressure but what is most important is let your uh, sexual orientation not be everything you know when you become something in life uh i spoke about my sexuality uh openly uh much much later in my life after my 30 uh but uh, in the sense um, uh, i had uh, become so confident that i never let anybody question me you know yeah. there was certain power within that uh, nobody had the guts to even come and question me about hey why this why are you doing this nobody ever dared to question me uh success is a very subjective thing uh, uh but uh, when a lot of people say oh ganesh it is so much more easy for you because you are successful i said it's a very subjective thing but i look at when i look at uh, success it's not about just uh, materialistic things or you becoming popular or anything like that but then i think i would be i would consider myself successful if i can get a good night sleep you know i think that is most important uh hold on to your families they are the most precious things your immediate family there's nothing more than immediate family and of course in your whole journey i don't believe in the concept of best friends there's so many people who come and go it's okay uh they are good friends and they are also bad friends it's all right uh but um, hang in there and trust yourself most and keep it really simple i think is the most perfect note on which we could understand how to be comfortable in our own skin and end this conversation but thank you so much for being a part of this this means the world to us and thank you once again for all the brilliant insights thank you once again bye bye good night bye thank you and here we waltz towards our final performance for the conference for the k for the pride life fest someone who is the most fun at the same time Some, as he described himself, the most intimidating person in the room, a quirky Bayander boy who grew up performing for himself in the mirror until someone saw him, got concerned, and recommended using the stage instead. The unofficial good child of comedy, he dabbles in podcasting, improv, acting, and writing as well, because he believes I be underpaid for one job. When you come to his show, you get no class but a whole lot of sass. Expect to laugh, but also to cry. because apparently he says his face does this to people someone whose story seems like my own autobiography please welcome navin narona yeah all right hi guys okay. hi everybody uh lakshmi can you can you like uh, say hi with a nice rainbow wave because i don't see anybody else's face hi all right you can see i mean i'm wearing the levi's t-shirt clearly we have uh, one one brand that still care for us so <laughs> that's why we are all yeah. on the uh if you all can unmute yourself if you can allow some people to unmute themselves i would like to hear laughter because that's what i feel of as a comic so guys okay. uh, yeah if you if you want to type lol that is great 
sensitive. Yeah. Otherwise, it's like any other work call where one person is talking and everybody else is nosing in the background. And manager's like, "Are you with me on this? Sab ko samjha, ha? You know." And then you're like, "Ki sir, will you will you send presentation to us on email because we are not paying attention right now?" Okay. So just pay attention. Have a great time. I think uh, we've we've gone to like. Uh, a whole bunch of emotions over the course of this entire day right like from seeing performances to like music performances to panelists talking about some really intense stuff and uh, unlike ganesh my story is much more hilarious because my mom still doesn't believe me that i'm gay you know it's like the funniest thing like i keep telling her in her face and she's like are you sure because to this day every every month ka first ko my mom calls me okay and she's like hi and i'm like hi me like, how are you i'm like i'm fine mom Uh, still gay i'm like mom it's not my salary it's my sexuality you know there's no increment over here and she like ha increment hoga bhi kaise you are always been second in life i'm like what does that mean mother and she like even in the lgbt community you are g not even l kam se kam lesbian hota ghar pe bahu lata gehne pade hai kisko do i'm like mujhe de do hum pride mein pehen ke jayenge that's what the whole point <laughs> yeah but the thing is like i am very close to my mom as most queer boys are right like any queer boys who are uh, closer to their father than their mother raise your hands if you love your mom more give make me uh, raise your hands just say hi okay uh, my mom is the one who gave me my name in fact you know like when i when i say my name is navin people think i'm a hindu but actually i am a catholic unfortunately uh, they gave us some rice bags and we were like sure why not But the problem is that when people hear my name Naveen, they think I'm a Hindu. And now in modern India, I'm like, sure, why not? I am totally Hindu, a Khand Bharat. You know, everything is great. Because why take chances, right? My parents thought about the future. I almost think sometimes. But the joke is that my mom got my name actually after Catholic tradition. Okay, there's a church in Mahim called Saint Michael's. Uh, do we all know Saint Michael's? Yeah, it's a it's a church in Mahim. Mahim is an area in Bombay, guys, which is full of Muslims and Christians. So they build a bridge around us. So that's what Bandar Wali ceiling is essentially. They want to avoid us at all costs. Okay. <laughs> But when you are driving past Mahim, there's a church, and they always have a board over there. Okay. And they have something <laughs> over the top, unnecessarily smart written over there for no reason. Okay. Yeah. Like the other day, I was going from there, and the, the board said, the board said, honk once if you love Jesus, honk twice to go to hell. First of all, what the fuck does that mean? Okay. <laughs> And the guy in front of me oh had that. Okay, and depending on how you honk, you either go to heaven or stay in my. That's how it works. Okay, what nonsense! Dude. And the thing is, like, because I grew up in that area of Mah Mahim and Santa Cruz, the people around me are mostly Marathis. Okay, and Marathi people in Marathi culture, Naveen means new, right? Everybody knows that. Yes. Yeah, they even have a song after my name, which goes, <laughs> "Mazan Naveen na po pataha." Dagla me too, me too, bo la la. Have you heard that song? Yeah. Yes. That basically means for all those of you who don't speak Marathi, it means Masa uh, Naveen Po. But my new parrot, Dagla me too, me too, bo la la, is now saying hashtag me too, me too. Okay, that's the whole meaning of the song. Okay, don't think about it. Uh, but the problem is, my mom gave me the name Naveen. Okay, but in Catholics, we also have a tradition of giving a middle name. Okay. क्योंकि अगर पहले नाम से एनआरसी हो गया तो कम से कम दूसरे नाम से बच जाएगा इंसान दैट वाज द आइडिया ओके एवरी कैथलिक यू विल मीट हैज अ मिडिल नेम फॉर सम रीजन माय सिस्टर्स नेम ओके माय सिस्टर्स नेम इज विल्मा एलिजाबेथ नरोना ओके इट साउंड्स लाइक सम ड्यूक केम एंड हैड सेक्स विद माय मॉम बट लाइक माय फुल नेम ओके आई एम गोना टेल यू माय फुल नेम माय फुल नेम इज नवीन प्रेम नरोना यू गाइस माय मिडिल नेम इज प्रेम न्यू लव Yeah, the only other prem I know was a rapist in the seventies. Yeah, exactly. Like I can't like anybody ask me my name. I can't be like prem name hai mera prem na rona because you'll freak out. You'll run away into a field of paddy. But the problem is, I think my mom was the first prem ki diwani. That's how this whole started. Okay, but uh, as as someone pointed out right now, like Navin prem literally means new love. Okay, and that's hilarious because when I came out to my mom as gay. She was like, uh, she was like, what is this uh, gay business? I'm like, mom, Navin Prem is the market. I'm just trying to get out. You know, 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 you Naming a child Navin Prem Darona is like saying Jai Shri Jesus. It makes no sense, okay? Like, it's so stupid. And then, like, 
I think she set me up for failure when I was born altogether. Okay, but so now when I'm like, I try to have a conversation with my mom. She's she's like this hilarious person, obviously, because uh, she grew up like any other mother in India amidst adversity. So she wanted to be better. But the problem is like whenever I came out to her, she would not believe me. As I told already, like my coming out happened in multiple stages. Okay, like first I'm I became an engineer, so I had to come out as a writer. Okay. Then I was a Christian kid all my entire life, so I had to come out as an atheist. Atheists are, by the way, people who don't believe in God. Okay, like we love God so much, we let him go. Okay. Uh, <laughs> third, I had to come out as a homosexual. Okay, a dick sucking, fully rainbow coated homosexual. And then fourth, I was like, okay, I'm also a marijuana smoker. My mom was like, that's okay, वो चलेगा. I'm like, what the hell is that? Okay. <laughs> And she's like, at least now, Navi, you're putting the right thing in your mouth, and I'm like, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> But that's what I'm saying. Like, the beauty of this relationship with my mother is that, like, I have disappointed her on so many levels that she has developed a whole language with me where she doesn't care what she tells me now. Like, she just says anything that comes to her mind, and she's homophobic, but also loving. You know how weird that is for you to like have as a gay child. Like, she, she, my mom doesn't live with me, by the way. To answer your question, Priyanka, she lives in Bayandar. And I live in I want I won't tell you where I live, but I live far away from. Okay, I got smart and I left fucking Bhayendar a long time ago. Bhayendar is, by the way, where all the hopes and dreams go to die in Mumbai. It's a it's a land far far away where Excel World is. Okay, that's where Bhayendar. Nothing comes to Bhayendar. No electricity, no water. Not even terrorists come to Bhayendar. Okay, like fucking they're like we're not being told to kill y'all, you kill yourselves. Okay, so that's how it happens. So. I got out of Bayandar and I moved to a new apartment. Okay, I got an apartment. I live with my partner now and with my cats. So my mom actually came over to see how I live. Okay, and she comes to my house, and my cat had a surgery done along her belly because she was sterilized. So my mom was like, "What happened to her?" And I'm like, uh, "The cat can't have babies anymore." My mom goes, "Hmm, just like you too." I'm like, ah. "Mother, oh you can't God. come to my house and say these things. It's not right." Then she looks at the other cat and says, "Which one is the male? Which one is the female?" And I'm like, "Amongst the cats." And she's like, "No, between you two." Data koi hai, data koi hai. I'm like, "Sorry, nobody, mom. That's how this works." So it's like you know, and and my mom really prayed for a boy. When she wanted a boy, she went to church and she prayed all those days for a boy. And that's how like I, I she believes I was born. Okay. And then problem was I, I had two older sisters at home, and they wanted a girl. Okay. So whenever my mom left home. And left them in charge. She went to the market or whatever. My sisters would bring out the entire jewelry box set, <laughs> and then decorate me like I'm some chamunda outside a jewelry store. Okay, <laughs> I don't know how many other sisters have done this to their brothers, but stop doing it. It's fucking cruel. Okay, we don't, yeah. we don't. You, you confuse us at a very young age. Like when I came out years later, they were like, "Where did we go, we go wrong?" I'm like, "You fucking made me a diva at five years old. What do you think <laughs> happened?" Right, like they're putting bangles on me, then mangal sutra my mom ka, and then kumkum. I'm like, we, we're not even Hindus. We don't even wear kumkum. They're like chili powder. Shut up and put. Also, me, beautiful sisters are sometimes a little weird. Okay, <laughs> but but I I love that entire uh, you know dynamic because because they were older than me, they would watch a lot of MTV and VH1, and I would get to absorb the culture with them. Right, like so, like they would they would watch uh, like Spice Girls. And they would watch Britney Spears, and my entire like young gay body was like, "Yes, come inside me, Lady Gaga. Yes, please, like enter my body as a conduit from the TV. I would touch the TV like an idiot." And they're like, "Just stand away from this." And that's why, like, I would be exposed to so much great music at an early age. But as I grew older, Indian TV got censored more. I don't know if you all remember this, but AXN used to play Hot or Not at 11 p.m., where everybody would take their underwear off. Okay, that was Indian TV first. And I grew up on that, okay. And then suddenly, suddenly, VH1 is blanket banning everything. I'll tell you how. I'll give you an example, okay. There's a song by Nicki Minaj which says "Ganja Burn," okay. It's a song. Nicki Minaj, you all know Nicki Minaj, yeah. She is one fourth uh, Bengali, yeah. We, we should know her, okay. <laughs> Or Nika Maraj, her name is. Okay. And Nicki Minaj has a song "Ganja Burn" where she does this: "Ganja Burn, Ganja Burn, Ganja Burn, Ganja Burn, Ganja Burn," and that's all she says, okay. "Ganja Burn" two thousand times. But the problem is on Indian television you can't say ganja, so they beep the entire word out. So now what you see on TV is burn, 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 <laughs> burn. I'm like, what's going on, Ben? Ka dude, I don't know what's burning. Like, is the video shot in the Amazon forest or in Godhra? I don't know exactly what's happening. Tell me. <laughs> oh, you're in there. 
I went there. I went there and I stayed there. <laughs> uh, but that's the point, right? Like Indian TV confused me so much. One more song that they always played was "Take Me to Church" by Hozier. Yeah, it's like one of those. It's a famous gay anthem about two men in Russia who are gay. They make out, they smoke a joint, and then bullies find out one of them is gay and they beat him up. Okay, that's the entire premise of the whole thing. And they say "Take Me to Church" as a as a point of saying that the church is still homophobic. But when I was watching it, I had no YouTube. I was watching on VH1, and the point is they can't show two men kissing or smoking a joint. What they would cut to now is the guy getting beaten up again. So, pura video, the gay banda se mar khara hai, dude. He's just like, ah, oh, take me to church. Ah, maybe I'll be safe with the priest inside. It's it's not fair. Like you know, the the shit that they should really censor in Indian TV, they don't censor. I'll tell you what. Okay, the diaper ads. Okay, as soon as I say diaper ads, there's an image in your head that's just like there's a baby's butt in the frame. But check a bum in the frame, and that is okay for some reason, okay? And now because there's a voiceover, they're like, "Ki shishu ki bum ki issue kono solve karega?" And then, and then the lady comes in. There's a there's a hand model who comes in and she touches the baby's bum, and she shows how smooth the baby's bum is because it's wearing huggies, mutis, or whatever. And she does this like a jello shot. She'll she'll wiggle the baby's bum vociferously, okay? On on a on a national television, the baby's bum is jiggling, okay, for two minutes, and that is okay somehow. Okay, I did I did research on this. Okay, guys, there's never there's never the baby's mother to jiggle the baby's bum. Okay, it's a hand model hired by a company because Komal bum ke liye Komal hat. Okay, maybe a lady named Komal who does this as a past time. Now, what do you do? I play children's songs. My passion. Like, how is how is that okay to show on Indian television? Is my question, dude. Like that that kid is going to grow up one day. Okay, and these ads stick around on television. By the way, all these diaper ads. Okay, I was going to watch that. Ad on TV and it's like ये वाला bum तो जाना पहचान लग रहा है dude like did you sell my bum on TV mom well my commission like like he gets he gets he gets married and partners like baby you wanna you wanna do something crazy he's like no first you spank me and jiggle my butt okay only then will I get aroused it's a traumatic experience for everybody people who are in the ad and who are watching the ad that's my whole point uh the the fi- final thing I want to talk about though is uh, is a very interesting time that was happening in India over the past a uh, few months like i don't know if you all have caught up with the news but uh, we had uh, the cnrc protests followed by delhi riots followed by police brutality followed by our pride that got stifled followed by the corona virus crazy uh, atmosphere so everything has been pretty crazy right but fortunately for me before everything went to crazy town in feb this year i got to attend two pride marches okay one was in mumbai say hi to my cat Woo! and her asshole uh <laughs> That's a favorite pose. Uh, she is the one, by the way, who got the surgery done. Anyways, so so uh, I went to the Mumbai Pride, and I don't know if you all know about the Mumbai Pride. It did not happen on the roads as it usually happens, because usually when we do pride, yeah, we usually do pride walk to tell people around the city that like, we exist, we are gay, we are lesbian, we are bi, we are trans, we are asexual, we are non-binary. We 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 affirm our gender identities to people on the roads, right? But this time they were like, "Nee, tum log bar mat aao." लोग ग्राउंड के अंदर गैदर करके एक दूसरे को पहचान लो कि मतलब कौन सा वाला गे कौन सा वाला लेस्बियन है तुम लोग मैच द कॉलम खेलो एक दूसरे के साथ आई एम लाइक दैट्स दैट्स नॉट द आईडिया ऑफ प्राइड डूड इट्स लाइक यू नो एंड व्हेन ही वेंट देयर इट वाज सो क्रेजी बिकॉज़ फर्स्ट यू एंटर फ्रॉम अ लेन ओके एंड एंड देयर वाज कॉप स्टैंडिंग एट द एंट्रेंस ऑफ द लेन विद गन्स एंड विद वाटर कैनन्स एंड देन व्हेन यू एंटर इनसाइड इट्स एंटायरली ब्लॉक्ड ऑफ फ्रॉम फोर साइड्स आई वाज आई एम आई वाज नॉट अलाइव इन 1940s बट आई वाज गेटिंग जलन वाला बाग लाइक फुल फ्लैशबैक्स ओके आई एम लाइक व्हाट द फक डूड what if we start protesting will they start sh- shooting us with water cannons because don't know us as gays we start a wet t-shirt contest whenever we can we, we won't care about you what tip tip barsa pani motherfuckers we don't care about you and it was so bizarre because what happened after the pride march happened was uh pride gathering rather i should call it was some uh, people did come and protest about the the cnrc bill and uh, we as a collective Lost our shit. Okay, we saw on Twitter what happened. We saw on Facebook what happened. There were entire right wing, left wing arguments started. Right? We all saw that, yeah. And I was sorry. Yes, my cat again. Okay, for those wow. of you, here she is in full glory. <laughs> Now go. Stop this. Stop this. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so when the pride happened, I was uh, worried about that because they were looking for a for a trans person who had raised slogans against the bill. Right. and i'm like okay pride has always been political i understand that 
but why would you do a man hunt for a person who's from your community okay i couldn't understand that because who are you trying to impress for for all the right wing people who are from the community i was never i'm like who are you impressing modi because he is too busy bending over for amit shah is not going to give a shit about what you think right now the thing is, i was so aghast but then i went to australia okay i got a chance to go to sydney mardi gras in australia where everybody just is, is themselves okay the amount of people i put my mouths into is not even funny it's crazy and i was surprised because i came down from australia in march and i'm like somehow i don't have the virus i'm somehow safe <laughs> it's crazy so when i was in australia i had the rare opportunity to have sex with a pakistani okay and uh, you know and and that was a good thing because uh, i think in one single move i impressed both the left wing and right wing in india because left wing was like you know yaar you had sex with a pakistani there's still like love between our countries as bhaichara and right wing was like ha pakistani gaan mari yeah ha and they'll be proud of that part you know so it was <laughs> so that is that is me taking one for the entire country you know and uh, with that i come to the end of my set thank you so much for having me you guys happy pride love you all and you have been super super super, super amazing and uh, if you all want to talk to me follow me on my instagram house of narona i do my shows on zoom sometimes my entire show called the good child follow me thank you so much bye Thank you so much, Navi. That was so cool. And also, he did not mention, but he does this amazing podcast called Keeping It Queer, which is my personal Bible to figure out queer politics and everything that's happening around in the way Navi puts things. And that sort of brings us to the end of Pride Life Fest. Thank you for staying with us throughout the conversation. We started really, really early in the day, but of course, things that need time need time. Things that have to have. you know that space to have that conversation need to be given that space for the conversation and i really appreciate how you put all work aside and decided to spend your afternoon and a lot of your evening with us um this wouldn't have been possible without our partners for the bright life fest who are dragwanti q graphy vivid diversity job fair boss for perspective periphery swabhava trust a non funded organization working to provide access and support services for the lgbtq community and welcomes donations to help its work our lifestyle partners are times prime influencers partners influencer incorporated and gifting partner queer bazaar i would really really appreciate if you go ahead and follow all these amazing brands who are doing some really really amazing work all the artists who have performed here who have been here have uh, been featured on um local samosa and social catch up social media handles so i really recommend you to go and follow them support them give them a shout out if you like something please do use the hashtag like and tell us how did you find the event if you did it and just yeah happy pride and i hope you all keep having this conversation beyond this forum as well thank you have a great night